Members, the Legislative Assembly is honoured to be situated on the ancestral lands of the Wadjuk Noongar people. We acknowledge the first Australians as the traditional owners of the lands we represent and pay our respects to their elders, both past and present. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament now assembled, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper all our consultations to the advancement of thy glory and the true welfare of the people of Western Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Are there any petitions? Uh, papers for tabling? And there are none. Um, giving notices of motion. Madam the member Speaker. for Balcatta. Madam Speaker, on behalf of the Minister for Finance, I give notice that on the next day of sitting, he will move that a bill for an act to amend the Taxation Administration Act 2003 and the First Home Owner Grant Act 2000 be introduced and read a first time. Uh, brief ministerial statements. The Attorney General. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I rise to the table of the WA Law Reform Commission's report titled Project 110 Final Report Maintenance and Champerty in Western Australia. This report completes the Commission's reference in, made in July 9, 2018 and is essentially the final chapter of the 2015 report on representative proceedings. The Commission earned I table the report. The Commission earned, uh, examined tabled. whether or not tor the torts of maintenance and champerty should be abolished and considered strategies to mitigate any adverse impacts from their abolishment. Put simply, maintenance refers to the assistance or encouragement by a person who, who has neither an interest in the litigation nor just, justified motive justified motive for interference to a party to litigation. Champity is the maintenance of an action in consideration of a promise to give the maintainer a share of the proceeds or subject matter of the action. The Commission undertook considerable research and consultation with stakeholders in the legal community, including through its discussion paper. Most Australian jurisdictions have already abolished torts, the torts of maintenance and champity, and the majority of stakeholders supported the obligation abolition of the torts in Western Australia. The Commission made three recommendations primarily that torts of champerty and maintenance be abolished whilst preserving the rule of law regarding when a contract is to be treated as contrary to public policy or as otherwise illegal. The, the other recommendations seek to complement the Supreme Court's supervisory role in protecting the interests of class members in funded proceedings. These matters fall within the Court's remit and if the government is to accept the recommendation, it will require further discussion with the court. The Commission has presented four options for change in relation to the litigation funding arrangements to protect defendants, representative parties and group members in funded representative proceedings. These will be considered in due course. I thank the Commission for its work and table the final report in accordance with section <laughs> 11 subsection 7 of the Law Reform Commission Act 1972. The Minister for Disability Services. Madam Speaker, I'm pleased to inform the House of the new six unit specialist disability accommodation development in Geraldton known as the West End Villas, which I had the honour of opening recently. The de development is the first of its kind in regional Western Australia and was a collaboration between WAI Group, well-known disability services organisation Active, and community housing provider Community Housing Limited. The villas have been built by Geraldton-based builders and provide a new housing option for local people with extreme functional impairment and high needs requirements requiring specialised housing. The McGowan Government is keen to see eligible Western Australians with disability activate their SDA entitlements and exercise choice and control over their housing, which is what makes the opening of this Geraldton project so exciting. In 2020, the State Government committed to the Department of Communities registering as a specialist disability accommodation provider under the National Disability Insurance Scheme. 
This will allow state-owned group homes to be enrolled as special disability accommodation and, importantly, attract NDIS funding. The funding generated by SDA payments will be used to modify, maintain, refurbish and redevelop existing group homes or build additional specialist disability accommodation, thereby increasing the supply of housing stock in the market and creating local jobs. The McGowan Government remains committed to the successful transition to the National Disability Insurance Scheme and recognises that specialist disability accommodation funding stream plays an important role in improving housing choice for people with disability requiring specialised housing. It's fantastic to see nation-leading SDA projects such as the West End Villas being built in regional WA and I look forward to seeing the construction of similar developments across the state. Uh, bills, notices of motion. Bills, notices of motion. Thank you, Madam, the Attorney uh, General. Madam Speaker. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Criminal Appeals Amendment Bill 2021 of Western Australia. The Criminal Appeals Amendment Bill 2021 will amend the Criminals Appeals Act of 2004. So, sorry, if I could just uh, interrupt. <laughs> sorry, Attorney General. Um, I think you've started in on your second reading speech, and I think you might have some papers there that suggest you could move that it be read a first time. Oh. I'm sorry. Uh, the Criminal Appeals Amendment Bill 2021, I move, be read a first time. Uh, it's moved. All those in favour? Aye. Those to the contrary? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Yeah. So, have you got copies of the bill? Have we got Table everything in order? Of the bill, the explanatory memoranda. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Acting, uh, Madam Speaker. <laughs> yes, Madam, Speaker um, Madam Speaker, forever. Yeah. Uh, a bill for an act to amend the Criminal Appeals Act 2004 to introduce rights of further appeal against conviction and to make consequential amendments to the Bail Act 1982 and the Criminal Procedure Act 2004 and the Fines, Penalties and Infringement Notice Enforcement Act 1994 and the Supreme Court Act 1935. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill now be read a second. Yeah. Be now read a second time. The Criminal Appeals Amendment Bill 2021 will amend the Criminal Appeals Act 2004 and make consequential amendments to other Act, introducing a new statutory right for a person to make a second or subsequent appeal against a conviction on indictment in circumstances where there is fresh and compelling or new and compelling evidence. <coughs> Members may recall that the Criminal Appeals Amendment Act 2019 that was introduced into the last parliament lapsed on prorogation of that parliament. This bill affects the same policy as that bill, but it does reflect some wording changes, including those amendments that were made in the Legislative Assembly of the previous parliament. A pillar of our justice system is the principle of finality which dictates that once the court has handed down a decision, that decision is final. This is an essential element of the way our legal system works, creating certainty and consistency. However, there are limited circumstances in which the principle of finality must be put aside for the purposes of allowing justice to be served, however belatedly. This bill seeks to provide that avenue. <clears throat> As it stands, 
A convicted person who has exhausted all of their appeals has no further right to appeal, even if new evidence later emerges that has the potential to exonerate them or fresh evidence establishes that a substantial miscarriage of justice has occurred. Without this important bill, even where new evidence is available showing that a person is innocent, their only avenue of redress is to lodge a petition for the exercise of the royal prerogative of mercy by the governor or petition the attorney general to refer the case to the Court of Appeal. I have been a long time proponent of removing politics from criminal appeals and have been vocal about the need to create a passage for second and subsequent appeals direct to the Court of Appeal. I have had significant involvement in two referrals to the Court of Appeal. The first was several years ago when, as a backbencher in this House, I advocated for Andrew Mallard's case to be referred to the Court of Appeal. The second, more recent example, when my decision as Attorney General was to refer Scott Ostick's case to the Court of Appeal. Mr Mallard was convicted of willful murder in 1995. His appeal against his conviction was dismissed in 1996. In 1997, the High Court refused special leave to appeal. Mr Mallard's family unsuccessfully petitioned the then Attorney General, the Honourable Peter Foss, to refer his case to the Court of Appeal. It was not until 2002, under a new Attorney General, the Honourable Jim McGuinty, MLA, that the case was referred to the, to the Court of Criminal Appeal, allowing an appeal process that culminated in the High Court overturning Mallard's conviction in 2005. Six months later, the, direction, the, direct, the then Director of Public Prosecutions decided not to retry Mr Mallard, and a second cold case review identified another convicted murderer as the perpetrator of this senseless killing of Mrs Pamela Lawrence. After almost 12 years in prison for a crime he did not commit, Mr Mallard was a free man. In 2009, Scott Ostick was convicted of willful murder. In 2010, Mr Ostick's appeal of his conviction and sentence were dismissed. In early 2012, Ostick lodged a petition with the then Attorney General, the Honourable Christian Porter. In September 2013, the new Attorney General, the Honourable Michael Mission, refused to refer the case. In February 2018, I received a petition from Ostick was substantially the same as the one refused by my predecessor. In 2018, two months after Ostick lodged his appeal with me, I referred the case to the Court of Criminal Appeal upon the advice of the then Solicitor General. In 2020, the Court of Appeal overturned Ostick's conviction. In November 2020, Mr Ostick was acquitted after a retrial. Six years, therefore, bet passed between Mr Ostick's first petition to Mr Porter and his second petition to me. Mr Ostick waited over 19 months for his petition to be considered, only to have it refused by Mr Mission. How many years earlier would Scott Ostick's case have been heard if he had the option to bring his case to the Court of Appeal and not to a politician? How many more years did Mr Andrew Mallard spend in jail because he could not convince an Attorney General to let the Court of Appeal hear his case? I now turn to provide some detail of what is contained in this bill. 
This bill will allow an offender convicted of an offence upon indictment to bring a second or subsequent appeal to the Court of Appeal against conviction, not against sentence. If there is either fresh and compelling or new and compelling evidence relating to the offence. The ability to bring a second or subsequent appeal to the Court of Appeal under this bill has been limited to convictions on indictment. The policy is that the principle of finality ought be inferred within, within circumstances where a wrongful conviction has the most serious consequences. That is, where the absence of an opportunity to commence a further appeal could produce a significant injustice. Consistent with this policy, the Bill does not provide for further appeals against convictions on simple offences. Such matters are dealt with in magistrates' court, attract lower penalties and are on lower end of offending. <clears throat> The scope of appealable convictions when appealing to the Court of Appeal is consistent with other legislation allowing appeals to the Court of Appeal being section 140 of the Sentencing Act 1995 and section 23 of the Criminal Appeals Act. There are two categories of fresh evidence. First, evidence is fresh if, despite the exercise of reasonable diligence, it was not and could not have been attended at the trial of the offence of any previous appeal. Second, evidence is fresh if the evidence was not tendered at the trial of an offence or any previous appeal, but with the exercise of reasonable diligence could have been so tendered and the failure to tender the evidence was due to the incompetence or negligence of the lawyer representing the offender. Evidence is new if it was not tendered at the trial of the offence or any previous appeal, but with the exercise of reasonable diligence could have been tendered at the trial of the offence or any previous appeal. In either circumstances, in either circumstance, the evidence must be compelling, that it must be highly probative in the context of the issues in dispute at the trial of the offence. Evidence will be highly probative if it has a real material bearing on the determination of fact in issue, which, in turn, may rationally affect the ultimate outcome of the case. The level of proof required for a successful appeal differs between cases based on whether the evidence is fresh or new. The Court of Appeal must allow an appeal based on fresh and compelling evidence if it is satisfied that there was a miscarriage of justice. The Court may dismiss at the appeal if it considers that no substantial miscarriage of justice occurred. The intent of this proviso is to ensure that technical errors do not unnecessarily result in appeal intervention which would cause undue distress to victims and next of kin but to allow a second or subsequent appeal where a miscarriage of justice is so significant as to warrant an exceptional incursion into the principles surrounding finality of a conviction. The threshold for new evidence is understandably much higher. There must be powerful reasons for disturbing a conviction obtained after trial which has been regularly conducted. The higher threshold also prevents persons who have gone to trial underprepared from being rewarded for their lack of diligence. The Court of Appeal must allow an appeal based on new and compelling evidence only if it is satisfied on the balance of probabilities that in light of all the evidence, the evidence established that the evidence that the offender is innocent. This bill's has significant safeguards to protect against the flooding of unmeritorious applications, appeal applications, thereby limiting the potential impact of re-traumatisation on victims and next of kin. The requirement for an application for leave to appeal in every case is designed to act as a filter for vexatious, frivolous 
or spurious applications. The Court of Appeal must decide the leave application before the appeal unless it considers it necessary or desirable to give leave to appeal at the hearing of or when giving judgment on the appeal. The proposed amendments in the bill will operate retrospect retrospectively insofar as they will apply to any person convicted prior to the commencement of these amendments. I also point out that the proposed amendments will not order the current powers of the executive with respect to an application of the Royal Prerogative of Mercy and the power of the Attorney General to refer matters back to the Court of Appeal under section 140 of the Sentencing Act. The bill introduces a new process for criminal appeals. It also incorporates a provision for the review of the operation and effectiveness of amendments to occur within five years of the commencement of the legislation. This bill strikes an appropriate balance between the competing interests of wrongly convicted persons and victims of crime. The framework establishes an additional mechanism for correcting substantial miscarriage of justice while respecting the public interest in the finality of litigation. My aim with this important reform is to depoliticise what has previously been a highly political process. It has been my view over a great number of years that this process is best carried out by the judiciary and not by the Attorney-General of the day. Question is, uh, the second reading be agreed to. The uh, member for Rye. Madam Speaker, I move debate be adjourned. Question is that debate be adjourned. Mm. All those in favour? Aye. Those to the contrary? Uh, the, the motion is carried. That takes us to Government Business Orders of the Day. Government Business Order of the Day number one, Children and Community Services Amendment Bill 2021 to be read a third time. The Minister Speaker. for Community Services. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill be read a third time. Uh, thank you. Uh, look, I, I spoke um, in the end uh, longer than I expected to at the conclusion of second reading last night. I think much to uh, other members' chagrin because they were... Uh, I stood between them and, uh, and going home for the evening. But I do appreciate uh, the contributions that members um, across the chamber made to this important <laughs> bill. Uh, and um, I'd also like to thank the people and organisations who attended consultations, provided submission and the staff who assisted in the review of the Act and other consultations we've had uh, during the progress uh, of bringing this bill in its current form to this parliament. Uh, I know there has been uh, and continues to be much public interest in these amendments. Uh, and I'd like to place on record my thanks again to all involved in the Royal Commission into institutional responses to child sex abuse, and also to those survivors who stepped forward and shared their experiences to inform the decisions uh, that we make in this place as a parliament. I'd also like to thank the hardworking staff in the Department of Communities who every day work to keep children in our community safe. I commend the bill to the House. Question is, the bill be read a third time? All those in favour? Aye. Those to the contrary? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Children and Community Services Act 2004 to implement recommendations of the 2017 statutory review of the Act and to introduce mandatory reporting of child sexual abuse for certain purposes and for other related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 2, Agricultural Produce Commission Amendment Bill 2021 to be read a first time. Speaker. The Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I move that a bill for an act to amend the Agricultural Produce Commission Act 1998 be introduced and read a first time, and I present a copy of the explanatory memorandum. Question is the bill be read a first time? Those in favour? Aye. Those to the contrary? Believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. A bill for an act to amend the Agricultural Produce Commission Act 1988. Madam the Speaker. Leader of the House. Madam Speaker, I move that the bill be now read a second time. 
31 years ago, the Horticultural Produce Commission Act 1988 established the Commission as a statutory authority with the primary function of establishing producers' committees. This Act was amended to become the Agricultural Produce Commission Act in the year 2000. The amendments now produced, sorry, the, the amendments now proposed will modernise the Act, improving service and responsiveness to agricultural industries which already use and those which might choose in the future to use the Act. The amendments emerged from a comprehensive review of the Act in 2006. The Act relies on collaboration, consultation and majority supported outcomes. It provides a mechanism for producers to combine their efforts and resources and work together through their producers committee to achieve the agreed goals of their industry. For a committee to be established, the Act requires a poll of producers in the industry to, ter to, to determine if producers are in favour of the proposal. Before the poll can be conducted, the Commission must advertise the intention to conduct the poll and invite submissions from affected producers. The Commission, with 30 years of experience in forming and supporting producers' committees, has learnt that the vital component of a successful producers' committee is the involvement of and support from the producers who will be the beneficiaries of the services the committee provides. The Commission does not move to conduct a poll unless there has been extensive consultation with the members of the industry concerned. As an example, the dis discussion between the wine industry and the Commission covered a span of nearly 10 years. The 11 existing APC producers committees covering 13 horticultural and prescribed industries use the Act to provide various services to their industries. Some provide all of the services available under the Act and others undertake only specific functions. The Commission supports the committees and is responsible for determining, on the recommendation of each producer's committee, the charges for the services provided by that committee. These are fee for service charges and are payable by producers. Over the years, producer committees for agricultural produce such as pork, poem and bananas have provided services as varied as conducting research into maximising the performance of pigs after weaning, contributing to the commerci commercialisation of the Bravo banded apple, branded apple, sorry, and hmm. paying compensation to Carnarvon banana growers after cyclone Oilwind. These achievements evidence the value of the Act to producers and their industries, the government and the greater agricultural industry. The Act has allowed and encouraged producers to undertake candid and objective assessments of their industries and put in place strategies which allow them to work together in a leadership capacity for individual and greater industry good. This has fostered grower and industry responsibility and accountability whilst aiding government by reducing the impost on government funding. Most amendments now proposed are of an administrative and operational nature. Key amendments include, number one, compliance and enforcement provisions, including powers to direct a person to provide information or records powers to investigate and a penalty for providing false and misleading information. This is to ensure producers are complying with the Act and that all funds collected are used as intended to support industry. <coughs> Two, allowing non-producers to be appointed to committees. This gives the Commission the option to have a producers committee comprised of a blend of producer and non-producer members subject to producers always being in the majority. Voting rights on committees will be restricted to producer members only. <coughs> Three, providing a mechanism for existing committees to be allocated responsibility for additional produce. Four, including power for the commission to use weighted voting at a poll for the establishment of a committee. Weighted voting, 
determined according to the proportion of produce produced by a producer would only be utilised if there was sufficient industry data available to the Commission for it to make the determination. And where such an approach is in the best interests of the relevant agricultural industry. Five, allowing flexibility on a number of Commission members. Madam Speaker, these amendments will assist the Commission and the Producers' Committees to operate more efficiently and effectively and to achieve improved outcomes for producers. One amendment proposed in the 2019 version of this bill was the removal of the exclusion of the broad acre cropping and grazing industry. This would have allowed those industries to be prescribed as agricultural industries under the Act and, if they chose, to take advantage of the opportunities it offers and create a producer committee to service their industry. However, no consensus was reached amongst pastoralists as to whether their industry wanted to access the Act. As such, this bill retains the current Act's exclusion, with amendment to clarify that this excludes an industry that concerns livestock enterprises generally conducted on pastoral land. Another important amendment is the capacity for the regulations to provide for the circumstances in which a charge for services may be waived, refunded or reduced. This, is in, a, this in, a, in effect is an opt-out clause providing the ability for regulations to be made on the process for producers to opt out of paying charges or to have their charges refunded or reduced. Regulations are tailor-made to suit the different requirements of each producer committee and industry. For existing committees, this new head power for regulations <coughs> will allow waiver provisions to be included in their current regulations if their producers wish to have this option included. For new committees, the need for a waiver position, sorry, a waiver provision will be part of discussions with the Commission when producers indicate an interest in establishing a committee. The proposed amendments will improve the effectiveness of the APC mechanism for producers currently using it and make the opportunities it provides available to producers in the broadacre cropping industries. Madam Speaker, I commend the bill to the House. The question is the bill be read a second time. The member for Rowe. Madam Speaker, I move debate be adjourned. The question is debate be adjourned. All those in favour? Aye. Those to the contrary? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Family Court Amendment Bill 2021, second reading, adjourned debate. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I rise briefly on behalf of the Opposition on behalf of the opposition to contribute to the Family Court Amendment Bill uh, 2021. See, the shadow for this particular piece of legislation is in the Legislative Council and, as with all of your bills, uh, Attorney-General, I suspect that there will be considerable um, debate in the other place and further questions from the shadow, but we'll put on record uh, our views in relation to this bill and from the outset uh, we'll say that the opposition supports the legislation. So just from a background perspective, um, it's a five clause bill. It amends the Family Court Act um, of 1997, which is an act that deals with child and property matters for de facto relationships. And it seeks to mirror amendments made to the Family Law Act 1975 from the Commonwealth, which were passed back in uh, 2018, by providing protections to the victims of domestic violence during cross-examination in family law proceedings. Most notably, the bill aims to treat de facto partners the same as married couples by, uh, one, prohibiting the personal cross-examination in certain circumstances, such as where a family violence order exists between the parties. Each person under this legislation must instead engage a lawyer to conduct the cross-examination of the other party, and they can access a lawyer by applying for legal representation under the Commonwealth Family Violence and Cross-Examination Scheme. The second part of it ensures that the court puts in place appropriate protections for victims in situations where an allegation of family violence has been made 
consent, but none of the prescribed circumstances exist. Such protections are left to the court's discretion, um, but uh, I believe that the explanatory memorandum uh, outlines or states that these could include allowing the witness to give evidence from a remote venue, uh, allowing the victim to have a support person and ordering that questions be directed to the presiding judicial officer who relays them to the witness. Um, the bill, uh, Madam Speaker, further amends section 243 of the Act, which imposes penalties if a person publicly <coughs> publishes information about proceedings which identify a party or the relatives or any witness to those proceedings. Um, a new exemption is created which mirrors the Commonwealth Act and it allows documents to be shared with a state or a territory authority which oversees the welfare of children and is prescribed by the regulations. Um, obviously the, the situation that we're trying to remedy is very uh, concerning and distressing for those involved. Uh, personal cross-examination by a victim can be difficult or distressing and cause additional trauma. Um, however, that cross-examination process in our courts is important and it does ensure that parties' evidence when they're provided is appropriately tested and it can uh, prevent um, untoward circumstances, <coughs> premature settlements or agreements that are not in best interests of, of the children that, uh, that are uh, in play. By banning those personal cross-examinations and having a legal practitioner instead conduct the cross-examinations in such circumstances, uh, the bill seeks to bring in procedural fairness and it will make sure that it's enhanced. Uh, my understanding is that the bill is essentially identical, Attorney General, to the Family Court Amendment Bill 2019 um, and that failed to progress through the 40th Parliament. I do understand um, uh, that it was read a third time in the Legislative Assembly uh, on the 12th of March in 2020, and it was introduced in the Legislative Council on the 17th of March, but it was never brought on for debate. And the material difference, and I'm happy to be corrected, between the 2019 bill and the current bill is the inclusion of amendments to section 243. Um, the key difference between the Commonwealth Act and the current bill is that the Commonwealth Act mandates a review of the provisions dealing with cross-examinations of parties where there are allegations of family violence. And we understand that the review will take place in September 2021. Um, there isn't any kind of review provision contained in this bill um, and it's asserted uh, through the explanatory memorandum that this is not necessary given that the Commonwealth will be conducting a review. And so. Perhaps that's something that the Attorney-General might like to comment on in his response. Um, there's been a number of uh, reports and inquiries in relation to this matter. Um, the stakeholders that have been um, discussing it, that, as you would expect, have raised concerns in relation to issues of procedural fairness, particularly if one party were to be unrepresented following the application of a ban. Um, the unrepresented party would not then have a chance to challenge the other party's evidence through cross-examination. Mm -hmm. I've not had um, the fortune, misfortune, opportunity to have to experience this firsthand, but certainly when you speak to those that have been through a court proceeding, uh, particularly when you're talking about family, family issues, it is distressing at the best of times. Um, I think from the opposition's perspective, um, trying to make sure that everyone has access to procedural fairness without re-victimising people um, and, and ensuring that they are safe and secure uh, is, uh, an admirable, uh, is an admirable outcome. And uh, as I said, there will, be, um, there will be questions from the Shadow Attorney General uh, in the Legislative Council. Um, I think the uh, questions that will be forthcoming will be in relation to the financial viability of the scheme and whether or not um, there is adequate funding so that there is a guarantee of that uh, legal representation to ensure that there is procedural fairness. I think that's uh, an appropriate question to ask and, and we, we ask that the Attorney-General can perhaps shed some light on that um, in terms of how that will be funded and, 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 and in an ongoing way, not just um, in the in the setup, so that there is a sustainability and, and we can ensure that that's going to uh, continue to serve its purpose. Uh, so without any further ado, Attorney-General, um, as I said, the opposition is supportive of um, the legislation. I'm sure that the Shadow Attorney-General will have more questions uh, for your team and the Minister representing in the Legislative Council. Yeah, 
Uh, there's not many things you can guarantee in this world, but I absolutely can guarantee that. Uh, but with that, uh, I won't uh, take the House's time any further other than to say uh, it, it seemed a very sensible piece of legislation. It was um, sad not to see it passed so that families didn't have access to this uh, earlier on in the piece. Um, unfortunate that it wasn't progressed in the last Parliament. Um, and there should be uh, no, no reason that the, the government can't pass this through with the numbers it's got in both houses uh, on this occasion. Further speakers? The member for Netherlands. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I'm pleased to rise to uh, speak in support of the Family Court Amendment Bill 2021 to ensure that perpetrators of family and domestic violence can no longer cross-examine their victims in family court proceedings. And I think to understand the importance of this amendment, it is important to understand the complex dynamics of family and domestic violence. So while violence takes place within a range of relationships and takes many forms, physical, sexual, financial, emotional and social, it is characterised by a pattern of abusive behaviour that involves the perpetrator's exercise of control and power over his victim. Victims of domestic and family violence may sustain long-term harm to their physical, mental, social, financial and emotional well-being, and it's now recognised that children who bear witness to family and domestic violence are themselves victims of child abuse, with ongoing trauma and development, developmental impacts through to adulthood. Domestic violence is gendered in nature. According to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, intimate partner violence is the greatest health risk factor, greater than smoking, alcohol and obesity, for women in their reproductive years. It is the top risk factor for death, disability and illness in women aged 15 to 44. It is also the leading cause of homelessness for women. It is too a significant contributor to women's poverty and a major reason for their involvement with the child protection system. According to one of our national leaders in the primary prevention of violence against women and their children in Australia, Our Watch, violence against women starts with disrespect. I think when a violent relationship ends in a family court hearing where a perpetrator can cross-examine his victim, then it also ends in disrespect, a disrespect that is currently institutionalised. There are times of heightened risk for family and domestic violence to either commence or to um, be exacerbated. Pregnancy is often a time when family and domestic violence starts. Attempted or actual separation is a high risk time, as are actual court proceedings. Because all of these represent a change in the dynamic of power and therefore see the perpetrator work to reassert their control and power over their victim. <clears throat> so imagine, if you will, that you have lived in a home that is marked by fear, violence and intimidation. You have been socially and financially isolated and controlled. You have had criminal assaults committed against you. Imagine then that you gather the courage, resources, strength and support to leave, perhaps getting your children out with you as well. And you do this despite knowing that leaving is one of the highest risk times in a violent relationship. There are fears then of further and even extreme violence, poverty or homelessness if you leave. There are fears of being murdered. Given that a woman dies every single week in this country at the hands of her partner or ex-partner, this fear is very, very real. For a brief time, I worked on the Women's Domestic Violence Helpline, and women would routinely express their deeply held knowledge and fear that separation, that leaving, was a time of great risk, and that this knowledge influenced their decision-making about separation. So imagine, again, that you put that fear aside, you gather the strength to leave, and that the separation proceeds, and you finally get to the point of a legal separation with decisions to be made about property and child living arrangements. Decisions that will lay a foundation for your new life, your new life of safety, free from violence and abuse. It's a time of both great hope and great anxiety. The idea of being cross-examined by anyone in a formal court process is daunting. Attending court itself is intimidating and stressful, and you know that you are exposing yourself to risk of further harm and abuse just by being there. So imagine then that you present to court to find that your perpetrator has the right to cross-examine you. In some cases, a perpetrator may even choose to be self-represented, hoping to secure the opportunity to, direct, to directly cross-examine their victim and reassert their power. 
The family court system in WA currently allows your perpetrator to subject you to further violence and control. When this amendment was introduced to federal family court legislation, the ABC reported on the experience of a woman they called Eleanor, a mother of four in regional Victoria. She had escaped an abusive relationship and was going through the family court process. Her relationship was marked by repeated sexual assaults. Her husband would repeatedly rape her. She had also been kicked on a regular basis by him while he was wearing his steel cap work boots. Eleanor's story reminds us of the criminal and violent acts which survivors of family and domestic violence have been subjected to. And yet the court allowed his control over her to continue. In Eleanor's words, when I turned up for the family court hearing, I found out on the day that he had become a self-litigant and that he was going to be representing himself and that he was going to be given the privilege of being able to cross-examine me directly. Why would they give someone the power over their victim like that? Why would they give him the right to cross-examine me in court, knowing the trauma that I had faced? The man who had raped and repeatedly assaulted her was now going to question her in a formal legal context. She found this out on the day, so no time to prepare emotionally or physically or legally for this situation. And I repeat Eleanor's question of disbelief. Why would they give someone the power over their victim like that? When a self-represented perpetrator cross-examines the victim, their power is allowed to enter the court with a direct impact on evidentiary processes and its outcomes. Their power is also allowed to continue to traumatise and diminish their victim. It is, I say again, a form of institutional abuse. Procedural fairness in legal proceedings should mean that the court puts in place measures to ensure that witnesses can provide their evidence comfortably and without fear or intimidation. A self-represented perpetrator's cross-examination can impact the victim's capacity to give evidence. This in turn can compromise the quality and the completeness of that evidence. Victims are scared about the repercussions for them and for their children after court proceedings have been finalised. The court, as a result, may not get a full picture of abuse because victims hold back on sharing all information. Self-represented litigants may also ask questions that are irrelevant to proceedings. Again, questions designed to antagonise and distress. The amendments do not remove the right to cross-examination of someone's testimony. However, it does improve the quality of evidence and conduct of the hearing itself. These provisions will ensure a fair hearing for all parties. In 2015 across 2016, the Women's Legal Service of Australia commissioned a survey, which was undertaken by the Women's Legal Service of Victoria. They aimed to catalogue the experience of women, survivors and victims of domestic violence who were engaging with the family law system. The survey was distributed nationally and gathered 338 responses and informed their submission to the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs submission to the parliamentary inquiry into a better family law system to support and protect those affected by family violence. The survey also captured women's experiences of being personally cross-examined by their abusers in family court proceedings. And roughly half of the survey participants had had this experience of being directly cross-examined by their abuser in the family law courts. 77 of those participants responded that their family law dispute had settled by way of consent orders. And over half of that group said that the prospect or the fear of personal cross-examination by their ex-partner was a factor in their decision to settle. They outlined reasons of fears which related to the fear of cross-examination. The judge pointed out that cross-examining me may lead to further decline of my mental condition, which could halt proceedings. Another woman said, I couldn't go back in that room and face him. We agreed to my having custody of the children. I agreed to visitation with him, even though I was fearful of my safety and theirs. I knew I wouldn't be able to abide by all the orders, but I couldn't keep going. In another survey question, the participants were asked how significant the prospect or fear of direct cross-examination by their ex-partner was on their decision to settle prior to trial. Of the 60 women who responded, 40 women said that it was very significant. 
These findings indicate that the fear of direct cross-examination can directly result in consent orders that actually do not reflect the wishes nor indeed the consent of all parties, and that can indeed endanger the safety of children and their parents. Alongside the legal implications are the human ones. Family court proceedings are difficult and emotive for any family. When we add family and domestic violence into the dynamic, there are additional layers and complexities of trauma, stress and fear. Being subject to direct cross-examination by your abuser is likely to re-traumatise victims, cause immense stress and to be a continuation of the abuse. In the work I've already referenced undertaken by the Women's Legal Service of Victoria, many women describe feeling frightened, unsafe, re-traumatised and intimidated. Some also expressed having physical symptoms of stress leading up to and following the event of cross-examination, including panic attacks, weight and hair loss, being physically sick, insomnia and post-traumatic stress disorder. A number of participants described the process as court-sanctioned abuse, as I've already noted, institutional abuse. As one woman said, I felt as though the court was enabling my ex-husband to re-abuse me, but publicly this time. I was so traumatised I lost 10 kilos and I lost my hair. Another woman said, I felt under extreme pressure. I was very anxious and I was trembling whilst I was under cross-examination. I felt that the judge was unaware of the extreme stress that I was under. I made mistakes when I was being cross-examined because I felt so cloudy and confused. In addition, 38 of the survey participants stated that they had had to personally cross-examine their abuser. And additional themes emerged in their descriptions of this experience, including that I was afraid to really question him, and I felt that when I tried, the judge continually silenced me. Another woman said, I was so scared because he has a look in his eye that still intimidates me, and I had the future safety of my children in jeopardy. I just wanted to get down on my knees and beg the judge to allow me to protect my daughter. <laughs> it's so hard to appear calm and collected on the inside when you have so much hatred for the person who has hurt you and has hurt your child, and so much fear for what lies ahead, including a fear that he might show up at my house later and become violent because he was mad at me for standing up to him. Our watch says that to stop violence against women from happening, we need to look at the bigger picture and address the four key drivers of this violence. The condoning of violence against women, men's control of decision-making and limiting women's independence in public and private life, rigid gender stereotype, sorry, rigid stereotype gender roles, and male-peer male relations that emphasise aggression and disrespect towards women. When we allow perpetrators to cross-examine their victims, we see all of these four dynamics at play. It condones violence against women by allowing it to continue in the court process and the court setting. It allows men's control and undue influence over processes of decision making in a legal, public, formal setting. Decisions which impact a victim's ability to recover and re-establish a life for her and perhaps for her children of safety and security. It represents rigid stereotype gender roles by continuing to minimise the impact of the trauma of family and domestic violence on the impact on the victim. And I think it is fair to say that allowing perpetrators to cross-examine their victims demonstrates aggression and disrespect towards women on an institutional scale. Domestic violence is complex. Preventing and reducing violence requires strong legislation amongst other me measures that hold perpetrators to account. We cannot provide a perpetrator with the opportunity to examine a victim in any court case. This is a simple and powerful action we can take now as a government to protect victims through the courts. We can acknowledge their courage and their resilience. We can remove a layer of institutional abuse and ensure everybody's right to procedural fairness. This means too that we are no longer active participants in institutional abuse. People at their most vulnerable could and should expect more from us. Thank you. The member for Collie Preston. Speaker. I rise today uh, to also speak in support of the Family Court Amendment Bill 2021. 
and I wholeheartedly support uh, the contributions from, from the member for, for Nedlands. In fact, I've crossed nearly a page out of my notes. Um, and it was very succinctly and, and very uh, uh, personally uh, put to the chamber. In giving you my uh, contributions to this discussion, I think I would like to begin by reflecting on the reasons for the amendments to the bill. And I think that says, speaks a lot to the fabric of society. And I'd like to really reflect on what that looks like in the context of um, Australian history. And I think right across the world, in fact, uh, we can just about pinpoint the point at which society changed and that women's rights changed. And I look at World War II probably as one of the, the major drivers for that change, certainly in the last century. And it really uh, allowed the evolution of women's roles in the home and in society. And if we examine uh, prior to World War II, the role of women in society was really about uh, being the carer for children, uh, doing the bulk of the housework and domestic duties, belonging to part of a nuclear family, which was generally a husband, a wife, and probably several children and that the male of that nuclear family was the breadwinner for, those, for that particular home. And in, in looking at that from a sociological perspective, we can really reflect on perhaps the gender inequality and therefore potentially power imbalance in situations like that during prior to World War II. The advent of World War II meant that men obviously uh, travelled across the oceans to various uh, uh, fronts to fight the war on behalf of uh, certainly the um, Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom and their allies. And what it meant for society was that a lot of the men weren't present and that a lot of the jobs that were normally done by men in those very specific stereotypical roles were now requiring women to step up to perform those roles outside of the home. Some of these women took jobs such as nurses, uh, they took military job, jobs such as signalmen, uh, signal persons, sorry, radio operators, and in the case of my grandparents, uh, my nana uh, travelled to Geelong, who, and she was involved in uh, deciphering and, and communicating some of the signals that were being sent and received to Australia. And my grandfather at that point in time uh, obviously fought in the war in New Guinea. Other women uh, were doing very, what were very clear up until now, very clear uh, gender specific roles. They took up jobs in manufacturing industries such as producing uniforms, weapons and ammunitions and stepping uh, more so into agriculture as the men uh, often left the land and women stepped in uh, particularly in, in roles like the Women's Land Army. And I look at America as well, and the, the, I guess the impact for what women were, were stepping into, roles that women were stepping into in America was particularly reflected in the baseball league. So 500 major league baseball players during World War II actually left the, the baseball uh, league to serve in the military, notably Joe DiMaggio. And the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League was established in 1943. It was meant to be temporary, but it actually continued for 12 years. <coughs> and Jean Fote, a player during the All-American Girls Professional Baseball League, was asked about her participation in the league and about her participation in a non-traditional uh, role. And she quoted, these years were the greatest years of my life. And to move then to post-World War II, when the men returned back to Australia, it was seen that any woman who took a job uh, or held a job post-World War II was taking that job from the men who returned uh, from the war and needed to support their family. So women stepped back into their traditional roles of caring and um, obviously looking after the family and the home. The post-war baby boom also signalled the fact that child rearing was uh, 
certainly the domain of women at that point in time. And often that was coupled with caring for husbands who returned from war with perhaps physical disabilities or with mental uh, difficulties, um, what we would often now call post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of what they'd seen during the war. Very, very complex period of time when you look at it from, a, from the perspective of society development. And in the 1950s to the 1970s, society progressed again. But I think the key, uh, the key uh, change, uh, change factor around that was certainly the ad advent of contraception or the pill, where women had control over their fertility and the size of their families, obviously in consultation a lot of the times, or most of the times, with their, with their husbands. But certainly that meant that the family had control over uh, what their, their individual um, circumstances looked like. And then we look at the, uh, the year of 1975, where the Family Law Act was established, uh, which meant uh, that there was a no-fault divorce system. And from the 1980s to uh, 2021, again, our society changed in that society became more accepting of women's roles changing within the community and within their families. Uh, sharing of child rearing responsibilities was more and more commonplace and probably is, is uh, the norm now instead of uh, what it certainly was during uh, the early parts of last century. Sharing household chores and responsibilities are also uh, part of what a, a family function looks like in particular in our era. And it's not uncommon now for both parents to be working and sharing childcare and household responsibilities. So I ask really, what does this mean today for our society? And that while society has changed and adapted significantly, I'd like to acknowledge that the family structures and what that looks like has changed over time. And in amongst all of this consideration, there is now a dark undercurrent for some families and some family dynamics where their home life is marred by family and domestic violence. There's certainly not a new, um, uh, uh, phenomena, but it's certainly one now that is more readily talked about in our society. And I refer to uh, some research that was done and presented in, in 2017. It's uh, called Are We There Yet? Australians' mm -hmm. Attitudes Towards Violence Against Women and Gender Equality. It was conducted by the Australian National Research Organisation for Women's Safety in partnership with a number of universities, including RMIT, the Social Research Centre, uh, the University of Melbourne, Uni University of New South Wales and Victoria Health. And I took the time to have a read through this particular document because it actually traces um, attitudes to, towards violence and women and gender equality from 1995. So it gives a really good snapshot of uh, where society's uh, values are at this point. There were some very positive and encouraging findings out of this uh, particular report. And it certainly uh, highlights the fact that Australians have an accurate knowledge of violence against women and do not endorse this violence that most Australians support gender equality and are more likely to support gender equality in 2017 than ever before. And Australians are more likely to understand that violence against women involves more than just physical violence in 2017 than ever before. And those are some really positive moves and I think uh, demonstrate how society has changed and how people's attitudes have changed even in the last 20 years. But I'd like to highlight some of the concerning uh, findings within the report because I think they speak to certainly some of the issues that relate back to the family court system and the things we're considering here today. There, there continues to be a decline in the number of Australians who understand that men are more likely than women to perpetrate domestic violence. There was actually a decrease in people who recognise that that uh, potentially is the case. And it's a worrying statistic because it doesn't matter which report you pick up, that is, that is absolutely unrefutable. Um, I look at also the fact that a concerning proportion of Australians believe that gender inequality is exaggerated or no longer a problem. 
and I'd like to counter that particular argument shortly. And another considering, uh, another concerning uh, understanding is that one in five Australians would not be bothered if a male friend told a sexist joke about women. All of those things link back to the idea that uh, gender inequality certainly is um, sadly alive and well in Australia today. I'd like to also reflect on some information that was uh, sourced from the Impact for Women organisation. And when we talk about family and domestic violence, there's certainly some uh, very uh, concerning statistics around family and domestic violence, uh, even in the year of 2020. So in terms of um, the numbers of uh, murders and manslaughters that occurred in 2020, 156 men were murdered um, or the subject of manslaughter um, in 2020. It's a, a terrible statistic. In the same year, 62 females were also killed um, and 31 children or teens. It, it just, I find that a, a staggering statistic and I, I just, in this day and age, I, I just cannot understand how our society functions with those numbers. They're numbers but they're people. I think the concerning statistic for me is that of the 156 uh, men that were killed last year, 18 of those men were killed at the hands of their partner and as a result of uh, family and domestic violence deaths. Of the 62 females that were killed last year, 56 of those females, 90% were killed as a result of family and domestic violence. And of the 31 children, 20 or 65% were killed as a result of family and domestic violence. And I just ask everybody in the chamber at the moment to reflect on those numbers. They are a national tragedy. I'd like to uh, reflect on the uh, concerning, uh, concerning proportion of Australians that believe that gender inequality is exaggerated or no longer a problem. And I think we can see, even in 2021, we can look around at many workplaces around Australia where women and men would disagree with that particular um, point of view. I look at mine sites, I look at our own federal parliament, and I use as an example on the 11th of November 2020, where Prime Minister Scott Morrison spoke over the top of Minister Anne Rush Rustin, a female minister who was responding to a question about what it's like to be a woman in parliament. I think the Me Too movement also speaks uh, again, reflecting on the concerning proportion of Australians believing that gender inequality is exaggerated or no longer a problem. And only two weeks ago, John Coates, the Australian Olympic Committee chair, appeared to order Premier, Al Premier Anastasia, Anastasia Palaszczuk to attend the opening of the Tokyo Olympics. These examples are only a few examples that are in the public realm but they demonstrate that there is a power imbalance still in workplaces and it is still alive and well, sadly. On the ABC, notably misrepresented um, the, show, the uh, program about women in politics is still littered with examples of gender inequality. And reflecting back on concerning result number three, that one in five Australians would not be bothered if a male friend told a sexist joke about women. I'm not sure what would the, the result would be if we surveyed um, any workplace in Australia, but I certainly think that uh, you know there are some some roads that uh, sorry some inroads that we still need to make as a society. I'd like to also uh, dig deeper into the results of this particular report, and I refer to the. Um, knowledge of violence against women, and I'd like to highlight particularly the understanding of sexual violence. And uh, in 1995, we had 76% uh, of people who understood that women, or sorry, agreed with this statement, that
that women are more likely to be raped by someone they, they know than by a stranger. Worryingly, in 2017, that percentage is 64%. So women are more likely to be raped by someone they know than by a stranger. Also, in regards to attitudes to gender inequality, undermining women's independence and decision-making in public life. Um, on the whole, uh, the question was, on the whole, men make better political leaders than women. In 2019, that uh, percentage was 23. In 2017, it's 14%. That's certainly an improvement, but it's still an interesting uh, fact to reflect on that uh, a significant number of people still think that men are better placed to be political leaders than women. These are just a couple of examples that I've used to uh, draw from the research that indicates that we still have an issue with gender equality in Australia. And I'd like to take this opportunity to link that information back to the Family Court Amendment Bill and reflect on the family court proceedings, because where a family is involved in uh, family and domestic violence and the relationship between parents and the children, that, that impact on that family within a court proceeding where family and domestic violence is present is certainly very significant. And I'd like to also remind um, everybody that it is still generally women and children who are the, the victims of family and domestic violence and it's our role as legislators to be able to, to support our community and to protect families in this. And I'd like to talk about family and domestic violence very briefly. Um, may I seek an extension please? Yes. Thank you. Um, talk to family and domestic violence very briefly in terms of the types of violence. And certainly um, I'd like to raise some examples that I have seen, whether this be from 30 years of uh, supporting families and children in communities and schools. Um, but certainly when I was door knocking last year, I met a number of women who raised issues with me uh, in terms of their concerns around what was happening in terms of family court proceedings and in particular the cross-examination of uh, victims by the perpetrator. Family and domestic violence obviously develops slowly over time, as the member for Nedlands uh, referred to. Uh, they can be physical uh, violence, but also takes in other, many other um, examples such as emotional violence, financial violence. Uh, so one in five people in the survey I've referred to previously one in five Australians that were surveyed did not believe that financial control uh, was a serious problem in family and domestic violence circumstances. And yet you talk to people who tell their stories and that's one of the reasons and one of the barriers to them changing the situation that they're in because they cannot afford to move on or seek other um, accommodation or support for their family. And certainly coercive control is another um, example of family and domestic violence that is becoming, um, you know, people are becoming more and more aware of. And just recently uh, I was at a, at a supermarket and there was a man standing at his car uh, with two very young children sitting in the back seat. And he was yelling and agitated and I was getting out of the car myself, attempting to get all of my shopping bags and things together. And he was obviously pacing up and down outside of the car and, and very upset. And his words were to these very young children when he was screaming in the back window of the car, she needs to effing hurry up. And I've deleted the, the word because I prefer not to swear in parliament. I walked in reasonably distracted at that time. And it was only after about two or three minutes that I heard the engine revving in the car uh, to the point where everybody in the shop was wondering what was going on. And I couldn't help but reflect on the fact that that was clearly his attempt to control what that woman was doing inside of the shop. It was a, a, a non-verbal but very <laughs> obvious way of saying to his partner, you are taking up time and I do not have time to wait for you. And I reflected on that thinking, he's, this 
poor woman is probably inside the shop attempting to buy some, some supplies for her very young family. And I decided that at that point I was going to go out and uh, see what I could do, but uh, she had obviously gone through the checkout and the car had disappeared. But as a society, I think, what, what can we do to support families in that situation? And I think if we get to the point where family and domestic violence uh, victims get to a family court and uh, we need to be able to do whatever we can to not allow that power imbalance to be played out within a court system. And I'd like to also uh, just very briefly mention a couple of examples of uh, family and domestic violence situations that was raised with me when I was door knocking during the campaign. I had one woman explain to me that her previous partner had uh, bashed her so badly that she was left with an acquired brain injury. She had significant health issues resulting from this uh, acquired brain, brain injury and that prevented her from holding down ongoing employment. She said that uh, the reason she did not leave the, her partner before um, she was obviously hospitalised and then made the decision to leave her partner was because she was scared to leave the relationship because she had no money and she was unable to care for the children and the pets of her ha uh, family and scared that if she left the children and the pets in the care of her husband, uh, what he would do to them. So she stayed. And the ongoing impact of her children uh, was certainly that they had observed years of abuse and that those children were left with trauma themselves. One of her children had attempted suicide. And despite the fact that the family was supported after she did leave that, that relationship, they really struggled after the separation. And I think it's very important to reflect on what this particular, uh, what this looks like for people who are, who are in this situation. Another woman that I spoke to told me that it was easier to walk away from the violence. Uh, she was, um, a carer for her children and her husband was the breadwinner and she was a stay-at-home mum. When she left uh, the relationship she had basic skills and education level. Lower wages um, you know, was part of her, her uh, the fact that she had lower wages was part of the challenge for her in, in leaving the family. Um, she was left with no superannuation uh, because the superannuation after, after a separation uh, uh, basically belonged to her husband. She actually chose to walk away and not challenge a lot of this in court because she just didn't want to put herself through the trauma um, of what she'd already been through. And in reflecting about the children that are also part of the uh, family and domestic violence experience, um, I, in a classroom we often had to be aware that if we raised our voice with children in our classroom, that we were actually modelling what was sometimes happening in their own homes, and that that would trigger a trauma response. And that children acting out in class, and when they're challenged by authority, all of those things can actually bring back the trauma for those particular children. And often in, in a classroom situation, and in fact right across um, society, when you're in that situation, people either fight or they, or they flee from that situation. And so I have been in classrooms over the last 30 years where children left the classroom because they couldn't be in there. I've been in the situation where I've had a scooter thrown at my head. Luckily it missed. But that child's response to, the, to me questioning um, in a, in a, in a uh, you know, humanitarian way, but still, the impact of the trauma meant that the response of that child was to pick up the nearest thing to them and throw it at me. And that, that is a, uh, a very sobering experience because it makes you reflect on if that's what that child is doing here, um, clearly they're modelling uh, or you know, potentially modelling what they're seeing at home and what their families are doing in response to uh, trauma and family domestic violence at home. So imagine, if you will, that you're a woman or a child who's gone to the court system to be protected from uh, family and domestic violence and uh, where you are questioned 
openly in court by the perpetrator of family and domestic violence. And reliving that trauma it must be a terrifying experience. So the new provisions of this particular law aim to reduce the trauma from cross-examinations by perpetrators. Therefore, the, uh, the witnesses are able to give clear evidence. And I'm particularly heartened by the fact that witnesses will be able to give evidence remotely, whether that be in, in a uh, nearby room. And it also will allow uh, support people to sit with the victim during their proceedings, including give it, giving evidence. And given the trauma that these people have experienced, um, I think that's a, a welcome uh, move from this legislation. So in 2021, sadly, news headlines across Australia continue to report on family and domestic violence incidents and also uh, murders and deaths at the hands of partners and parents. And that is an overwhelming statistic. These people who are uh, overwhelmingly um, uh, the victims of family and domestic violence are being murdered by people they love, not by strangers. And our role as legislators is to make the laws that protect the victims of these circumstances. And our role is also to make the laws that police and the justice system are able to uh, implement to support families in this situation. As a government, our challenge is to fund programs and, and to uh, provide systems to support family court participants. And importantly, as a community, we need to work together to offer support to both victims and the perpetrators of domestic violence, family and domestic violence because no person is broken. And if we work together as a community, we can achieve very positive change for people within our community. We all have a role to play in keeping victims safe. And I think that this law in particular um, will help to do so. Thank you. Member for Mirafuka. Speaker. Um, <coughs> Madam Acting Speaker, right I also <laughs> rise um, to speak on the Family Court Amendment Bill. Um, I want to thank the Attorney-General for bringing this piece of legislation uh, forward to the House um, and acknowledge um, the contributions we've already had um, on this really very important topic. Um, I think there's been a number of speakers, um, all, the, all the two speakers so far have really talked about um, the background to uh, this bill, which at face value is pretty straightforward. It amends our state legislation um, to reflect uh, the provisions that have been introduced in the Federal Family Law Act um, to ensure that there are protections for victims of family violence uh, during cross-examination processes. Um, so in short, this bill uh, will prohibit personal cross-examination in family law proceedings in certain circumstances. Um, and particularly in cases where there's an allegation of family violence between the parties to a family court proceeding, they'll be prohibited from directly cross-examining each other. These are very sensible and uh, relatively modest changes, I think, to our laws and clearly reflect changes that have already been made um, to federal laws. Uh, but I think, as a number of speakers uh, have already reflected before me, uh, even though these changes are straightforward and um, I hope they're uncontroversial, uh, there are a number of benefits to these kinds of provisions that will importantly provide support um, to victims experiencing family and domestic violence. So by putting an end to victims being cross-examined by their perpetrators, it will improve their ability to give clear and very cogent evidence in these um, legal matters. Um, and I think we've already heard in, this, in the um, contributions to date that being cross-examined by a perpetrator can be so daunting, or the prospect of it can be so daunting, that in some cases it can lead to victims either prematurely settling their matters on terms that are less favourable to themselves um, and their children, if they have them, or indeed it might um, actively discourage uh, people from seeking to separate from a partner where family violence is involved. Um, and I think it is important to note, as others have done before me, that women are usually the victims of family and domestic violence. Um, and it is interesting to note that a woman who is subject to family violence is three times more likely to receive a minority share of relationship assets um, compared to a woman who is not the subject of a family violence situation. 
So I think there's a really compelling case for these um, very sensible and necessary laws. Um, and I, I did want to, in making my comments today, spend some time uh, not just concentrating on these changes, but indeed reflecting on the many things uh, that the McGowan government is doing, uh, which are helping to put in place practical um, measures, and I think significant measures, um, that will hopefully help to bring an end to family and domestic violence in this state. So since um, the McGowan government was elected in 2017, I think there's been a number of significant achievements um, towards progress towards this very um, important end, and that is ending family and domestic violence. Uh, I think you know, it, it is significant that it is the McGowan government that um, created the first minister for the prevention of family and domestic violence, the Honourable Simone McGurk. Uh, and there's been a number of good works that have been done um, as a result of having a minister uh, with carriage of this area. And I also want to acknowledge the work of the Attorney General, who's brought uh, this bill to the House, but a number of other pieces of legislation to provide support to victims of family and domestic violence as well. And indeed, to commend all of the Cabinet for the excellent work um, that, and, and all of the government for the excellent work that's gone on in this area. Um, I think it is really important to note um, that the McGowan government has a plan, has a plan about uh, eliminating family and domestic violence. So the document Path to Safety um, provides a long-term vision for WA to be free of family and domestic violence. And I think it sets out clear whole of government and a community plan that will reduce family and domestic violence and help the community to respond to it. It's a plan that was adopted last year and sets out really a 10-year plan for the work that can be done in this area. And I think it is a very important document. Um, it's a strategy that's been informed by data, by research, by consultation right across Western Australia. Um, working with experts, not just from government, but also from academia and indeed specialist um, experts in the family and domestic violence sector in this state. And I think the message um, that's clear from all the work that's been done, um, particularly since 2017, that if we are to bring an end to family and domestic violence, we need to work across a wide range of different areas and employ a wide range of strategies if we're to achieve this. Um, this the contributions that have already been made, I think, underline that it's not just an issue of policing. Um, ending family and domestic violence is not just a health issue. Um, it's not exclusively a women's issue or a court's issue, um, although I do think it is important to note that women are disproportionately affected by family violence. So we need to be able to work across a number of different areas. We need to be able to employ a number of different strategies. And the focus of the government, um, I think, has been excellent in that they have worked across a range of different areas and, importantly, worked um, on, on three main ob objectives, I guess. Um, that firstly, we should hold perpetrators to account. Uh, that secondly, we should provide appropriate support to victims. And thirdly, and I think really significantly, we need to change community attitudes towards women and towards family violence. And I note the member uh, for Collie Preston spoke quite a bit about community attitudes and gender inequality in her contribution, and I think that is um, a, a really important part of the overall strategy. So holding perpetrators to account has been an important part of the approach. Um, and law reform has been necessary, and there's been some good work in, in this area, and particularly uh, I note the non-fatal strangulation um, and suffocation was made a specific offence last year um, because there's a sound research base that shows perpetrators who use this kind of um, violence or potentially lethal force um, are seven times more likely to then go on and kill them. Uh, there's also been, I think, excellent changes to restraining orders um, over a period of time, but also, importantly, men's programs to provide support for perpetrators to help them change their behaviour. Members, there's also been a number of good works in the area of supporting victims, and this is, I think, a piece of legislation that uh, also uh, does that. But we know that providing support for people who are experiencing family and domestic violence is critical, that we need to provide support to help people leave violent relationships and help them build a new life. 
Um, and it's actually essential that we do this and provide confidence that um, people can leave because we, the decision to leave is often very difficult and for good reason. We know that women are more likely um, to experience a, a serious violent um, occurrence at the point that they are leaving a, um, leaving a relationship. So I did want to um, talk about a number of the initiatives that have been implemented by this government that do provide very practical support to uh, people who are experiencing family and domestic violence. And in particular, I wanted to um, recognise the decision of this government um, to implement 10 days paid family, domestic, family and domestic violence leave for public sector workers, um, one of the things they did um, shortly after winning office. Oh, shortly after winning office for the first term of government. Now, this leave is becoming more common. Um, more and more employers are recognising that it actually makes good sense to um, provide leave for people who are experiencing family and domestic violence because they recognise that this kind of violence doesn't just stop at the front door uh, of the workplace as someone makes their way to work. That, in fact, victims will often experience um, abuse or other forms of um, violence while they're physically in the workforce, uh, physically in the workplace, um, or that it will impact on their work attendance or it will impact on their work performance in a wide variety of ways. So providing employees with time off to seek assistance um, for any family violence matter is a really practical way to give support to employees so that they can arrange their affairs um, and hopefully begin um, a new life. We also know that staying in work and staying engaged with the workforce is a key consideration for people who are seeking to leave a violent relationship. Family and domestic violence leave is an excellent way to ensure that victims have the opportunity to seek the support they need in their employment um, without risking that employment due to being um, absent or unable to perform their tasks. And being in employment is one of the things that will help determine their success um, in making a decision to leave a, a relationship. I think it's also an important um, initiative because it ensures employers are fully appraised of the circumstances that their employees are dealing with and can provide them with the appropriate protection at work um, and indeed also appropriate protection for work colleagues who might be impacted. Um, during my former life as the, uh, in the union movement, I was a keen advocate for this kind of paid family and domestic violence leave, and I did want to today acknowledge the work of the Australian Services Union, the first union to secure this kind of paid leave um, in an arrangement with a local government employer in Victoria. The state government, the McGowan government, as the largest single employer in this state, I think has shown great leadership on this issue and I think they provide a very positive example to all employers in this state that it is appropriate to assist employees at this most critical time if indeed they are experiencing it. Uh, I did want to also talk a little bit about other strategies that the government's put in place to provide support for victims of family and domestic violence. The McGowan government is providing excellent support in my electorate of Mirabuka to those who are experiencing family and domestic violence by trialling one-stop hubs. The one-stop hub in Mirabuka is called Nala Jukun Healing Service. Nala Jukun provides integrated wraparound services to enable people experiencing family and domestic violence to get help sooner and to also access the services they need closer to where they live. The service operates as a consortium of organisations who deliver services in Mirabuka. It includes the City of Stirling and a whole range of services providing health, mental health, counselling, alcohol and other drug, legal, housing and financial counselling services. Uh, so people can see it clearly is a wide range of services that people might need to access at the point that they're seeking to leave a violent relationship. I want to acknowledge the consortium partners who are working collaboratively to make this pilot a success. These organisations provide a wide range of important services to many people who live in our community in Mirabuka. These services have chosen to work together and collaborate on family and domestic violence because they also recognise that partnerships and collaboration to provide these wraparound services to victims is the best way to support people experiencing violence at home. I want to thank all those services for their ongoing work in Mirabuka and particularly thank them for the hard work uh, in trying to find innovative solutions. Uh, the organisations involved are the Australian Childhood Foundation, Ebenezer Aboriginal Corporation, Isha Multicultural Women's Health Services, 
Carla Kalini Aboriginal Corporation, the Legal Aid Commission, Mercy Care, Metropolitan Migrant Resource Centre, Northern Suburbs Community Legal Centre, Sudbury Community House Association and Wadjuk Northside Aboriginal Corporation. Nala Jukun is an excellent example of how we can adopt new ways of thinking to address family and domestic violence in the community. Another excellent example of practical support for victims of family and domestic violence is the changes to the tenancy laws enacted in the last parliament, making it easier for tenants who are impacted by family and domestic violence to leave. Um, and they also allow victims the opportunity to change locks and do other practical things if necessary. The Pets in Crisis program, which um, the member for Collie Preston also referred to pets um, as one of the things on people's minds uh, when they're seeking to uh, leave a relationship. And this program is about providing practical support again um, that offers a temporary home for pets uh, while owners seek refuge or seek temporary accommodation. I finally wanted to turn to the question of changing community attitudes because I think this is really a very significant and important piece of work. Uh, and I did want to reflect on the excellent work that's been done to change community attitudes towards family and domestic violence um, and towards women generally. The introduction of the 16 days in WA to stop violence against women is an excellent initiative um, which promotes community action to address violence against women and to really shine a light on the need to promote equality and respectful for relationships. The campaign starts each year on the 25th of November, which is the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women, and it runs until the 10th of December. It brings together a series of community events under the one banner, and it's significantly raised community awareness about the issue, I think. The wearing of orange, the lighting up of key landmarks in orange, are both very visible ways to show solidarity in the community about bringing an end to family and domestic violence. I think it provides an excellent opportunity for all manner of conversations in business and professional settings about what is an important community issue. So I think underlying um, the success of the 16 days is a very powerful way to reinforce the message that family and domestic violence is a community issue. It is an issue for us all. And demonstrating support for this important cause by all in our community is a powerful way that we can begin to make change. In a similar way, um, I would like to also acknowledge the work of the late Angela Hartwig and the Women's Council, as it was known then. As many in this place will know, Angela Hartwig was a lifelong campaigner for women affected by family and domestic violence. She was a powerful advocate for change and she approached that task with patience and tenacity over many decades. Under her leadership, the Women's Council achieved a number of things, but one of the, one of the things they um, did was commence the tradition of a silent march and memorial service each year in November um, to coincide with the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. Uh, I have to say I've been profoundly moved on the occasions that I've attended those events, um, particularly moved by the personal stories from victims of family and domestic violence that were shared. Um, I think every year uh, there was someone who would share their story. Um, and often these were very harrowing and confronting stories and I've got to say I have great admiration for those who were able to tell what is a very difficult personal story uh, in quite a public way. But it is a profound way that um, I think we can affect change. The event also recognises those who have died as a result of family and domestic violence in the previous 12 months by reading out their gender, their age and where they lived. And I think that is an, also an incredibly powerful way to illustrate the reality of those who die from family and domestic violence each year. Uh, members, there are men and women amongst the number. They are very young and sometimes very old. And I think it is, again, an important way to illustrate that it is something that impacts on us all. During my time in my former role as Secretary of Unions WA, I felt very strongly that community leaders should stand up to be counted on this very important community issue. My own awareness about family and... Can I see for a short extension, please? Yes, thank you. My own awareness about family and domestic violence came during my time as an organiser with the Australian Services Union um, some time ago, where I was responsible for organising workers who worked in women's refuges. 
And during this time, it became really clear to me, um, at a time when family and domestic violence wasn't a topic that was um, regularly referred to um, in the news and it wasn't a matter that was on mind, people's minds particularly, but during this time, it became very clear to me that the many excellent staff who worked in women's refuges were doing very difficult, very demanding and complex work. They were providing practical support um, to women, mostly women, who were seeking, uh, who were leaving violent relationships, but also emotional support and also providing crisis counselling to women at a time that they were most vulnerable and distressed. Uh, I was particularly impressed by the workers in women's refuges, incredibly hardworking, uh, incredibly skilled, incredibly dedicated to the work that they did, and I have. Uh, still to this, great, to this day a great respect and admiration for them all. It became clear to me that the demands for their services were great in the community and I began to get an understanding, I guess, of the extent of family and domestic violence within our community. And up until this time, like many others, uh, it wasn't something that I'd particularly thought about much before. I'd never experienced it and uh, was never aware that anyone in my life had experienced it, although statistics would tell us now that that's probably not the case. But at that time, for too long, family and domestic violence had been carried out behind closed doors in the family home mostly. And for years, those that perpetrated violence were protected by the idea that what happened in the family home was a private matter and it was nobody else's business. So as a society, as a community, we tended to turn a blind eye and remain silent. And this, members, is one of the reasons why family violence has remained entrenched for so long. And I think it's one of the most important things that we can all do as community leaders to speak up and to speak out. And in particular, I think, to break the stereotypes about who family and domestic violence affects. The campaigner um, that we, we all, I think, are aware of, Rosie Batty, has done excellent work making this point, that family and domestic violence can affect anyone that it doesn't just happen to people in certain suburbs, it doesn't just happen to those from certain socioeconomic backgrounds. It doesn't just affect people who are poor or working class or uneducated, that in fact family and domestic violence is happening in homes right across our suburbs, right across our regional areas. It happens um, to people who are young and old and in families um, of all income levels and all education levels. So I think when community leaders speak up about how family and domestic violence can happen to anyone and how it's unacceptable, it sends a powerful message. It normalises the experience of those who might be experiencing it. And one of the things we know um, for people that acts as a disincentive to them coming forward and seeking support is the idea that there must be something wrong with them, that they're in an experience um, where they're, ex they're in a situation where they're experiencing violence. Um, and I think it gives courage to people to be able to step forward. Community leaders can and should call out behaviour and sexist, should call out um, sexist behaviour that allows family and domestic violence to flourish. I wanted to, in the time left to me, just speak briefly about one event that I'm involved in, which seeks to do exactly that, to enlist community leaders to speak out about family and domestic violence and to help bring it to an end. The Right Against Domestic Violence is all about bringing together community leaders um, from parliament, this parliament, from the union movement, business and community, uh, to raise money for our women's refuges, but also to raise awareness about this issue. Um, the first Right Against Domestic Violence was held in 2016, initiated by uh, the member for Armadale um, and the then member for Darling Range, the Honourable Tony Simpson. Uh, participants cycle from Bustleton to Perth, um, I note that's over 260 kilometres um, over a two-day period to raise funds for refuges. And since its inception, the ride has raised considerable funds for refuges um, in Bustleton, Bunbury, Mandurah in the Peel region, Rockingham, Armadale and um, other services as well. And I know these funds are greatly valued by the services because they allow them to provide a range of support for uh, their clients. But I think the real power of the event comes from such a disparate group of community leaders coming together on such an issue of importance. Because as we progress across two days from Bustledon to Perth, we stop along the way to hold community events to discuss um, our ride, but most importantly to talk about how family and domestic violence is never acceptable. Those that participate also hold events within their workplaces and with their friends to raise funds. 
So the point is not just to cycle and then talk about how we did some charity ride on the weekend. The point is for those who ride to also talk about family and domestic violence, its prevalence and its cost to our community. And importantly, to make the point that family and domestic violence is never okay and that we all have a role to play in bringing it to an end. So the ride will happen again in September next month and I'm looking forward to joining the WA Parliament team with the member for Thornley as our captain and the member for Armadale once again. Um, now I need to uh, confess I haven't done enough training and it will probably hurt quite a lot um, <laughs> and it's been pretty uncomfortable training during the wettest July in living memory. Uh, but I think we all need to be prepared to get uncomfortable to have conversations that will make a difference on this significant issue. I want to acknowledge McBucken and the CFMEU for their uh, administrative support um, that they've provided to the event over the years, and Sand Buckridge and BGC for their um, support for the administration of the event as well. Members, like many in this place, I feel strongly that we must work hard to bring an end to family and domestic violence, and we all have a role to play in achieving this. Um, we can all speak out about how family and domestic violence affects our communities, and we can call out bad behaviour and sexist attitudes where we see them. And I acknowledge that many in this place have done exactly that on occasion. I commend them all for speaking out about poor behaviour and sexist attitudes where they see them, and I particularly acknowledge, acknowledge that on occasions that can be difficult when indeed um, people who are part of your own team might be responsible for the poor behaviour. Members, we need to do a great many things to bring family and domestic violence to an end, and I'm very proud to be part of a government that's introducing a very wide-ranging plan that will help to achieve an end to family and domestic violence. Um, the work that's been done to hold perpetrators to account, to provide support to victims, and importantly, to change community attitudes will help us to shift the dial on this issue, uh, and I hope it will bring an end to family and domestic violence in the near future. This bill is an important part of a whole series of strategies and actions that are part of shifting the dial, part of making change and parting, part of bringing an end um, to family and domestic violence in the Western Australian community. I am very pleased to have the opportunity to support it, to speak on it, and I commend the bill to the House. Member Coburn. Thank you, Speaker. It is a great privilege to rise today to speak in support of the Family Court Amendment Bill 2021, and it is particularly a privilege to follow the member for Mira Booker, who has been a great advocate uh, on the issue of stamping out family and domestic violence, uh, both in the community uh, and in the workplace as well. Um, and this, this bill is an important step forward in protecting victims of family and domestic violence. And this bill does that by effectively banning perpetrators of family and domestic violence from uh, cross-examining uh, their victims uh, in family law proceedings. And as the member for Mira Booker pointed out in, at the conclusion of her contribution, this bill is part of a suite of reforms that have been implemented in this state and in this country over the last decade uh, to stamp out, designed to stamp out the scourge of family and domestic violence in our communities. It is a reform that has been a long time coming, um, but it is also a reform that is just one step on the path towards dealing with family and domestic violence. Um, and, and that reckoning with family and domestic violence has, has forced us to consider how we protect victims in our court system, while also at the same time protecting people's right to a fair trial uh, and to ensure that all parties in legal proceedings can be effectively represented and effectively have their day in court. Um, and I am satisfied that this bill strikes the right balance between protecting victims of family and domestic violence and ensuring the right to a fair trial. And the intention of my contribution today, Acting Speaker, is to outline a little bit of the history behind this important reform and the breadth of support that this reform has. 
And then I'm going to give a, a local example of why this reform is needed. And then I'll conclude by discussing how, as I say, the bill strikes the right balance between protecting victims and ensuring the right to a fair trial. Now, the last decade, Acting Speaker, has been characterised by uh, our, our country and our state and, in fact, much of the, the world coming to grips with uh, the scourge of family and domestic violence. And I would like to pay tribute to those many, those many advocates and those many, uh, those many supporters of the movements that have brought us to this stage today. As the member for Mira Booker acknowledged, um, Rosie Batty has been um, a shining light uh, in this uh, movement. Um, I'd also pay tribute to, to all, all involved in the Me Too movement um, over the last several years who have um, told stories of um, sexual harassment, um, sexual violence uh, in workplaces and in our community. I'd acknowledge the, the many unions that have campaigned over the years for protections for victims of family and domestic violence, such as uh, provisions for uh, family and domestic violence leave. And I'd acknowledge, of course, um, Brittany Higgins, who uh, quite bravely spoke out against the culture uh, of sexual harassment and violence that unfortunately uh, pervades even our own, our own profession and our own workplaces in politics. And indeed, this reform itself has a long history. Uh, the earliest record that I could find of this reform being formally supported was a report of the Productivity Commission from 2014. Uh, and there have been a number of inquiries since that time that have supported this reform. After the Productivity Commission report, uh, in October 2016, the Council of Australian Governments uh, National Summit on Reducing Violence Against Women and Their Children was held. Uh, and that, coming out of that summit, the recommendation was made that a ban be placed on direct cross-examination of victims of family and domestic violence by perpetrators in family law and family violence legal proceedings. Uh, following that summit, on the 7th of March 2017, the Commonwealth Attorney General uh, asked the House of Representatives Standing Committee on Social Policy and Legal Affairs to inquire into how the federal family law system could better support people who have been victims or otherwise affected by family and domestic violence. And consequence upon that referral, uh, the committee reported later that year in December 2017, and they, they produced a report uh, which is entitled A Better Family Law System to Support and Protect Those Affected by Family Violence, Recommendations for an Accessible, Equitable and Responsive Family Law System which better prioritise safety of those affected by family violence. And I give my thanks to the members of that committee uh, and to the Commonwealth Attorney General for uh, requesting that inquiry and then conducting that inquiry um, because it has led to a, a range of reforms in the family law system being implemented that protect victims of family and domestic violence. And one of those, uh, one of those reforms that was recommended in that report is the reform that we are considering today. That uh, inquiry received evidence from a broad range, a broad range of stakeholders. Uh, who supported a ban on direct cross-examination by perpetrators of family and domestic violence of their victims. Those organisations included uh, Women's Legal Service Australia, the Australian Capital Territory Human Rights Commission, the Family Law Council and many family and domestic violence support and advocacy services. It can be seen from this history, Acting Speaker, that this reform has been very thoroughly investigated. It has been subject to inquiry by a number of different bodies and it has been supported by a broad range of stakeholders. 
It is not a new concept, what we are dealing with in this bill, and indeed this bill uh, has the effect of harmonising the uh, position in the Family Court of Western Australia with the existing position in the Federal Family Court. Now, Acting Speaker, I have spoken before in this place about the growth of self-represented litigants in legal proceedings uh, across the country. It's often bemoaned by some uh, lawyers that there has been this growth, growth in self-represented litigants. But as I've said before and I reiterate again, the reason for it is because the costs of legal representation in this country are prohibitive uh, when it comes to retaining legal practitioners in private practice. Now that surge in self-represented litigants is something that has a direct bearing on the subject of this bill that we're considering today. And indeed, the House of Representatives Committee inquiry received evidence that in about 26 per cent, in about 26 per cent of matters that proceeded to trial in the Federal Family Court in the 2016-17 financial year, only one party had legal representation. So that's more than a quarter of cases uh, in that jurisdiction in that year. And in fact, the committee also received evidence that the figures were even higher in the Federal Circuit Court, which deals with some federal family law matters. And the figure in the Federal Circuit Court was that 52% of family law trials in the 2014-15 financial year involved at least one party who was unrepresented. The result of that very high proportion of self-represented litigants in the family law system is that there is a significant risk in family law matters that there will be what I will refer to as direct cross-examination. And direct cross-examination is when one of the parties to the litigation uh, conducts the cross-examination of the witnesses for the other side of the litigation. Uh, and in cases that are affected by family and domestic violence, which sadly are too many in the family law courts, um, the risk therefore arises that that cross-examination would be conducted by a perpetrator of family or domestic violence of their victim. And I would like to now give a local and a compelling example of why this reform is needed. It is an example of a situation in Western Australia where a perpetrator of family and domestic violence has cross-examined their victim in family court proceedings. And the case that I will be referring to is a case called Sampson and North. The citation is square brackets 2014 FCWA 75. And prior to descending into the circumstances in that case, I would just note that this particular case occurred prior to some other reforms in the family court system taking place, so such as the Family Court Amendment, Family Violence and Other Measures Act 2013. And that is an act that prioritised protecting children from physical or psychological harm over uh, the requirement to ensure a meaningful relationship with both of their parents. And it was also an act that repealed what are referred to as friendly parent provisions. Now, these were provisions that essentially gave uh, greater, uh, greater consideration to parents who had a positive view of facilitating the access of the other parent to the child. And what that did, what those provisions did, is they had the unintended consequence that women, and it is predominantly women, who were victims of family and domestic violence, were less likely to disclose that there was family or domestic violence in their relationship 
because they were concerned that that would lead to them being labelled an unfriendly parent because they were attempting to restrict access to the child by their partner. And so those pr provisions actually had the effect that uh, victims of family and domestic violence were less likely to make very significant disclosures. And one other thing that I would note about that Act is that it is an Act that was uh, passed by the former Barnett Liberal Government um, by the, while, they were, uh, while they were the government through this parliament. And why that's worth highlighting is because um, I want to acknowledge in this place that taking action on rooting out family and domestic violence has long been a bipartisan proposition in this parliament and indeed in parliaments right around the country. And that should continue. The facts of that case of Sampson and North... Uh, member, uh, given the uh, time, the uh, business of the House is interrupted. And I, uh, just before I call question time, uh, I'd like, on behalf of the member for Forestfield, I'd like to welcome the students and staff from Maida Vale Primary School uh, to the speakers' gallery today. Uh, welcome to all of you, students and, and, and staff. The uh, member for North West Central with the first question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. I refer to the Housing Solutions Summit held on the 29th of July, conveyed by Shelter WA and attended by peak housing industry representatives and community organisations. And I ask, Minister, were you invited to attend the summit? Did you or any of your ministry colleagues attend the Housing su uh, Solutions Summit? If not, why not? The Minister for Housing. <coughs> Uh, I thank the member for the question. I was actually in the goldfields at the time, was actually uh, had visited uh, the regional staff and gone to look at regional public properties, uh, and there was a member of departmental staff at the summit. Supplementary, member for North West Central. Minister, if everything's on the table to address housing, the housing crisis, why do you think this was not important enough to attend? The Minister for Housing. Two things. Number one, I am a very open and accessible minister, and I have met with a large number of stakeholders, including Shelter WA, on two occasions. But I do want to address this issue because you seem such a keen proponent for Shelter WA and some of their proposals. As I've said on the public record very clearly, there is a nuanced and complex approach to delivering public housing, and it is not as simplistic as some advocacy groups suggest, including for your own electorate. And I'll give an example. Shelter WA are on the public record to suggest that using vacant suburb land in Carnarvon, I should build 157 one-bedroom units in Carnarvon. Now, that seems great. But actually, there is complexity to the equation for this simple reason. A, there is not demand for 157 one-bedroom units. In fact, what we need in many regions is culturally appropriate accommodation. And secondly, we have to think about, as I've flagged before, the complexities of high-density social precincts and suburbs. And I would be interested in the member for Carnarvon's approach and attitude and what nearby households may think when potential antisocial behaviour develops as a result of a proposal by Shelter WA to put 157 one-bedroom units in a small suburb or precinct of Carnarvon. Do you support that measure? Do you support that measure? Do you support that measure, member? We hear from this member, this member, who is so simplistic in his analysis. He's been to the Barnaby Joyce School of Media Training. Say whatever, do whatever to get a headline. And we saw it on Pindan, where he said, terminate the contract, terminate the contract, and put 90 jobs at risk in the regions. That was your advocacy. That was your advocacy. And I have to say this, members in your community, members in your community have thanked me personally that we took a prudent, 
approach Name. to Pindan and that we Name secured, one. we secured 90 jobs, including in your electorate. You may not care about that. You may be after the headline and your reckless approach. But I am very clear that both on our housing strategy, on our homeless strategy, and dealing with those sorts of issues that this government does have it right. Madam Speaker, just wait for order. The member for Kimberley. My question is to the Premier. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's significant investment in health services throughout regional Western Australia, and I ask, can the Premier advise the House how the McGowan Labor government is expanding the capacity of health services in regional Western Australia and outline how these services will assist vulnerable and disadvantaged patients access high quality health care services? And can the Premier advise the House if he is aware of any threats to regional people's health? The Premier. Madam Speaker, can I thank the member for the Kimberley for the question uh, and all of her advocacy uh, for her electorate? Uh, we announced on Sunday a $1.9 billion boost uh, to health and mental health uh, spending in the, current bu in the coming budget uh, and also confirmed uh, massive improvements in capital works for hospitals and health services uh, around Western Australia. This will be hundreds of additional beds, um, hundreds of extra nurses, at least 100 extra doctors, uh, as well as a significant investment in mental health. Uh, we'll make sure the regions receive their fair share as well, uh, particularly to assist vulnerable and disadvantaged patients. So just to name a few of the services that will be improved or expanded or created uh, as part of this. $2.8 million to expand the women's community health services in the Kimberley. $15.7 million to begin construction of the new consolidated health service for Mekathara. $10.9 million for the Royal Flying Doctor Service to refurbish and replace aircraft engines on some of their aircraft. $1.8 million to employ a permanent GP for cervical cancer uh, at the Goldfields Women's Health Care Centre. $2.2 million to establish a women's community health service in the Peel. $17.6 million towards social and emotional wellbeing services for Aboriginal people in regional WA. $14.8 million for a step up, step down mental health facility uh, in South Headland. Uh, and $19.7 million to expand the eligibility of the patient assisted travel scheme for patient support escorts uh, and others, uh, as well as for maternity patients all over regional WA. All that is on top of the rebuilds or new hospitals in Newman, Tom Price, Laverton, Geraldton, Bunbury, Peel, uh, and other hospitals around uh, regional WA. So, Madam Speaker, a massive investment uh, in regional health as part of the upcoming state budget. Uh, in terms of threats to the health of West Australians, uh, I do know that uh, regional people in particular, and Ab Aboriginal people most especially, are very vulnerable uh, to uh, uh, pandemics, as was shown 100 years ago with Spanish flu. Uh, and the, uh, the Aboriginal people and regional people of Western Australia are vulnerable uh, to the COVID uh, pandemic. I'm uh, very pleased uh, that the Prime Minister has supported Western Australia uh, in our latest fight with Mr Clive Palmer uh, and his efforts uh, to undermine the vaccination program in Western Australia. Uh, so the Prime Minister has backed us and of course regional people are very vulnerable to what Mr Palmer uh, is saying, in particular Aboriginal people. It's actually deranged, insane and dangerous what Mr Palmer is doing. In fact, he's picked Western Australia. He's picked Western Australia to challenge our vaccination program. He's a Queenslander uh, with uh, limited interest in this state and he's decided to challenge our vaccination program here with a view to stopping the rollout in Western Australia. It is a deranged approach and if he is successful in any way, even in an injunction, in an injunction to uh, delay the rollout, uh, it would be very damage, damaging to the health of all West Australians. I'd urge him now to stop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Madam Speaker. Uh, the Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, Madam Speaker, before I um, commence my question, I would like to welcome into the gallery today Tanya Hanson and her mother Patsy. Um, Tanya and her five children are facing eviction from a private rental next week and they have nowhere to go. I also welcome Michelle and Jodie Garlett, the sisters of Anna Garlett, who tragically died homeless in Perth in June. I offer my sincere condolences to Michelle, Jodie and their families. My question is to the Minister for Housing. 
I refer to the estimates by Shelter WA that over 9,000 Western Australians will experience homelessness each night and the tragic deaths of 56 of these people this year. And I ask, why has your government sold more than 1,300 public houses since 2017? And are you aware that WA has the worst record in the nation for public housing stock? The Minister for Housing. I uh, thank the member for his question. Pro how public housing is a key priority for this government. And we are making a serious commitment in terms of nearly $1 billion in regards to both social housing refurbishment, new public building of homes, and also homelessness initiatives. And only last week we saw two announcements relating to two initiatives. The first was the Medical Respite Centre, which is about that particular gap of rough sleepers coming out of the hospital system. And that's only actually a must declare a few minutes from my home. And the second, which I'm very proud of, is the 100 bed facility within the city by an Aboriginal controlled organisation that is about providing that transitional approach, that first stop to help get rough sleepers off our street. And we do invest nearly 100 million a year in homelessness programs shaped around the housing first approach. Now that is approach, we didn't see the ad hoc nature under the previous government, but we saw a very strategic evidence-based approach that is about ending rough sleeping. But I also want to put on the record this, and I've been very clear before, that we have made some difficult decisions regarding the nature of public housing. That we do not want to see high concentrations of public housing which can have impacts on social behaviour. And so there were some tough decisions. And that decision including, for example, a loss of 300 public houses as a result of our decisions. But they were the right decisions. And now we do have a very clear program in place, nearly $1 billion in investment in both social housing, public housing and homelessness initiatives. Supplementary question. A supplementary. Thank you very much. Um, Minister, given this issue has now reached crisis proportions, have you asked the Premier and Treasurer for a rescue package to deliver the 3,500 new properties that are required to deal with this crisis and find the services to support people back into safe and secure housing? Sorry, Minister for Environment, you shouldn't be interjecting whilst a question's being asked. I do asked. find it fascinating. And before you start, Minister, uh, Minister for Water, you shouldn't be interjecting while the Speaker is speaking. The Minister for Housing. I do find it fascinating how the Liberals and Nationals rewrite history on this matter. First of all, there should be a Liberal Facebook or website page that says Liberals who claim stuff that Labor's done. <laughs> and that relates to, I love the way that they claim housing increases that were practically funded by the huge social investment made by a Labor Kevin Rudd government. It's a bit like the Libs when they were claiming about hard borders. Do you remember before the election? They were claiming they were all in favour of hard borders, never heard of them, never saw from them, and suddenly they're claiming the huge social housing gains that were delivered, delivered as a result of a Kevin Rudd budget. And also, let's talk about waiting lists. Let's talk you call this a crisis at a 17,000 waiting list. Well, here is a magic number, 24,136. Member, can you tell me why that number is important? Member, can you tell me why this number is important? Can you tell me why this number is important? Because that is your record in 2010. If you are claiming that we face a crisis now, what was it when it was 24,000 on the waiting list? 
The answer is silence. Absolute silence. You are rewriting history. You are rewriting history when the facts clearly show that the greatest housing waiting list was under a Liberal coalition government. The no answer. We'll just wait for order again. The member for Burdens Beach. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. On behalf of the member for Swan Hills, I'd like to welcome the students from the Eastern Hills Senior High School. Thank you. Um, my question is to the Minister for Health. And I refer to the McGowan government's record investment in mental health services across Western Australia, and I ask, can the minister outline to the House how this unprecedented investment will help avoid hospitalisations and ensure that more West Australians can access appropriate care closer to where they live? The Minister for Health. Madam Speaker, I'd like to thank the member for the question and acknowledge his long advocacy for mental health issues, and I wish him all the very best for his PTSD Foundation, which is doing great work on behalf of the people of the community. And this morning, Madam Speaker, I joined uh, the Minister for Mental Health, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, uh, at what will be our new community care unit in Aurelia, located in the heart of the centre of the universe of Quinana. Madam Speaker, <laughs> Madam Speaker, this is a $24.5 million 20-bed uh, service funded under the WA Recovery Plan, which is a great example of the significant investments the McGowan government is making as we come out of the COVID-19 experience. Uh, this is on part of the $1.1 billion record investment in mental health as a part of the 2021-2022 mental health budget, an 11 per cent increase on the previous budget of 2021. And, Madam Speaker, we are delivering a $495 million additional investment for statewide mental health, alcohol and other drug services. This includes $311 million boost to contemporary community accommodation and supports. And the upcoming budget will include um, – and these, um, these, this is about addressing critical gaps in our mental health services. Services. And as I was saying at the press conference this morning, Ma Madam Speaker, many of the solutions with regards to our hospital services lie in the community, in the strong community uh, mental health services, so that we can have patients transitioning out of the out of the public uh, hospital system into appropriate care environments as residents, so they they can get on the pr on the road to recovery in a more appropriate setting for their healing pathways. Part of these services. Madam, include, uh, Madam Speaker, include uh, $27.7 million for youth long-term housing and psychosocial support, plus in-reach in support packages to assist young people to live in the community while accessing mental health and AOD supports. $25.4 million for a step-up, step-down facility that provides community mental health service and short-term residential support, as well as $12.5 million for a purpose-built 20-bed alcohol and another drug withdrawal rehabilitation facility in the Perth metropolitan area. Important uh, investments which are being made to ensure that we can continue to have the services available for those who are suffering from mental ill health. And, Madam Speaker, it doesn't stop there. We've also got a $24.6 million investment in new mental health emergency centres at Rockingham and Armidale hospitals, an important investment to make sure that when people come to the ED in a distressed state that they have an appropriate environment to be cared for, as well as um, a $31.7 million in expanding WA's uh, eating disorder treatment services to include central hubs and clinical communi and community uh, spokes. Madam Speaker, the, the $495 million investment is part of our $1.9 billion boost to health and mental health uh, um, in, uh, funding. Such an important effort as part of making sure that in this period of our COVID spike on hospital demand that, we're, that we are providing the resources needed to, to supply our doctors and nurses with the resources that they need to care for those who come to the hospital, but also, Madam Speaker, making sure that we've got great mental health services in the community so that we can care for people and get them on their healing pathways. Uh, Madam Speaker, I think the Minister for Mental Health has done a great job advocating for this, um, uh, advocating for this funding and uh, we should be very proud of the investments that the McGowan Labor government is making in mental health. 
The Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. I refer to the 130. <laughs> I refer to the 130 public houses that are boarded up across the city of Geraldton, including homes which are less than five years old, and reports of more than 950 people in the Midwest and Gascoigne on the public housing waitlist. And I ask, given the desperate need for public housing in Geraldton, why are there so many houses boarded up and disused? The Minister for Housing. I want to thank the member for his question, but it does demonstrate by the opposition the lack of understanding in terms of the challenges uh, and the complexities of public housing in Western Australia. I actually went out to Geraldton, I met the mayor, the robust mayor, uh, and I also, uh, I think that's a fair description, uh, even the opposition's agreeing with me on that point. I actually went out to Spalding because we are aware uh, of the difficulties in this suburb. And this is unfortunately the reality and this is what I've been talking about. Number one, and I've said this on the public record and I think I am the first housing minister to say this, everyone supports public housing except if it's built next to them, behind them, in front of them, within a kilometre of them. And it's part of the challenging that we get resistance wherever we build public housing. And politicians know that because you get the emails and the calls. And where there is existing high density public social housing, it is actually difficult to get tenants in. So the boarded vacant properties in Geraldton, some were actually available for tenants on the waiting list and tenants didn't want to take them up. Now, that is the sad reality that we face, that there are particular suburbs or streets or precincts where tenants do not want to go into those public houses. So they do get boarded up until decisions are made about public houses. And this is the problem, the member for Cottesloe, is, is that we do have a demand, an increased demand for public housing. And as the Minister for Public Housing, there are difficult choices to be made. Do we refurbish those properties and bring them back into the system and then face the possibility that there is no demand? Or do we make the difficult choice even though there is a short-term pain of demolishing those homes or selling those homes back to the market so that we can start to de-densify some of those suburbs. These are the complexities of public housing, and Geraldton and Spalding is one example. But I want to assure the parliament that I am looking at a program for Spalding that will help bring those public houses back online, but on the basis of that we also renew the suburb and make it a more attractive place for people to live. Now, that will require cooperation between the state government and the local government, because ultimately lighting, footpaths, parks and bus shelters are not the responsibility of the state. But I do want to work with the City of Geraldton and the robust, epivescent mayor to try to get, and of course the advocacy of the local member for Geraldton, who has made it very clear her position, I do want to see a renewal program in place that delivers on those outcomes. The, the Minister for Police, no, sorry. I've invited the Minister to build more public housing in Cottesloe. Supplementary question. Um, before you ask your supplementary question, uh, the reason we've got this disorder is because uh, ahead of you asking a question, the Minister for Police decided to gratuitously uh, interject. So we won't be able to continue question time if people are going to interject every time the leader of the, the, leader of the Liberal Party rises to his feet. Uh, leader of the Liberal Party with a a single supplementary question. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker, and I will definitely do that. Is it your position that all 130 homes that are boarded up in Geraldton are not wanted, or is it also the case that your maintenance budget for those homes is simply inadequate? The Minister for Housing. No, I, I, did I make that claim just then? I, I don't think I did. I, 
I find that extraordinary. Uh, the reality is we have significant investment. In fact, as part of our economic recovery program, we are investing specifically $319 million for the social refurbishment of, of ageing stock. But I have to say the other challenge we did face was the collapse of Pindan. And of course, it was the prudent approach by this government despite the reckless calls for termination by the National Party and opposition, where we saw the continuation of maintenance for Priority 1 and Priority 2 jobs. And because we stayed the course, because we weren't reckless, we were able to maintain that maintenance contract, which now ensures that a further, further refurbishment works can be undertaken. So I'm very confident about the future of Spalding. I am going to work with the City of Geraldton on this matter. I do want to make it an attractive place to live. But again, if we want to, there is no point refurbishing homes if it's not an attractive place to live. And that is the difficulty we face with Spalding. We have to face some misconceptions about that suburb. But I am confident with the City of Geraldton that we can deliver good outcomes. The Member for Riverton. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Sport and Recreation. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to ensuring local community sporting organizations have access to high quality facilities. And I ask, can the Minister update the House on the significant investment being made by this government into the community and sporting infrastructure and outline how this is supporting local jobs? And can the Minister outline to the House what this investment means for the organisations such as Corinthian Park Tennis Club. The, the Minister for Sport and Recreation. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Could I uh, thank the member for Riverton for his question and commend his advocacy for his local community. It's great to have uh, a doctor of medicine representing Riverton rather than a doctor in economics representing <laughs> Riverton. Uh, well, maybe. <laughs> But whose hero is Milton Freeman? Uh, the McGowan government obviously has a very proud record in investment in the community and sporting infrastructure area. And at the last election, we made commitments, local commitments of over 326 commitments for local sporting facilities, and additional also 36 major commitments in the sporting and recreational area to the tune of $110 million. Okay, so and uh, of course, that's going to be a major benefit to the local communities. Also, in addition to that, $10 million over the next four years for under the Club Light Night Lights program, which will of course be of great benefit for local government facilities and it will allow more sporting clubs, more people to uh, utilise the facilities at night time. And in addition to that, we have made a commitment of at least $4 million over the term of this government to uh, facilitate the construction of female change rooms. As we know, female participation in sport, many sports, is increasing exponentially, so that's a, a great initiative. It, that's all an additional member for Riverton to the uh, annual $12.5 million through the Community Sporting and Recreation Facilities Fund that's provided for sporting and rec recreational infrastructure. Now, you asked me uh, in respect to the Corinthian Park Tennis Club, which is, a, which is a, actually a very strong tennis club in your electorate, who received an election commitment of $160,000 to convert two of its grass tennis courts to a gel surface hard court, which of course saves uh, water and maintenance. They received that money, as you very well know, and in addition, in addition to that, they received $140,000 through the Community Sport and Recreation Facilities Fund to reconstruct its existing hard court, sits of existing hard courts to the same gel surface hard court. Now, member for uh, Riverton, I believe, I am, I'm, I believe that the club actually have written to you expressing their sincere gratitude for the election commitment which has been executed and paid to the club. <laughs> well done. And the grants, I should also uh, let the House know that the grants will also allow the club to upgrade its lighting to lead standard, which will improve lighting, which of course will lower operating costs and allow for greater use of facilities at night time. Now, if you remember last week, Member for Riverton, 
The member for Cottesloe asked a question of the member for local government in regards to the Corinthian Tennis Club. I, I make two points in respect to that. One is that the member for Cottesloe should be very careful who he speaks to in regards to obtaining his facts. Yep. He may have had a may have had a coffee meeting with a former opponent of yours. I'm not sure, but maybe that was the case. And secondly, I was really quite confused that the member for Cottesloe asked the member for local government the question. Because only last month, member for Cottesloe, I toured your electorate with you to look at a number of sporting facilities <laughs> where you are looking for local commitments to be um, uh, delivered out of my portfolio. So I'm wondering why would you ask the member for local government a question that you clearly knew was in my portfolio? Could I just spend a half a morning? I know I'm very, very brave. I know I spent half a morning with the member for Cottesloe and his electorate looking at a number of facilities. So, so member, member for Cottesloe. Order, please. <laughs> member for Cottesloe. Before you ask your next question to any minister, make sure you have the correct minister that you wish to get the answer from. Although I should end up by saying the Minister for Local Government did answer your question superly, superly. Uh, Madam the Speaker. Member for North West Central. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Housing. Minister, I refer to the dire shortage of workers' accommodation in towns in the north of the state, leaving business owners so desperate they are resorting to hosting workers in their own homes and local governments are forced to deliver their own solutions to fix the mess, and I ask, one, Given it's been five months since the election commitment to accelerate the process to facilitate a new workers' accommodation facility in Exmouth and Cowberry, have you commenced the EOI process for local builders? Two, will you give Broome businesses, uh, business owners a commitment to address the dire shortage of workers' accommodation in the community? The Minister for Housing. I want to thank the member for the question. Uh, I am acutely aware of the pressures across Western Australia in terms of housing. We've said that on the public record, but also we've introduced a range of measures for both the metro and the regions. And of course, broadly, we know this, and the statistics do not lie, that there have been 27,000 building approvals in the last financial year. That's more than an 80% increase that is extraordinary. And that is the result of a very deliberate policy by the state government in combination with the federal government to provide an incentive to boost industry. And what we know is this, that the Bank West Curtin Economic Centre has clearly said, not the state, but clearly said, that there will be 10,000 more rentals coming on across Western Australia. And that will provide rental relief across all markets. Now, the building approval success is not just being confined to the metro areas. In fact, across regional Western Australia, we have seen increases of 190%. But we're not resting there. We've also sought to get more land into the markets, because it's not just about housing, but land supply. And the Minister for Lands, the previous government, uh, in our first term, introduced a $116 million regional investment fund. And there are currently now about 700 discounted lots still on the market. We're also, uh, both the minister, or the three of us, the Minister for Lands, Planning and myself have met, for example, with Regional Council Alliance to look at what other opportunities there are, working with local government all through our agencies to look at what other land is available for potential redevelopment. But I do want to say this. The Nationals hold their head high, they believe, on workers' accommodation. Yep. But we only have to remember Osprey uh, and the inquiry that found that that whole project was $95 million more than what was estimated or put forward in the first case. 
I mean, what an extraordinary situation. This is their history of financial management. This is their history of delivery. So I will not be lectured by the member for North West. We have very clearly developed and delivered a robust strategy that is fueling a large number of houses in both the metro and regional area. Supplementary. And supplementary. Uh, Minister, the Shire of Exmouth have already identified a suitable piece of land back in February. It has started the process of the scheme amendment. It has been five months now. Is this a failed election commitment made to the people of Exmouth? The Minister for Housing. Yes, I did. Convincingly, by the way. Sorry, the member for Wanneroo, Minister for the Environment. Oh, the same seriousness that you showed to Pindan staff. You showed real genuine concern there. You, you, you were so more concerned. interested in cheap headlines. Cheap headlines. That is you, the Shut member up, for you. cheap headlines. That is what you will be remembered for. You put Just at risk 90 jobs. Member for Pilbara. Madam Speaker, my question is to the Minister for Water. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's strong commitment to supporting food producers, workers, businesses in Western Australian horticulture industry, and I ask, can the Minister outline what the new water supplier agreement with the Gascoigne Water Cooperative will mean for growers in the region, and how will this support sustainable growth of food production in the gas coin. The Minister for Water. Uh, I thank the member for the question and I thank you for the representation you've made on many issues related to regional WA, yeah, um, yeah. least of which is water, which is what your question is about today. Uh, members, the Gascoigne Water Co-op um, is obviously very important to the growers in the Carnarvon uh, region. It transferred from government ownership to the private sector. Uh, it became a private business in 2001. As part of that transfer, they negotiated a 10-year water supply agreement with the Water Corporation. That was based on, like most other businesses, uh, the growers paying the true cost for the provision of that water. Now, that agreement expired in 2013. Unfortunately, the previous government could not get their act together to negotiate a new water supply agreement for the co-op uh, through the Water Corporation. So, so, so from 2013 up until when we came into government, the growers faced a great deal of uncertainty. Obviously, if you're in the horticulture business, your water, your water supply is your most important asset. So the growers have endured quite a difficult position uh, where they didn't know what their future was going to be. They couldn't plan for the future. So when we came to government, one of the things we wanted to do was to establish a new long-term agreement for the growers in the Carnarvon region so that they could plan and grow their businesses. I'm pleased to advise the government, uh, sorry, the House, that we have in fact signed a new five-year agreement with the Gascoigne Water Co-op <laughs> for new water pricing, which will again establish cost reflectivity for that, uh, for that water. It will be phased in over the next five years, and it includes a whole lot of other packages that will improve the business for the, for the Gascoigne Water Cooperative. There will be additional land made available through uh, DPIRD. I want to congratulate the Minister for Agriculture for the work that she's done on this, pro on this uh, agreement. Mm -hmm. There's improved infrastructure for the growers. Uh, so it really is a good deal for the growers in Carnarvon. And I just want to quote from one of the uh, co-op's directors, Tom Day, who gave an interview on the 9th of August, where he described the new agreement as welcome, very positive, and he said it gave certainty to the growers. And what he said is he urged everybody to get behind the agreement and not muck it up. 
Now, after a, lot of, a long period of uncertainty created by the previous government, they can now go forward with confidence. Now, of course, the reference to not mucking it up, there are some people who have been agitating against the agreement. Who's that? The member for North West Central, prior to the election, prior to the election having failed as under the previous government to deal with this issue, the member for North West Central was out there attacking members of the co-op who were negotiating in good faith with the government undermining the process, making promises that they, he knew he would never have to keep because they were never going to win the election. And ever since, he's still out there undermining the good work of the co-op to get this business back onto a uh, secure, secure footing. We know the member for North West Central is good at undermining and attacking people because we see what he does in his own team. We know how good he is. We know how... We know he's a, fan, he's a fan of Barnaby Joyce. We know he doesn't like his own leader. We know he doesn't like his own deputy leader. He's a, a, a great force of destruction. And while a new member for North West Central, for me, would have been immensely welcome at the election, in some ways I'm glad to have the member for North West Central back in the parliament because we know he's not only a destructive force in the community, we know he's a destructive uh, force on the opposition benches. Madam Speaker. The Leader of the Opposition. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Community Services. Minister, I refer to the First Nations Homelessness Project, a program that has saved hundreds of Aboriginal families from eviction and kept more than 1,500 children off the streets. And I ask, one, is it true that you told Jennifer Case Hagen, the founder of the project, there are no available funds from the state government to support this project? And two, Will you reconsider this and work with the project to find just $50,000 a year from your $5 billion surplus in government to allow them to keep offering this vital and proven service? The Minister for Community Services. Uh, Madam Speaker, I'm actually um, happy to take this question. I, I did meet with representatives from the First Nations Homelessness Project. This was a project that had been funded under the federal government, yep. been funded I to recollection a million dollars a year for four years to uh, assist families who are at risk of eviction. And um, while they are important to note, they are not an Aboriginal controlled organisation. They have a strong relationship with many Aboriginal families and, and um, credit to them for their work on the ground. I, I, uh, I particularly Jennifer, I, um, I've seen uh, her, I've met with her a number of times and um, I know that she does good work. Um, however, um, the state government currently, through the Minister uh, for Housing's uh, area, in Minister for Housing's area of responsibility, has the Thrive Program. So that's $11 million a year that is given to support uh, families or tenants in public housing who are at risk of losing their tenancies uh, to maintain their tenancies and to overcome the issues that they're confronting. $11 million a year. It's a $58 million contract that has been given to a range of different organisations around the state to do that work. And to my knowledge, uh, First Nations Homelessness Project has never applied for funding in any of those tender processes. So it had an opportunity to apply through the Thrive tender process and elected not to do so. So when the federal government funds an organisation and then when that money, money runs out, all of a sudden uh, the opposition wakes up and says, oh, the state government should be funding this organisation because the federal government has decided to withdraw you. their funding. Um, it, 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 it is staggering. We cannot, we cannot pick up the tab every time the federal government decides to withdraw funding from a pet project that they decided to fund. All of a sudden, the federal government is saying, oh, this is a housing issue, you should fund this project. $11 million we spend per year supporting tenancies. And I think that is a good contribution. Um, while I'm on my feet, uh, Member, I did want to address the issue that was raised yesterday in a question in this place and has since been uh, reported in uh, the West Australian about uh, your question about whether there are 100 pregnant women um, believed to be uh, what you claim to be without a fixed address in the South West and um, perhaps facing homelessness. I asked you in the answer to that question where your source of information was, and you didn't 
tell you, you didn't um, answer that question in your supplementary. Um, and um, when I was reading the article in the West Australian, um, I was interested to see that, in fact, it seems that the information uh, is gained from um, the sources that are in this article is a representative from the Australian Lions Club, who developed care patch packs for people struggling to find accommodation. All credit to them. I'm sure they do good work, and I don't want to um, I disrespect that work. That is good work, but they are, are, are not a service provider. They're not a paid service provider who would understand the extent of homelessness and who is at risk of homelessness. And interestingly, the other source of information there is actually Jerry George Artis from the First Nations oh, yeah. Homelessness Project. Also someone that doesn't receive funding from, the, from our government and is not a service provider provider who has access to any da reliable data. So I'd be interested to know, Member, where you'll get your information. If you want to be uh, the Leader of the Opposition, if you are, the, if you are credible, asking, um, credible and asking information about sensitive issues, can I, can I ask you where you got that information from and whether, in fact, uh, it's from any paid service provider, whether it's from any reliable piece of da data. This government is investing not only uh, yesterday was census night, we encourage people to participate in the census, and I met with some of the uh, staff that are, who are employed by the census providers to go out and work with homeless people. We're actually funding new data collection in Bunbury, in Geraldton, in the metropolitan area, uh, in a number of regional centres to make sure we have reliable information. Not rumour and speculation uh, in which to uh, base some sort of hysterical claims. Um, just, just before I give the supplementary, um, it's not open uh, for the person asking the question to respond to matters in a supplementary. All they're able to do is to ask a supplementary question. Uh, but I note we are having a debate in private members' time on this issue later. Uh, so you might get a response to the questions you've directed then, Minister. Uh, Leader of the Opposition with a supplementary. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Minister, can I draw you back to the question, which is uh, relating to the First Nations Homelessness Project asking for just $50,000 a year. Can I take it that you'd rather play politics and blame games rather than listen to experts, rather than listen to experts like Dr Fiona Stanley, Dr Betsy Buchanan and other providers and are refusing to fund this proven and Federal successful government. program. Order, Just please. Answer the question. You're refusing Order, to please. fund it. Look, there's a number of people who have interjected, I'm assuming, are trying to assist in answering the supplementary. Um, the minister is more than capable of answering the supplementary, so I'd ask that people don't do that during a supplementary question. It, we want a short, sharp supplementary. I want it heard in silence so that we can get a response from the minister, who's more than capable of answering adequately. Madam Speaker, we fund $11 million through the Thrive Program. We fund additional money to, in the, housing, in the um, child protection uh, area for um, families who are at risk of coming, whose children are at risk of coming into the child protection system, including to a, a number of Aboriginal controlled organisations, about $30 million. Last week we opened uh, 100 Wellington Street uh, facility, which will be run by two Aboriginal controlled organisations targeted uh, for people who are uh, street present. At, at are they homeless now uh, and needing assistance? Uh, last week, we also announced the local government co-contribution fund of $6 million. The Minister for Health and I uh, were at the launch of the uh, uh, recovery centre for people who are experiencing homelessness who have been in emergency departments and need somewhere to recover uh, and to be able to link in with services. A range of different uh, uh, announcements during Homelessness Week and, uh, and important work not only of new funding into homelessness but into reforming the existing um, into re reforming the existing system. I'm committed to working with Aboriginal controlled organisations to make sure we can get better outcomes for Aboriginal people and I'll continue to do that. The member for Hillary's to the Minister for Environment. I refer to the McGowan Labor government's commitment to reducing the impact of plastic waste and litter on our environment by fast-tracking WA's plan for plastics. And I ask, can the Minister advise the House how Western Australia's record on reducing plastic waste compares to the rest of the country? 
The I, Minister for the Environment. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. And I thank the <laughs> member for Hillarys for her question and her advocacy, uh, her local advocacy for the environment. Um, Single-use plastics are a scourge on the environment, without doubt. And if it can't be reused or recycled, then it shouldn't be made. Um, that's the view of the McGowan government. Um, that's why I have uh, sought to build on the work of, of my predecessor in this portfolio, the Honourable Stephen Dawson, who launched a very um, broad-ranging and the most ambitious plan of single-use plastics late last year. Um, and uh, shortly after the election result, we sought to fast-track that plan, which means that WA will have the um, will be banning single-use plastics earlier than other states and a broad a broader range of those plastics. Um, those single-use plastics like straws and cups and plates and bowls end up in our oceans and the damage that they do to marine life um, is immense. They end up in riverways as litter and they cost, uh, they cost millions of dollars uh, in clean-up and uh, restoration and repair. And we see volunteers out all the time cleaning up our riverways to picking up people's rubbish. So we want to take them out of the waste stream. The first stage of the ban will be implemented at the end of this year via regulations and that's both Bowls, cups, cutlery, straws, thick plastic bags, polystyrene, food containers and helium balloon releases will all be banned. Now, we are not interested in, um, in the big stick. We want to work with, um, with particularly small businesses um, and retailers who may find this challenging and we're going to embark on a range of education. So the first six months there won't be enforcement. We'll take the same approach that we took to the single-use plastic bag ban, which we saw in the end was exceptionally well received by the community and is now just part of people's trip to the shops bringing their own bags. So I feel really confident that WA is going to be ready to do this. The second stage of the plan, which will be completed, will come into force at the end of 2022, so in 18 months, will include plastic produce bags, cotton buds with plastic shafts, polystyrene packaging, microbeads, oxy-degradable plastic and takeaway coffee cups and lids. Um, most of the takeaway coffee cups that people use are not um, recyclable or biodegradable, but there are biodegradable alternatives that are available for people to use now. So we're encouraging people to make that change or buy a keep cup. So again, we will take the same um, approach around education and compliance. This makes WA a leader in this field, and according to the World Wildlife Fund in Australia, WA um, is, uh, outstrips any other state in terms of banning single-use plastics. Um, this builds on the work that we're doing with the CDS and the Container Deposit Scheme, which has now seen over 360 million containers recycled and $2 million uh, returned to community groups and charities. So this government is committed to cleaning up our environment, has a strong track record on recycling, and if it's not recyclable or reusable, then it shouldn't be made. The member for North West Central with the last question. Thank you, Madam Speaker. My question is to the Minister for Energy. Minister, I referred to the series of power outages yesterday, five I believe in total, one from 9.30 to 1 p.m., adding to the pain and suffering of Calberry residents with the continuation of unreliable power to the community. And I ask, what are you doing to ensure reliable power supply for the community, which has already been uh, which has already suffered so much, be fixed? The Minister for Energy. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm very pleased to answer the question, and I want to say to the residents in Calberry that I understand the frustration with being being without power. And modern society is based on the use of electricity, and we understand that when people are without electricity, it makes it hard for them. Unfortunately, at the moment, there is a long feeder that serves that community and therefore uh, weather disturbances do have a big impact on them. That's unfortunate. It's about the fact that they are served by such a long feeder. One of the reasons that they are experiencing a larger number of outages than we would like is because of climate change. And I hope that the National Party will support the West Australian Labor government under the leadership of the Premier uh, working as we do to try and reduce carbon emissions in Western Australia, and we hope that the National Party would demand that the federal government support those actions and support setting a zero target for emissions here in Australia for 2050. In the meantime, while we need this action from the Commonwealth Government to take genuine action on climate change, we're not letting the people of Calberry stand idly. 
and I want to congratulate and, and acknowledge the fact that uh, the majority of residents in Kalbarri voted Labor at this election. And so I want to make the point to them. Even if you didn't vote Labor, I'm not going to leave you alone. And so what we're doing is we're spending uh, nearly $7 million on building a new uh, microgrid. It's unfortunate for a range of reasons that the microgrid was not ready before Cyclone Saroja hit. Uh, and therefore, we did allocate all of our resources to reconnecting the traditional network in Kalbarri. And I want to congratulate uh, Western Power and its workforce for completing that incredibly difficult task in record time. I remind people that in Victoria, after the floods there, there's still people without power uh, in Victoria. I here in Western Australia, we renewed a grid the size of Tasmania using our uh, state-owned enterprise. So we are looking forward to the microgrid uh, being ready. And what that will do is it will allow uh, greater resilience because it will mean that there's power on the other side of the long line. So if the long line is disturbed, the microgrid will come into action and supply the people of Kalbarri. And I apologise again to the people uh, in Kalbarri that we were, that, uh, that, that are, you know, for a range of reasons, not the least being that when the former government announced the microgrid, they actually didn't contract anybody to build it. Uh, uh, but it has been delayed, uh, including by the impacts of Cyclone Saroja. Supplementary. Uh, supplementary question. Uh, Minister, Minister, given this microgrid was due for completion in 2019, will the microgrid solve Kalbarri's woes when it comes to not having reliable power? Minister for Energy. It's, it's physically impossible to provide 100 per cent reliable power. That's, that is physically impossible. There is no community anywhere in the world that gets 100 per cent reliable power. But the microgrid will be a significant improvement. And the reason for that, if you think about the physics here, you've got the power stations around Collie. The, the electrons have to travel through the high voltage system, through the medium voltage system, through the low voltage system. It's hundreds and it's thousands of kilometres, literally. And any break in the system prior to Kalbarri means that there will be disturbance and they'll lose their power. So the whole idea of the microgrid is that you keep energy on the other side of that long line in the community in Kalbarri. So when the line goes down, the, the microgrid will be able to provide power. And it is expected that there will be a very, very significant improvement in the performance of the Western Power Network in Kalbarri when the microgrid is fully implemented. And look, I, you know, I acknowledge that there was a delay in the completion of the project because one of the contractors that was engaged by this government uh, uh, went, uh, went to, into receivership and we had to select a new uh, uh, technical provider to complete the project. The project is engineering complete. It was being tested immediately before Cyclone Saroja hit. It, was, it would have been fully implemented now if it wasn't for Cyclone Saroja. But naturally, we did apply all of our effort to the recovery work first before we came, we've come back to, uh, to work on the completion of the microgrid. I can't guarantee that the people in Kalbarri will have 100 per cent reliability, because nobody can have that. But what I will say is that there will be a significant improvement to the performance for the people in Kalbarri, and I thank them for showing such strong support where a majority of them voted Labor at this election. Members, that concludes question time. Government business orders of the day. Was. The Thank you. Yep. Move that to government business order of the day number three be resumed. It's moved. All those in favour? Those for the contrary? Uh, the, I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, member for Coburn, I believe it's going to be. Oh, sorry, I've let the clerk uh, go Government first. business order of the day number three Family Court Amendment Bill 2021, second reading, adjourned yeah. debate. Uh, member for Coburn, continuation of your remarks. Madam Speaker, thank you. Uh, prior to question time, I was reflecting on a, a local example of the need for the reform in this bill, and the case is Sampson and North. These were proceedings in the Family Court of Western Australia in relation to the custody of children aged four years and two years uh, living, who were living at the time with the mother. And the father sought uh, shared care of the children uh, while the mother was seeking sorry, sorry, Member, if you just hold on two secs. If uh, you want to have a conversation, please 
either quiet it down or take it outside. Carry on, Member. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, the mother was seeking sole parental responsibility amongst other orders. And in that case, there was a very serious history of violence on the part of the father. Uh, for example, on the 15th of April 2013, the mother obtained a final violence restraining order against the father. The father had also previously been convicted of assault occasioning actual bodily harm amongst a series of other offences. And there was also uh, quoted in the judgment at paragraph 37 an, inc an incident report, a police incident report from the 19th of March 2013, which read as follows. Police attend to execute recovery order. Police advised the father they were there to recover the children. He refused to engage in conversation with the police. He said they were not taking the children and would have to shoot him. The police forced entry. The father attempted to grab a police officer's firearm. He struck a police officer and placed him in a headlock. He struck him several times with his fist. The police charged the father with assaulting a public officer. So in this case, we have uh, the father who has a, a very substantial uh, record of violence uh, against including uh, public officers of the state. And in that case, the mother was represented by a lawyer, but the father was self-represented. And as a result of that, during the proceedings, the father actually directly cross-examined the mother. Um, and the cross-examination, uh, Deputy Speaker, was shocking. And there is an example given of it in the judgment, and I am going to read here an extract that is set out in paragraph 44 of the judgment. And so this is the father asking questions of the mother under cross-examination. How was I being abusive to you? Physically, sexually, emotionally. What's the difference between threatening to rape you and forcing you to have sex with me? The response is, one's a threat, one's an action. The father says, OK, and I raped you, did I? The mother responded, yes, you were very forceful on several occasions. The father then says, say that in my eyes. The mother says, I don't have to. The father then says, just look at my eyes. At that point in time, the judge intervenes and her honour says, no, no, she doesn't need to. The father then says, no, no, fuck this. The judge then says, no, 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 she does not need to. The father says, fuck this, she's calling me a fucking rapist. Her honour says, she did not say that. The father says, she fucking did. Her Honour then says, what she said was you raped her, and no, she doesn't need to look you in the eyes. Now just ask your questions and she will answer them. No, she's not going to look you in the eyes. The father responds, you're fucking shitting me. So I kept you in my home for seven years or by my side as my friend by forcing you to be there with me and we were never really friends or anything. The mother responds, you were very controlling in a lot of ways and manipulative. And basically, I guess what kept me there was fear of leaving because on several occasions, you threatened if I ever left you, you would kill me. And you also said, the father interrupts. He says, same way you did to me. The mother says, no. And you also said that the kids would be taken away. And, and the father interrupts, you know, I only thought there was a problem in distinct year. If I'm capable of killing you, how come you're not dead yet? Uh, the mother's uh, solicitor interferes at that stage and says, your honour, my client can't possibly answer that question. It is plain from that extract in the judgment that the cross-examination that was engaged in by the father in that case was utterly reprehensible. Uh, it should be condemned in the strongest possible terms. It had the effect of re-traumatising the mother, who was the victim of family and domestic violence. And in that respect, I make it clear that I make no criticism 
of the court. Clearly, the judge in that case was attempting to protect the victim, but Her Honour was also hamstrung by the fact that she needed to allow the father a fair opportunity uh, to conduct his case and to conduct cross-examination. But I really do believe that cross-examination like that taking place in the legal system uh, brings the administration of justice into disrepute. May I seek an extension of time, Deputy Speaker? Extension granted. It is, it is difficult to imagine how awful that situation was for the mother, um, but she at least had the opportunity to give evidence in her case when the fact is that many others would be, deterred, would be deterred from giving evidence at all. And there is evidence that that is the case. And I'm referring here to a submission of Women's Legal Service Australia to the House of Representatives inquiry I referred to earlier. Uh, and in that, that submission, Women's Legal Service Australia state that over a three-month period in 2015-2016, uh, they surveyed 338 women of their experiences with the family law system. 147 or 43 per cent said that they had experienced direct cross-examination by their abuser. 77 respondents said that the dispute had settled by consent orders. And then to quote at page 29 of the report, of that smaller group, so the 77 respondents, 44 women said that the prospect or fear of personal cross-examination by their partner was a factor in their decision to settle. And then later in the report, I quote again, Participants were asked how significant the prospect or fear of direct cross-examination by their ex-partner was on their decision to settle prior to trial. Of the 60 women who responded, 41, 68.3%, said that it was very significant. Six women, 10%, said it was of medium significance. And 13 women, 21.7%, said it was one of many factors. These findings indicate that the fear of direct cross-examination can directly result in consent orders in family matters involving family uh, violence that endanger the safety of children and their parents. And so what I think it's important for members to take away from that case, uh, from the case of Sampson and North, is that uh, the re-traumatising of victims by their abusers has taken place in our own state uh, relatively recently, and that is but one example of it happening. Uh, and it's worth reflecting on the variety of effects that, that, that has on the victim and also on the court system generally. And the first is, as I have outlined now by reference to the uh, submission of Women's Legal Service Australia, it pressures, the prospect of direct cross-examination by an abuser pressures victims of family and domestic violence to settle. And obviously, in all likelihood, that results in settlement on less favourable terms than would otherwise be the case. Exposure to that cross-examination obviously re-traumatises the victim if they proceed uh, to trial. Um, the prospect itself of being cross-examined is likely traumatising. That likely raises just the pure fear of having to face the perpetrator and be questioned by them. But then actually undergoing cross-examination, in many respects, I imagine that for those victims, it would be similar to having to relive those experiences all over again. And the other thing that could often be overlooked in here is that it's very likely that allowing uh, perpetrators of family and domestic violence to conduct their own cross-examination in these cases does them no favours. Um, these are people who may have histories of uh, mental illness, uh, substance abuse. Uh, they may come from backgrounds where they've been abused themselves. 
and putting them in a position, them being in a position where they are conducting their own case likely means that the best case is not being put on their own behalf while at the same time causing unimaginable trauma to their victims. And at this point, I, I would like to note that uh, two matters. The first is that family and domestic violence uh, disproportionately affects women and the perpetrators are disproportionately men. It is a gendered issue and there is no shying away from that fact. But I do also acknowledge uh, that victims uh, that there are victims do not belong to just one gender and that relationships come in all varieties and that for example in uh, same-sex relationships uh, there are men and women who are perpetrators and victims of family and domestic violence and so this is a, a sensible reform because while it acknowledges the gendered nature of the issue uh, it ensures that victims are protected regardless of the identity of the victim or the perpetrator. And the way that the scheme uh, offers that protection uh, is as follows. I mentioned at the outset of my contribution that the right to a fair trial is a critical consideration here. And indeed, the right to a fair trial is a cornerstone of our legal system. And so the difficulty with banning uh, direct cross-examination in an era where there are more and more self-represented litigants is how does that litigant conduct cross-examination? And for the, the, the non-lawyers uh, in the chamber, cross-examination in our adversarial system of justice is seen as a critical part in testing the evidence. Um, so that the decision maker, uh, when presented by evidence from one side, uh, the other side has an opportunity to test that evidence in cross-examination and it allows the decision maker, uh, the judge or the magistrate, uh, to make uh, comfortable findings about the credibility of that evidence um, and about uh, the facts that can be found on the basis of that evidence. So it is an essential part of our adversarial system. Uh, and so long as that is the case, um, parties need to be able to conduct uh, cross-examination. And this is where the scheme that sits alongside uh, this reform steps in. And this is a scheme, and, and, and essentially what uh, the scheme funds, and it funds, it is funded by the Commonwealth Government, is, is, is uh, is as follows. Um, if circumstances arise in a case where direct cross-examination is banned and at least one of the parties is unrepresented, then that will trigger the scheme. And what the scheme does is it effectively uh, arranges and pays for the unrepresented party to be represented by lawyers. Now, there are, as I understand it, duty lawyers in the Legal Aid Commissions that would be available for some <coughs> uh, minor uh, work, but by and large that would be by a grant of funding that would then be used to retain an experienced family law practitioner in private practice uh, from a panel. And Further than that, if both parties are unrepresented, then the scheme will actually arrange and pay for both parties to be represented, so not merely uh, the perpetrator. And the reason that's important is because of a concept uh, in the justice system that's referred to as equality of arms, um, and that is the notion that parties should have um, should be roughly equally armed or have the capacity to be equally represented when it comes to presenting their cases. And, and that's how this scheme uh, preserves that uh, entitlement. Uh, this scheme therefore allows the perpetrator to test the evidence by having a legal practitioner conduct the cross-examination, but it also allows the victim to be protected from being directly cross-examined by the perpetrator. And that has two effects. The legal practitioner, uh, who is familiar with the rules of evidence and who has professional obligations, is going to be able to conduct that cross-examination in a way which is, to the extent possible, as respectful 
um, and as forensic uh, as it can be. Uh, and it also means that the victim will not have the experience of actually sitting, uh, answering questions asked of them directly by the perpetrator. Another advantage of the scheme is that the legal practitioner will be appointed to represent the person for the entire proceeding, so not just for the cross-examination. And that is likely to not only have advantages when it comes to protecting victims in cross-examination, but it's also likely to result in generally more efficient and professional presentation of cases. And I understand that the feedback from the family court is that the scheme is working well. Uh, the scheme is funded, as I said previously, by the Commonwealth Government. It's a commitment of $7 million over three years to the various legal aid commissions. And I am satisfied that the scheme therefore strikes the right balance between protecting victims of family and domestic violence and also protecting people's right to a fair trial. Uh, it also facilitates access to justice by ensuring that family and domestic violence victims can continue to proceed to pursue proceedings without fear of being directly cross-examined by the, uh, their perpetrator. And it also provides the necessary resources for unrepresented parties to conduct their case where direct cross-examination has been uh, disallowed. I congratulate the Attorney-General on bringing forward this bill at such an early stage in the new parliament. It is a bill that has been subject to significant consultation and inquiry. I challenge anyone who has heard the cross-examination in Sampson and North to say that this bill is unnecessary. Thank you, Member. Members, the question is the bill now be read a second time. The Member for Mount Lawley. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. I rise to make a, a uh, short contribution to the debate on this important piece of legislation. And I start by um, uh, thanking the member for Coburn for his contribution. Um, he's taken us through uh, chapter and verse uh, the ways in which this bill will operate in a forensic uh, situation um, to deliver more equitable access to justice and I think um, and so I don't I don't need to go over that because I think that argument has been has been well made by the uh, by the member for Coburn um, with reference to the uh, cases that he cited therein um, what I wanted to do in the time that I have uh, deputy speaker is I just wanted to um, I wanted to talk about three uh, newspaper articles and uh, three uh, academic works uh, that help illuminate the conversation um, around uh, the issue of family and domestic violence and help us to understand why it is that legislation like this is incredibly important. Um, before I do that, can I just uh, congratulate um, both the uh, member for Mirabuka and the member for Colleague Preston. I was listening to their uh, contributions before question time and, um, and a, lot of the, a lot of the material that um, forms the context in which this debate takes place uh, was covered off by both of those uh, contributions. And I, I note that they're both um, new members in this parliament and uh, their contributions speak volumes for what they will contribute over the course of, of the 41st parliament. Um, I've, spoken, I've spoken previously on issues like this because I think it's one of those things um, uh, where where's a parliament uh, work in a collaborative and, and, and bipartisan way. And, and when, when similar legislation came before the 40th parliament, I um, congratulated both the former member for Hillary's and the former member for Dawesville on their contributions, indicating the support of the opposition to the legislation that had been introduced by, uh, by the Attorney General. And I'm, I'm looking forward to the contributions from the opposition that will spell out um, the extent of the opposition support for this legislation. I don't, um, this is not, and, and so I say that Deputy Speaker because um, perhaps unlike some of my uh, recent contributions in this place, I don't propose this contribution to be partisan. This is, this is a, a, a bipartisan issue. Um, one of the first books that I wanted to refer to, and it's a great, um, it's a great starting off point for anyone who wants to understand uh, feminism in Australia, is the Anne Summers classic uh, um, Damned Whores and God's Police. And this was a book that was written in 1975 by Anne Summers, who members would know was a founding member of the women's liberation movement, um, set up a, a shelter for victims of family and domestic violence in the 1970s in Sydney, and then went on to become uh, a leading uh, um, advisor to Prime Minister Bob Hawke in the 1980s as the first um, 
Secretary of the Office of the Status of um, Women's Interests in the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. Uh, the reason I wanted to refer members to this book is because at the back of the book is a terrific uh, um, appendix, which is the timeline of achievements by and for Australian women. And I thought this would provide a good uh, uh, starting off point for my contribution today. Um, uh, Deputy Speaker, um, we've, all, uh, we've all celebrated, I think, in the past couple of weeks, uh, the 100th anniversary of the election of Edith Cowan as the first female um, member of parliament elected into this, into this chamber. Uh, we've celebrated the fact that we have the first female speaker in the Legislative Assembly. Um, We've celebrated the fact that we have um, now both a, 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 a um, female speaker in the Legislative Assembly and a female president in the Legislative Council. Um, but these recent achievements that we are uh, celebrating um, come at the end of a, of a long line of achievements uh, by feminists in, um, in Australia uh, since European colonisation. The reason I quite like the, um, the timeline of achievements that's contained at the back of um, Ms Summer's book is because uh, within that timeline there are, there are several subcategories and they, can, they, they contain um, the uh, important milestone events uh, of the achievements for women around areas such as equal pay, political rights, fertility control, childcare and parental leave, and domestic and family violence. And the reason I wanted to outline those um, five particular areas is because they'll be er the areas that I, uh, that I touch on in my, in my contribution this afternoon. Um, uh, I, and, and so on, perhaps going first to equal pay, um, uh, there, is a, there is a great, great quote from uh, Justice Mary Gordon, uh, her honour was um, a Justice of the High Court of Australia. Um, in 1979, she said this in respect of equal pay. Equal pay was won in 1969 and won again in 1972 and yet again in 1974. And yet the fight for equal pay, and I, I, I defer to the member for Mira Booker in this regard, um, given her experience and her background, but the fight for equal pay continues. And, and I was reading a... Um, I was reading an online article in the um, in the online uh, magazine Women's Agenda, which talks about the, the gender pay gap. And the author is Angela Priestley, and the article is from the 25th of March, 2021. And it was talking about research that had been undertaken by the Workplace Gender Equality Agency. And it was talking about the fact that it's going to take at current at current rates of. Uh, um, gender pay gap narrowing, it's going to take another 26 years for the gender pay gap in Australia to close. It's moved. The, the, article, the article celebrates the fact that, in, that, that recently the gender pay gap has moved in the right direction. It's moved from a gap of 24.7% in the earnings between uh, men and women to 20.1% over, uh, over the preceding seven years. So there's a significant closing of the gender pay gap, but it's still an incredible 20.1%. And what's worse is that in some fields of endeavour, the gender pay gap actually grew. So in the managerial classification, the gender pay gap over that, over that uh, seven year period grew by 5.1%. And to the people in this chamber, and it probably doesn't come as any, as any surprise, but the areas in which the gender pay gap was narrowest were in those female dominated industries such as education and training, healthcare and social, um, social and assistance sectors. This is where the, the, the gender pay gap ranked uh, was, was lowest. Now, uh, the member for um, uh, Mira Booker ma further made the point about her affiliation with the Australian Services Union, and I'm also um, a member of the Australian Services Union. And the Australian Services Union was instrumental in um, in 2012 and in 2015 with their uh, applications to the Fair Work Commission. Um, and I just want I just want to refer here to the timeline that I was talking about in Miss Summer's book at page 680. In 2012, the Fair Work Australia awards pay rises of between 19 and 41 per cent to community sector workers. This was what, what was known at the time as the Sachs Award, and finds that gender is one of the reasons that their work, that uh, the work being undertaken by women was undervalued. And so that's in 2012. That, that, uh, that attachment of lower value to the work of women 
is one of those contexts, I think, in which the um, one of those social constructs in which uh, discrimination against women takes place. The others are, as I said, um, uh, uh, access to uh, political rights, fertility control, childcare, parental leave and domestic and family violence. The next thing I wanted to raise was um, political rights. And I've, I've already raised the, the, the example of Edith Cowan. But the struggles that are faced, and you know, we've said it all before and it bears repeating, you look around this chamber and you see so many women who've been elected to parliament and the fact that we've had over 100 women elected to parliament now in Western Australia. But the struggle for um, political rights for women seems to me to always, it, it's, an, it's an ongoing struggle. It always seems like it's two steps forward, one step back. And we celebrate successes like uh, the appointment of the member for Midlands as, as, the, as the new speaker and um, the second president of the Legislative Council, and it's 100 years since the election of, of Edith Cowan. But I recall so clearly the vilification of Julia Gillard as a female Prime Minister, you know, and I, and I think there is still so much work to be done to communicate to the broader population that women have an equal role to play in our political uh, and power structures as they do in any other facet of, of endeavour. And just the way in which um, Prime Minister Gillard was attacked uh, in misogynistic and gender orientated and sexist language perpetuates the uh, social environment in which um, family and domestic violence can take root. Um, so, there's, there's, so, so whilst we celebrate successes, there's still so much work to be, to be done. On the question of um, fertility control, again, just referring back to um, Ms Summers' article, I mean, uh, we're currently debating in the Legislative Council safe access zones around abortion clinics, and, and that, that we have to wait until 2021 for this debate to take place for something that seems so uh, incredibly straightforward and, and, and such, such an important uh, health and community safety measure uh, just speaks to the amount of work that needs to be done on that particular area. On the question of childcare and parental leave, uh, in a society where um, emphasis is still placed on women being the primary caregivers in the house, it seems as though uh, the issue of access to um, affordable, high quality childcare and, um, and Paternity, uh, paternity leave is, continues to be characterised as, as an issue, uh, as, as a women's issue. Now, that, that that is the case demonstrates to us that there's still so much more work that needs to be done. Because, you know, as a dad myself, um, it was a great joy to be able to share that parental responsibility. And I don't, I don't think that where's a society have arrived at the point where you can say, yes, this is, um, you know, this we've reached the point of of, of, of complete equality. Um, the next thing that I wanted to talk, talk to, the, again from Anne Summers' book, is the, is the question of uh, um, family and domestic violence, which is what this, what, what this uh, legislation goes to particularly. But one of the things that I wanted to bring to members' attention was a um, recent uh, inquiry report from the New South Wales uh, Parliament, and it was a joint select committee on coercive control. And this is a... Um, this is a discussion that's been had uh, both in this chamber, in the previous parliament, and in this and in this parliament. Now, when we talk about coercive control, it's interesting to note that in England and Wales, the uh, Serious Crimes Act, Section 76 of the Serious Crimes Act in England and Wales, has been amended to create a criminal offence of coercive control, and the New South Wales. Um, Parliamentary Inquiry, which is the, I'll just give you the title uh, for the benefit of Hansard, it's the Joint Select Committee on Coercive uh, Control, Report Number 1 of 57, published in June 2021. And I'm not quoting from the report, but I'm quoting from the ABC News article by JB McKinnell from the, uh, from the same day, the 30th of June 2021, uh, which talks about coercive control. Um, and I'll just, I'll just note at the start that um, the committee doesn't use the term domestic violence, they use the term domestic abuse. And if I can quote from uh, Jess Hill's book, uh, See What You Made Me Do, um, Jess Hill talks about the reason why this nomenclature is important. She says, uh, in this book, wherever possible, I have replaced the term domestic violence with domestic abuse. I did this because in some of the worst abusive relationships, physical violence is rare, minor or barely present. 
as Yasmin Khan from Eadfest Community Services writes in an article for Women's Agenda, that's the, uh, uh, that's the uh, online news um, service that I referred to earlier, uh, many women that we support assure me there has been no domestic violence, quote, he's never laid a hand on me, end quote, but on deeper questioning and reflection realise they have been abused for many years in ways that have been more subtle but are just as damaging and potent. And so Khan made it her mission to replace the language of domestic violence with domestic abuse. The reason that quote is important is because the, uh, the Joint Committee of the New South Wales Parliament arrived at the same nomenclature. They arrived at the same, at the same language. Um, uh, they said, the, the, and the article says this, the inquiry heard opinions from domestic violence workers and advocates, police prosecutors and academics earlier this year following a discussion uh, paper on the complex issue released in October. Uh, 2020. Current New South Wales laws cover some types of controlling behaviour, but the inquiry was told that the injustice system was geared to respond to individual incidents of physical violence. The pandemic of domestic abuse, evidenced through the statistics, cannot be ignored, the inquiry's findings said. It is clear that coercive control is a factor and red flag for the horrific and preventable murder deaths of Australian women and children, some 29 learners in 2020 in New South Wales alone. And I just, I just interrupt myself to um, thank the member for colleague Preston for, uh, for again um, referring to the statistics of the, of the number of people who are victims of family and domestic violence. It said the New South Wales government, I'm just quoting again here from the article, it said the New South Wales government should propose amendments to the crimes, brackets, domestic and personal violence, close brackets, Act 2007, to create a clear and accessible definition of domestic abuse, uh, including such behaviour. This should be done as a priority before criminalising coercive control. This is a, a, a complicated um, issue that requires a great deal of examination and investigation. Um, and, and, and I think that a discussion around the, the work of the New South Wales Parliament in undertaking this inquiry will hopefully prompt a broader discussion nationally about how we tackle the issue of coercive control. Um, because I know, based on the runs on the board of the McGowan government, that we are committed to tackling um, family and domestic violence in all its forms. Not least because uh, we've got the first uh, minister responsible for the prevention of family and domestic violence. Not least because uh, we've implemented the 16 days in WA campaign that other people have spoken to. Not least because we have an attorney general that brings forward legislation such as this to tackle the scourge and the pandemic of, of family and domestic violence. But also because we have all of these members, many first time members who, who, will, who will stand to speak in support of, um, in support of this uh, legislation. Um, before I finish, I just wanted to, um, one of my, uh, uh, so I think I've, I think I've covered off um, the Damned Whores and God's Police by Anne Summers, and I've already uh, referred to See What You Made Me Do by Jess Hill. I'll come back to Jess Hill because she's quoted in one of the articles that I'm, that I'm proposing to refer to now. Um, I just want to commend a, um, uh, a friend of mine, a constituent who's a, who's a family law practitioner, and um, she's very active on social media and she's always sharing articles, and she's shared, and, and I referred to this in, in, in my last contribution, but I wanted to go through because I thought it was, it was worth reminding members of some of, uh, of, some of the debate that's, that's taken place. Um, and, and my friend shared a number of articles on, on social media, that, and, and these were from last year. Um, what, and they're all from The Guardian. And the first is an article uh, by Liz Ford from the 5th of March 2020. Nine out of 10 people found to be biased against women. And this is on a, this is on a global survey. Analysis of 75 countries reveals shocking scale of global women's rights backlash. Almost 90% of people are biased against women, according to a new index that highlights the shocking extent of the global backlash towards gender equality. Despite progress in closing the equality... May I have an extension, Deputy Speaker? Extension granted. Thank you. Despite progress in closing the equality gap, 91% of men and 86% of women hold at least one bias against women in relation to politics, education, economics, violence or reproductive rights. Unsurprising, this are the same five issues that were identified in 1975 by Anne Summers. The figures were based on two sets of data collected from almost 100 countries through the World Values Survey, which examines changing attitudes in almost 100 countries and how they impact on social and political life. And this is the most staggering statistic. Of the 75 countries studied, there are only six in which the majority of people held no bias against women. That's just the majority. Not 100%. 
six countries in which the majority of people held no bias against women. But while more than 50% of people in Andorra, Australia, the Netherlands, New Zealand, Norway and Sweden were free from gender prejudice, even here the pattern was uh, not one of unmitigated progress. And so, you know, it's fair to say that whilst Australia, you know, we, we, should, be, we should be proud of the fact that we fall within those six countries um, that are leading the charge, but there's still so much more work that needs to be done. Um, which is the second article that my friend posted on, on social media, and this is the interview with Jess Hill, who is the author of uh, See What You Made Me Do. Um, uh, and it, the, that article is called Patriarch Patriarchy and Power, How Socialisation Underpins Abusive Behaviour. And this is, this is essentially the whole point of, of, of what I'm saying this afternoon about, about the context in which we're operating where the scourge and pandemic of, of family and domestic violence persists. And it talks about um, Hannah Clark and, and Rowan Baxter. Hannah Clark's family described her husband, Rowan Baxter, as controlling, coercive and obsessive. His abuse to her appears to have followed a familiar script known as coercive control. And the journalist asked uh, of, of, of Jess Hill, can you explain this? Coercive control is a very particular kind of domestic abuse. It's not a reaction to stress, nor is it triggered by alcohol or drugs. It's an ongoing system of control in which the abusive partner seeks to override their partner's autonomy and destroy their sense of self. Coercive controllers may use extreme physical or sexual violence, uh, or as was reported with the case of Rowan Baxter, no physical violence at all. For more than 40 years, women and children have been saying that except for extreme violence, the coercive control is the worst part. Ms Hill is then asked, if domestic abuse cases almost always follow the same script as you write in your book, why is it so hard to stop them? Many women don't know they are experiencing abuse until they are already in situations that are incredibly dangerous, partly because co coercive control is so poorly understood, but also because the perpetrator makes it invisible. They are placed in an invidious position, not knowing what to do or what the best course of action would be. And the article continues, if they do report to police, if something reportable actually occurs, they are making a terrifying gamble. Will reporting their partner make him more dangerous? What if child protection gets involved? What if he contests for custody? And so the circumstances that prevent um, action are highlighted. How do men, how do some men come to feel so entitled to their power of women? And this is this was the response that it was this response that prompted me to um, to posit this uh, hypothesis in my contribution to this debate. Thousands of years of patriarchy has laid pretty good groundwork for this. It's not so long since a wife was considered her husband's property and had no legal rights whatsoever. It was only in the 1980s that new laws against marital rape recognised that men didn't have the right to demand sex with their wives any time they wanted. Now, this, this point brings me, uh, sadly, to the, to the last article that I'm going to refer to. And I did say, um, uh, they, I did say that I wasn't going to um, politicise this contribution, but unfortunately there's a... Um, there's a stain in Australian politics that we haven't been able to expunge, and that's the stain of, of one nation. Um, and uh, when talking about family and domestic violence, there was an article from Ben Smee published in The, in the Guardian. Uh, Malcolm Roberts, Senator Malcolm Roberts, former One Nation Senator, criticised after claiming, quote, many domestic violence allegations are made up. And this was published on the 10th of March. Um, you know, uh, Malcolm Roberts, as well as Pauline Hanson, um, you know, uh, so Ben Smee's article, One Nation Senator Malcolm Roberts has told a parliamentary inquiry into Australia's family law system that many instances of domestic violence allegations are made up by parents to gain custody of their children. Obviously, um, this scandalous allegation was immediately called out in the public and in the media, and Ben Smee notes that Paul, Pauline Hanson also made a series of unsupported statements about parents lying to the family court. He then clarified the situation by saying, the claim that women frequently make up abuse claims is prominent grievance among men's rights groups and men's rights activists, but has been widely discredited in multiple studies. According to researcher Jess Hill, see what you made me do, author of the article, who has authored a book on the domestic violence see which made me do, one of the most thorough studies on false abuse allegations from Canada found that non-custodial parents, usually fathers, made false complaints, most frequently accounting for 43% of the total, followed by neighbours, followed by relatives at 19%, followed by the mothers at 14%. Now, what we need to do, what we need to do, I think, as a community, is we need to... We need, to, we, we need to do what the, what the Attorney General is doing, we need to do what this Parliament is doing, and we need to pass legislation that tackles this issue, right? But we also need to listen to those voices 
that are now speaking up. You know, we need to listen to Grace Tame. We need to listen to Rosie Batty. We need to listen to Brittany Higgins, you know? And, and, and it was Rosie Batty who, in response to Pauline Hanson's comments, said, uh, uh, well, R Rosie Batty denounced Hanson for saying women made up false allegations of violence during custody disputes. Batty said such remarks were incredibly damaging. I don't think that anyone in this chamber is motivated by the perverse incentives of people like Pauline Hanson and Malcolm Roberts. One of the things that I am fearful of is the rise of ultra right-wing organisations through social media, um, uh, racist organisations, um, you know, anti-scientific, anti-vaxxing organisations, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm fearful of uh, their um, pernicious influence on the political discourse in Australia. And Malcolm Roberts and Pauline Hanson and others give oxygen to that. Right? So we as a community need to call that out when we see it, we need to tackle it, and we need to say that this legislation, whilst this legislation should enjoy bipartisan support, everyone who speaks in support of this legislation, from whichever party they are in, should also call out that ultra-right-wing political fundamentalism that now seems to be creeping into, into the discourse in countries like North America, Western Europe and, and, and in Australia. Um, because unless and until we do that, we're going to struggle to get the equality uh, that women are entitled to, and we're going to struggle to rid our society of the, of the scourge and the pandemic of family and domestic violence. As I say, this legislation is an important contribution to the work that we can do as a community to alleviate that. Uh, I commend um, all of the speakers. The member for um, Colly Preston is back in the chamber, and so I'll say to her while she was here, I was incredibly grateful to you for your contribution to this debate. It was outstanding. Um, and I commend the Attorney General for the work that he's done, and I commend the McGowan government for making tackling this issue a priority. Um, thank you. Thank you, Member. Members, the question is the bill now be read a second time. The Member for Dawesville. I rise to speak on the Family Court Amendment Bill that supersedes the Family Court Amendment Bill 2019, which lapsed in the previous department, uh, Parliament. This bill in Western Australia will mirror the Commonwealth Family Law Amendment Family Violence Cross-Examination of Parties of 2018, which was passed December 5th, um, which bans the personal cross-examination of victims by perpetrators of family violence. Um, so personal cross-examination occurs during a court hearing when a party is not represented by a lawyer, so they must perform the cross-examination of witnesses themselves. This amendment will allow equal opportunity for representation with the opportunity for alleged perpetrators and victims to have court representation. And I'd also like to take this minute to uh, thank the Attorney-General on bringing this important amendment forward. Um, firstly, um, I guess a bit of personal experience. 45,000 people, they say, divorce every year in Australia. And um, in 2004, I was one of those statistics. Uh, divorce was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Um, I made the decision to leave my husband. Um, and my kids were six and eight at the time. And um, my husband was very angry, very, very angry. Um, he, he said it came out of left field. I didn't think so, but you know, a lot of counselling was done prior to that. Um, and while we think about it, and I'm, I was thinking about when I was doing this research about me being one of those women sitting in the family court and I had no uh, sexual abuse or domestic violence apart from probably the worst part was during the time of separation where there was a, a lot of yelling uh, and we were both very angry and he was very, very hurt and I understand that. Probably not so much back then, um, because there was a lot of words that were said that can never be unsaid. Um, and we both spoke poorly of each other, and um, I would be not very proud to admit that I did a lot of that in front of my boys. And they're 24 and 26 today, and they still remember the divorce and uh, how it went and how terrible it was. And really, I would like to think, when you look back, that I didn't do too badly, really. So I can only think, as I've followed on with the research, how important that this bill is that, um, that people who have actually endured sexual and domestic violence aren't put into the situation where they're having to be 
um, ask questions of their of their partner in front of them. Um, the member of Netherlands spoke so well on this, and um, so I'm pretty much here more from a, a personal point of view. Um, I just wanted to speak specifically on the type of person who would actually prefer to self-represent, um, and they are your um, coercively controlling type people um, or people who show signs of narcissistic behaviour. Um, and just from my um, psychologist point of view, some of the things that uh, would be a red flag, I guess, in court would be things like uh, behaviours of narcissism or um, people who are trying to coercively control people would be grandiosity um, with the expectation of superior treatment. So a person would be in a court and I would expect that they would be uh, expecting the judge to rule in their favour and would be absolutely gobsmacked if rights were taken or monies were limited in terms of access to children. They are uh, fixated on fantasies of power. Uh, they believe that they're very successful, intelligent, attractive people, uh, and that goes for either genders. They're, they're, I mean, I know um, gentlemen are overrepresented in this situation, but there is quite a few females that I know that would hit the uh, narcissistic tick that box. Self-perception, um, they uh, would see themselves as unique and superior, uh, high status. So again, if you could imagine them sitting in court and taking on um, the victim or the, that perpetrator, it would be like almost like a, um, uh, well, how could I put it? It would be an exciting event for them to, to bring someone down, especially doing it in an open forum with other people watching. They would actually get a great deal of satisfaction, which is, again, comes back to the point that um, being able to remove this ability will be awesome. Uh, they have an unwilling to, unwillingness to empathise with the feelings and wishes um, of other people, so they wouldn't even consider that what they're doing, saying, is incorrect. They, they are pompous and arrogant and um, would probably find the idea of even being in court a sense of embarrassment to that victim and they'll be making them pay. So um, if you're sort of expecting, oh, so when you're sort of thinking about this in terms of changing this amendment, uh, I think it's, uh, it's very timely and um, I think the, that victims should be given um, the opportunity to not have to um, sit in front of someone and have to go through that. Um, they don't take responsibility. Um, so a narcissistic person um, is very averse to responsibility. So they systematically stage their life to um, avoid it and they become very masterful at denying and projecting everything back onto um, their partner or the other person. So their sphere of power sort of works. So if they're losing their, their wife or their children or their husband and their children, it would be... Um, uh, like even more reason to win at court. So yeah. Um, and lastly, they don't forgive. So um, if there's ever a, a potential threat to be defeated or um, if they feel that they're on tack, then this life is a battle zone and they will always be fighting for their survival. Um, they, they regard any kind of hurt or retaliation as revenge. So um, if they see someone apologise or they see uh, someone showing what they would see as a weakness, then they see it as proof of their superiority and would probably take the opportunity to further punish the person for whatever he or she may dare to come to court or take that opportunity to do that. Um, I just quickly have an example, um, unlike um, the member for Coburn's example, which was sort of uh, very raw and gave a detailed account of a court action. Mine's more um, about what would happen in an everyday event about, so, um, uh, I think it would be more from the female's point of view as to why she would not take on her partner and why she would settle out of court and, and would be one of those statistics that just um, settles for less, not because she probably feels in herself that she doesn't deserve it or that she got herself into this situation, which is actually really sad in itself but uh, because it's just the easier path to, uh, to get away. An example is uh, something like this. Um, so the order of the court stated that they spend each alternate birthday with, um, with 
like the husband and the wife take turns. Um, they are specifically to um, that they do this because joint events have never been particularly nice, um, and alternatively years and alternative years mean you can make a special day for your child without any drama or humiliation or danger. You're putting your child's needs first, and you're protecting yourself from harm. Your ex feels entitled to contact you regardless of what the court order says. They feel protected by the family court. They will now use the occasion to exert control and cause you frustration, anxiety and fear. Seeing these emotions from you makes them feel superior and powerful. Your ex knows your deepest fears and uses them to hurt you. So they send you a WhatsApp message and request that um, they're going to contact uh, your daughter on, their on, on her non-contact day. They say they'll drop by at your daughter's birthday party because my daughter, I should see my daughter on her birthday. Um, the panic that you feel, you know what's coming ahead, you know it's going to end in tears, you know that there's going to be a fight and that you're going to be ru ruining your daughter's birthday. So you take the decision to actually te text back and you say something like, I don't know, something that I would probably have written back in the day, don't you dare show up at this birthday party, I'll call the police, you know we have orders, don't contact me again and take it back to court. But this actually works in well with the with the ex because they sort of respond quite cunningly. Um, there's no need to be angry all the time. I just wanted to see our daughter for an hour on her birthday. It's not too much to ask, you know. I just want to give her a present. She told me on the phone last night that she wanted me to come. Uh, I think what you're doing is going to upset her more. And then suddenly you look back on your message and you realise what you've done and then you become more terrified because then you have to um, deal with the judge and, and you're sort of in that space where you're thinking that the, that the judge is going to read this and he's going to think that I'm that, that person that's just being mean and nasty and that I'm trying to hold my daughter back when, um, when really that's not the case at all. And then you feel like you're going to be condemned and that, that the judge will actually favour inside of your ex. So this fear and anxiety that creates inside you, all because you, you're standing up and, and keeping your boundaries, but on the other way, th this manipulative person has been able to um, make you do things that you didn't want to do. So I just think that from, from that, this example, and it's like I said, quite a basic example that you can fall into if you don't know what you're up against, of why people um, shouldn't go to court, uh, well, should be given um, representation by lawyers, because lawyers are, are generally trained in spotting coercive control, are, are trained in um, how to deal with narcissistic people. So um, I just want to say in closing that people who live in fear of these types of examples, which are basic day-to-day examples um, and it d d shouldn't be including you know being cross-examined by alleged perpetrator especially with people who have had to endure physical and sexual abuse um, it just increases the importance of having to um, to to ban the opportunity for these people to self-represent and I commend this bill to the house thank you member the member for Belmont Thank you, Deputy Speaker. <clears throat> I rise today to, to make a contribution to the Family Court Amendment Bill of 2021. Uh, and I also would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the hard work of the Attorney General and thank him for bringing this uh, very important bill to this place. Any measure, in my view, to provide assistance to victims of family and domestic violence is of critical importance. Every single day, it seems, our news is littered with examples of abuse and stories of violence perpetrated mostly towards women. Last week, we learned of the sexual assault by a number of boys at a private Catholic boys' school, uh, of a over a dozen girls at a Catholic girls' school at a combined school event. The girls were groped by the boys and this would have no doubt led to, the, to an incredibly distressful experience for teenage girls and no doubt will stay with them for many, many years to come, which is really quite tragic. In 2021, clearly the concept of consent is non-existent in much of our community. This speaks to the amount of work that we still need to do in educating our boys on the topic of respect and consent. This is a serious issue that needs to be addressed. 
Furthermore, there's no evidence that the horrors of family and domestic violence is abating in our community. This again is evidenced on what seems to be a weekly basis in our news and was seen in a recent report um, in WA Today on the 29th of July this year, uh, which reported on the brutal murder of Rakia Hadari by her husband of only two months, Muhammad Ali Halimi. Halimi used a kitchen knife and sliced his wife's throat twice. As his wife was left to bleed in the kitchen to death, I might add, Halimi phoned his wife's brother and told him, and I quote, come get your sister's dead body. So I think these two examples really point to the fact that this is and will continue to be a blight on our society uh, until we do every, everything that is within our power as a government to make sure that we provide safety for um, victims of family and domestic violence. Uh, on the other hand, though, as well, I would like to note that um, it's clear that there is a lot to be done around the conversations that need to occur uh, critically in our young boys mostly around uh, respectful relationships and I know that the Minister for Women's Interests is doing great work in this space um, but the conversations need to continue well into adolescence uh, around consent and respectful relationships because uh, the incident that occurred at the Catholic Boys School recently is just disgusting. So this bill um, aims to protect some of the state's most vulnerable people, and that being uh, victims of family and domestic violence. And whilst it's disappointing that the bill uh, did not proceed through the uh, Legislative Council in the last term, I am pleased to um, be able to provide a contribution on this very important piece of legislation. This bill builds on the Commonwealth legislation that was passed in December of 2018 to ban the direct cross-examination of victims by their abuser in family court settings. The practice of direct cross-examination of victims by the perpetrator is so clearly unacceptable. Just imagine how confronting that experience would be for the victims. One in six females has been a victim of physical and sexual violence from an intimate partner. And I, I do note that it is not always women who are victims of domestic violence, but overwhelmingly, and I do uh, agree with the member from Co for Coburn, this is a gendered issue. This is largely and overwhelmingly an issue that is uh, affecting women. As victims, women presently come to courts seeking protection and assistance, and then can face cross-examination, direct questioning by their abuser. This is, of course, can lead to further trauma for the victim and would no doubt be deeply distressing. In addition, because this experience is so distressing, victims may be more inclined to expedite the proceedings to limit their exposure to this type of questioning by their abuser. In their haste, however, they can be set settling matters around property or parenting rights that is detrimental to their welfare and that of their children and their overall well-being, of course, which would be then preferential to the perpetrator. Further, by allowing perpetrators to cross-examine the victim, it has the potential to affect, affect the victim's testimony and hence the overall result of the trial. The prospect of direct cross-examination can be so daunting that it causes a victim to accept premature and very unfavourable settlements. And this has been witnessed by experts in the field for far too long and formed part of the push for the change um, at a Commonwealth level. Uh, the acceptance of these unfavourable settlements can have really devastating effects uh, also on children uh, who are involved in the... Um, in the court proceedings. It can place really vulnerable children in situations where their personal care and safety is ultimately at risk. 
So the ban on direct cross-examinations will remove this daunting prospect for victims and will also remove the potential avenue to a premature and unfavourable settlement uh, for women who are experiencing family and domestic violence. The real-world consequences of this is obviously less children in really unsafe environments, less children exposed to family and domestic violence, of course. It also provides victims with the security of knowing that they can pursue a fair outcome without putting their own mental health in jeopardy and being re-traumatised the, during the whole process. Ensuring a fair outcome is reached in any court is, of course, pivotal. The cross-examination process is an integral element to having evidence tested in a proceeding and allowing a court to make an evidence-based decision and findings. Putting an end to victims being cross-examined by perpetrators will improve their ability to give clear and cogent evidence. Furthermore, the cross-examination of perpetrators by legal practitioners will ensure their evidence is appropriately tested and therefore more reliable. This in turn will enable judicial officers to make more informed decisions and judgments. In 2015, the Sydney Morning Herald reported on the case of Eleanor, whose name was altered for the purpose of reporting. Eleanor's experience in the family court system is an alarming example of the necessity of banning these types of cross-examinations by uh, the victim's perpetrator. And I quote uh, from this article, and this is um, uh, the Sydney Morning Herald article. A week after Eleanor's former partner was ordered not to come within 200 metres of her by a magistrate's court, she faced him in a family court dispute over the custody of their children. It was then she learned he had dismissed his lawyer, which meant he, had, had, he could question her directly about her parenting of their children in the witness stand. And this is Eleanor, and I quote her directly, that day I wanted to end my life. I just wanted the trauma to end. I couldn't believe they'd allow him to do it. It was like they'd given him permission to have power over me again. Eleanor, who fled their, ho their home with their children, said he had raped her twice and beaten her in front of their daughter. She began to hyperventilate. He could have, uh, and this is again a direct quote of her, he could have asked me the colour of the sky. There was, a, there was a point where I could not understand the words coming out of his mouth, she said. Her partner had initially argued for sole custody and was ultimately awarded weekly visits with their children. After the trial ended, he moved six hours away from them and now rarely sees them in person. She believes the exercise was another form of abuse. Years later, she testified against him in a criminal case from another room. This time, she said she was able to think clearly about her responses to his lawyer's questions because she was not forced to look at his face or listen to his voice. Thank you, Member. In accordance with the Standing Order 61, the business is interrupted and adjourned until a later stage of this day's sitting. Madam Acting yes. Speaker, I move that private members' business notice of motion number six be now taken. The question is the motion be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those to the contrary say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Madam Acting Speaker. Yes, Member for North West Central. Uh, I uh, move that this House condemns the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before, triggering significant economic and social consequences. Now, that's the motion that the opposition has uh, moved uh, today. When you have a look at, there is 17 or over 17,000 struggling families uh, who are looking, queuing for government housing. There have been 1,300 houses owned by the government, sold by the government, who knows how much that's probably been worth to the government, but I would say in the order of three or $350 million in their back pocket from the sale of social housing, housing that is desperately needed uh, by the people in Western Australia, the people who need it most, those who are struggling, struggling individuals and struggling families, over 17,000 of them that this government has neglected. But when you have a look at the empty houses that exist, government housing, that is empty. We know that over 1,000 government houses remain empty. 1,000 government houses remain empty. 
We know that over 1,300 have been sold. We know that there are 17,000 struggling families out there who are looking for housing, and we have the government selling off its stock, selling off its stock, and, and more importantly, who have got empty houses scattered right across uh, this um, this state. And when you have a look at the, the history of this government from 2017, we've seen we've seen a uh, uh, a decrease. Um, so in 2017-18, the government sold 269 homes. Uh, in 18-19. Uh, sorry, that's 17-18, uh, the government sold 269 homes, uh, 234 in 18-19, 196 in 19-20, and another 138 in 2021. And the list goes on. It sold 534 three-bedroom homes, 84, 82, uh, 82 four-bedroom homes, 123 two-bedroom homes, and 44 one-bedroom homes. Um, so. Uh, members, when you have a look at this government's track record, you've got to, got to question the... Uh, we talk about the health crisis, but I think uh, what's contributing to the health crisis is the housing crisis, and I'll go more why the two are, are connected. Um, but when in question time today, when I asked the Minister for Housing um, in reference to whether or not he attended the Housing Solutions Summit, summit held on the 29th of July, uh, convened by Shelter WA, attended by peak housing industry representatives and community group organisations, and I asked, was the Minister invited? And I think he said, yes, he was invited. Did you or your, any of your ministerial colleagues attend the Housing Summit Solution? And he wasn't on a venture. He was on an adventure. Where was he? In Kalgoorlie. In Kalgoorlie. When there was a housing summit to talk about the housing crisis, where was the housing minister? I know where he was. He was perched up at the Palace Hotel uh, sipping his Bloody Mary. That's what he was doing. While there was a housing crisis meeting to try and work out how we can come up with solutions to the housing crisis this state has got, coupled up with, with the health crisis, the people of Western Australia, the most vulnerable people of Western Australians, uh, uh, are suffering. So the minister for housing, I just want to get this on record, did not tend the summit, the housing uh, solutions summit held on the 29th of July, convened by housing uh, industry leaders, uh, social housing industry leaders, uh, because he was away in a love-in in Kalgoorlie with the rest of the Labor Party cronies. That's it. Not, That's not, it not tackling the serious issues of the housing crisis which this state uh, has got and has had because of the lack of investment, no investment, the huge waiting lists, the selling off of uh, houses, uh, the empty houses that exist. Who is in charge of housing in this state? That is the question. Who is in charge of housing in this state? Now, it's not all your fault, current Minister for Housing. We've had uh, a housing minister before. Um, he got removed, and, and rightfully so, because the, the lack of action in the housing space, clearly over the last uh, four and a half years, has now led to this catastrophic set of circumstances where people where people of Western Australia are struggling uh, to be able to get into any social housing because of the actions and lack of actions uh, that this Labor government has taken in terms of uh, housing in this straight state. Uh, members, I want to indulge you with uh, some of the headlines that have been nearly day in, day out, week in, week out, every month over the last four and a half years, uh, we have seen people um, and a report after report about the crisis when it comes to housing in the state. And only, I think only now we're starting to see the state Labor government 
act on the pressure that uh, the opposition and the media and the public have put on the Minister for Health, having to be backed in the corner to, uh, to announce extra funding, and now starting to talk about the health crisis uh, that we've got in this state, hence why we have, uh, they've had to put more money. And there's no detail around that money or when that money is going to be spent, uh, but it's a start of the government acknowledging that there's a health crisis. We now need to do the same with the Minister for Health and this Labor, state Labor government to get the Minister for Housing to be able to acknowledge that there is a housing crisis in this state. And uh, the minister uh, referred to some of the, the, the uh, quotes today by the uh, Shelter WA uh, CEO in regards to uh, housing and uh, um, wanted to bring me as a local member uh, into the debate in regards to building single bed units uh, uh, in um, Carnarvon and do I support that. And I think the Minister for Housing actually misses the point where it's the, fus the frustration has been built up and that the desperation is there uh, that people are trying to look for large parcels of land that can be developed to try and curb the housing crisis. Do I support housing being built in Carnarvon? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I support single bed uh, housing, a hundred of them in, in an, uh, an old school uh, site? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. So for the minister to suggest that uh, uh, he's trying to make me uh, uh, support or not support housing in Carnarvon, we've got a lack of housing. And I'll, I'll go into the needs of my electorate and needs of the Gascoigne and, and greater regional WA. Um, so when you have a look at uh, uh, the, um, the articles over time, and I'll read a few out, uh, opinion by Shelter WA CEO Kieran Wong, uh, the West, 9th of the 8th, 2021, figures last month showed at least 56 people died while homeless in Perth in 2020. 56 people. In the past year, lost six times as many people to homelessness. More than 50,000 renters consider their housing unaffordable, and and what I, uh, or uh, one of the distressing parts about um, uh, the situation that we're, we're in, not only have we got tens of thousands of people in waiting lists, government sold 1,300 houses. Um, there's uh, over a thousand empty houses. There's also, uh, uh, you know. Um, SHERP, which is the uh, renovation of uh, houses, that's three to four years away. But reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket. Reports of sex schemes, uh, uh, reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket. Minister, if, if having headlines like that or comments like that is just showing uh, the desperate situation that people in West Australia are. It's not all beer and skittles. When we hear about the, uh, when the when the premier gets up and talks about our economy, he's failing to address the the community needs, the social needs, the housing needs, the health needs. Uh, don't get confused that our economy is going well well because uh, of the resource sector, particularly iron ore, that is keeping us well and truly afloat and doing well. But when it comes to our housing sector, our health sector, our small business, it's not all beer and skittles. There is pressures, there is concerns. And when you have headlines, reports of sex for rent schemes skyrocket, that should be alarm bells. The fact that there is a housing crisis and that's what people are having to resort to. Outrageous. I'll go on. One in five people have ranked it as their number one issue. Uh, when it comes to housing. And, and um, I'm glad that the Minister for Police has piped up because part of the issue when it comes to uh, lack of housing and no housing in regional WA for his own police force members to take up, no housing, 
So even if we want to increase the amount of police uh, in regional WA, you can't because there's no housing. So it's affecting your portfolio. And how about you find a voice within Cabinet and do what's right for your members and stand up for them and get some houses built. If not, be quiet and, and be vocal when it comes to being in Cabinet. But members, members, here we go. The peanut gallery, the peanut gallery is still here. The peanut gallery who are failing to address. No, they don't. They get told what to do in Cabinet. But, oh my God. Keep going. And you know what? They're funny. They say the same thing about you. They say the same thing about you. Um, members, um, this is... Excuse me, member. Can you please direct your question through the chair? Other members, please refrain from interjecting. What you know is when you're hurting the, the uh, members opposite, the Labor government, they resort to personal attacks all the time. Personal attacks, attacking the individual. Uh, the member for Armidale, he knows what that's like. He's been on the other side as well. He's been on the other side as well. Uh, but members, we know how the, the late, arrogant Labor government acts towards m the members of opposition who are here representing their constituency and who are here are the only ones trying to make sure that the Labor government is held to account on very important issues such as the housing crisis that we face, that we face. And members, and members for Coburn, if you think that you don't have a housing crisis, do you have a housing crisis in your electorate? Do you have a housing crisis? Member for Coburn, do you have... Members, can you please have some respect for Hansard? We cannot hear what is going on. Do you have housing crisis in your electorate? I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people like you in the Labor Party. I'll say again. There's a special place for people Anyway, let's continue on. Like I said, Excuse news me, article members. after news article. Uh, when you have a look at... Um a very serious issue, Madam Atkins Speaker. I would, uh, Madam Deputy Atkins Speaker, I would like to be able to hear the member for North West Central. I'm having great difficulty hearing what he's got to say on behalf of his constituents and others that are being impacted uh, in relation to this matter. Member for North West Central, can you please dredge your question through the chair? So, Other members, please stop interjecting. So, Madam Acting Speaker, as I, there's a news report, ABC News, 8th of the 8th, 2021, dropping service for a service for homeless people Midland, forced to turn away 6,000 families and 500 young people in the past year. Um, and that's since the moratorium's lifted. Uh, people needed, uh, in, needing increased um, help, uh, and it's not slowing down needs more affordable housing, more funding to expand their services, families and single mothers in the, grow, uh, in the growing up group um, uh, who go to Midland, they feel unsafe in the CBD. Uh, City of Swans want to see homeless uh, people given a seat at the table. And it goes on. News article ABC 6 of the 8th 2021, uh, Geraldton Youth Homeless Service has recorded its highest level of demand in 10 years. Turnaround is slow because there's no tendencies to send young people to. Uh, South West Times, 5th of the 8th, 2021, 13 people sleeping in Tent City um, at, uh, at uh, the Graham uh, Bricknell Music Shell in Bunbury. Housing First relies on uh, placing people in housing, giving them wraparound support, but there's a lack of housing stock. Um, uh, and it goes on, Perth Now, Central, uh, 5th of the 8th, 2021, uh, philanthropic housing developer given the green light to build uh, temporary homes by government um, loaned land in Vic Bar. Temporary homes, building temporary homes. Does, does it say crisis? What does? Um, uh, and you've got the activeness, uh, obviously, Shelter WA, who's very active, trying to find pieces of land, throwing up suggestions because they are desperate. Um, and you've even got uh, the Perth Lords Mayor, uh, Basil uh, uh, Zemplis, taking upon himself as Lord Mayor of Perth to try and deal with 
um, the homeless situation, the crisis gripping our, uh, our um, pride and joy, that is uh, Perth City. Perth City is taking it on himself to come up uh, with, um, uh, with solutions and putting money where his mouth is and putting, I think, uh, $3.7 million uh, towards uh, dealing, on, uh, dealing with uh, those uh, who need a shelter. 3.7 of ratepayers' money from the city of Perth, uh, and uh, where is where is the state government? You've got the local government leading the way when it comes to the city of Perth, and uh, well done to uh, uh, Basil Zemplis, the mayor of the city of Perth, taking it upon himself to try and fix uh, these issues that are plaguing, shouldn't have plaguing, to. shouldn't have to, shouldn't have to, but plaguing our our, our city. Uh, Midwest Times, 7,421. Uh, 20 square metres government-owned land listed for sale in Carnarvon could be accommodated for 151 bed bedroom units, something the minister has criticised but I think misses the point of what Shelter of WA are trying to find. That is land that's available to be able to deal with the crisis facing uh, uh, people in this state and particularly regional uh, regional WA. So instead of criticising, instead of not showing up um, to uh, their forums that they're holding because of the arrogancy of uh, the housing uh, minister and this government, you should be working with uh, Shelter WA to come up with solutions, workable solutions, rather than criticising and bullying these organisations. One of these things that's coming out from all these uh, uh, non-for-profit groups, uh, groups right around Western Australia, who are fearful of speaking out against the Labor government, fearful of speaking out against the Labor, Labor government because of the fear of the government cutting off their funding, the fear of not having a seat at the table um, uh, when the government holds a for forum. This is what's growing, members. Members of this House, shameful acts of arrogancy, bullying by the Labor government when it comes to organisations. And today's question time, talking about um, the forum which the, uh, the Minister for Housing snubbed and then criticised Shelter WA from coming up with a potential solution to the problem. Potential solution to the problem. Um, uh, so it keeps going on. We, we, we talk about the uh, uh, Bestie uh, Buchanan. Um, the West says housing crisis is WA's emergency, and First Nations families are, are the hardest uh, families, first hardest. The death of. And, and, the, and it goes on. Vulnerable Aboriginal families are losing their children at a rate of more than one a week due to the public housing crisis. The overcrowding that's occurring, the housing crisis when it comes to uh, our, our most vulnerable, uh, and we have here, um, um, and uh, members, perhaps you, perhaps you might learn something, or perhaps you want to get a cup of tea. You're normally there eating, eating uh, the, the, the scone and, and biscuits uh, at the afternoon tea, uh, member for uh, one of the But anyway, um, so um, when it keeps going on, um, you go to the west. A 40-year-old grandson meant to be under DPC care um, was wandering through the streets, and a grandmother, one year grandson, lived out Thank of you, the boot and car. Uh, that was the West, uh, 3rd of the 8th, 2021. Um, news article, 3rd of the 8th, uh, Housing First Program in Regional WA, hampered by shortage of social housing, $9.4 million program started in Perth and Bunbury in June but, uh, to fund uh, case workers finding su su uh, sustainable housing. And it's all about uh, money that's there trying to find sustainable housing when you've got organisations putting up options uh, and the government um, uh, being very dismissive uh, of, uh, of those options. Um, and um, uh, when you have a look um, uh, at uh, you know, article after article uh, and uh, you can have a look at local articles and I'll give you uh, one that in the Midwest uh, times um, uh, public housing properties sit empty in Geraldton as wait list grows. Um, this uh, was on the 20th of July 2021. Um, 
uh, a non-for-profit social group in regional Western Australia says the state government's plan to boost social and public housing supply will do little to tackle homeless in the regions. More than 950 people in the Midwest and Gascoigne are on public housing wait lists, and with the average wait time of 94 weeks, nearly two years. Meanwhile, uh, more than 130 properties sit vacant in Geraldton alone, including 39 which are under review and may be refurbished or demolished. Um, and when the minister said there's not when it, in relation to Shelter WA saying that they could use the old Carnarvon High School site uh, for 100 homes, single beds, he said there's no need for 100 beds. Well, it may not be a need in Carnarvon, but when you talk about the Midwest and Gascoigne, including Geraldton, when you've got more than 950 people on the wait list, there is a need for housing. There is a need for housing. And I'll, I, I'll talk about Carnarvon, for example, members. 14 boarded up homes in Carnarvon. 14 boarded up homes in Carnarvon. Now, when you've got a housing crisis, when you've got long uh, uh, wait lists, when you've got the desperate need of people trying to find a home, when you've got overcrowding occurring, which leads to families often being dysfunctional because of the overcrowding, because of the unwelcome visitors that some families have to put up with, leads to uh, the uh, uh, police often often being tied up with some of those antisocial behaviours when it comes to overcrowding. So when you've then got uh, crime issues, when kids don't want to go home because of that overcrowding that's occurring, what do they do? They roam the streets. What do they do? They break into uh, property. So what does that do? It causes the police to be at their wits end and the community, at their community. So when the police go, we need more police officers in Carnarvon, I'll use that as a good example, um, they go, we need nine police. But we've got nowhere to house those police officers. And the police are not the answer to the crime problem or the housing problem, but they're at the pointy end. So when the police go, we need more police officers, and the Minister for Police goes, we're giving Carnarvon an extra five police, I think it originally started off with nine, they can't fulfil, fulfil those places because there's no housing for the police. And so the circle continues. The circle continues where you have the overcrowding problems due to not having uh, um, enough uh, housing stock or adequate housing stock when you've got 14 boarded up homes, uh, when then you've got uh, 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 government employees such as the police need to increase their presence can't because there is no government um, uh, housing. So grow housing is another issue when it comes to government employees. So in regional towns like the Gascoigne can't fulfil any of their complement if they've got um, FTEs available to them because there is no housing. No housing when it comes to grow housing, no housing when it comes to social housing. Uh, and so, therefore, what you start to see is the homeless uh, increase in regional towns. What you see is uh, the uh, family dysfunction occur because of uh, the uh, uh, overcrowding that's occurring. You start to then see uh, issues when it comes to domestic violence. And then you start to see kids not wanting to go home and roam in the streets who are bored. Uh, who are uh, trying to keep themselves occupied to get food uh, or, or to get a drink and, and break into uh, businesses and homes to try and get a feed or to try and get some money um, because they don't want to go home. That's what transpires when you've got a housing crisis, Minister for Housing. That's what transpires. The circle of issues that come from housing uh, which is the number one driver of uh, uh, antisocial behaviour, the number one driver of issues when it comes to families and homes, and the number one driver when it comes to uh, uh, people in regional towns leaving uh, because the rents start to go through the roof and, and the inability to get any social housing whatsoever because there has not been 
antisocial houses been built uh, in the Gascoigne over the last five years. Over the last five years, not one. So, Minister for Housing, it is a, it is a crisis that is gripping every part of, of, uh, of the state. Um, and so when you've got the waiting list, when you've got the houses being sold, um, this is the department's uh, response. A department spokesman said of the 141 homes being built across the state under the first stage, eight will be in the Midwest and Gascoigne. And I just want to say, Midwest and Gascoigne, I hate the two being merged together because it's Gascoigne separate and the Midwest is separate. Um, and um, uh, when, they talk, when you talk about Midwest, that includes Geraldton, a large regional city, a large regional city. Um, so when you have a look at uh, 141 homes to be built across the first stage under the first stage, eight will be in the Midwest and Gascoigne. This includes two new social housing dwellings, which are managed by community housing providers and six public housing properties maintained by the department. That's all. To deal with the high housing crisis, and, um, and uh, I think there's some quotes here. There's some quotes. Oh, I've got, and it's good to see the member for Geraldton uh, in the House, because uh, um, the member for Geraldton, Lara Dalton, said a study last year found 40 to 50 people were sleeping rough, but the true number of people experiencing housing instability was unknown. She promised residents that she'll be pu uh, pushing very hard to get up to 60 Homes West homes uh, uh, presently out of commission open as soon as possible. They're all, they're all, because they're all boarded up. They're all empty. And um, uh, the, the, the mayor of Geraldton, the mayor of... Uh, I'm glad you brought that up because it's not that clear cut. Because those houses, those houses have have not been adequately done up. They haven't been adequately been given the the. Excuse me, members. So 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 members, you talking about Geraldton? Uh, last week, I can't remember. I think it was Saturday. So uh, actually, I have been passed with the mayor of Geraldton. Well, I, don't, I haven't been. I don't have keys to go in. I'm not part of the government. Uh, perhaps if the minister would like to give me, no, perhaps the minister would like to give me the keys to those houses. But members, anyway, just to continue on, the member for Geraldton has acknowledged that you have got um, all these uh, houses that have been boarded up, that are empty, that could solve somewhat of the huge waiting list that exists. And that is only in Geraldton, in the Midwest and Gascoigne, which is huge, which is becoming to a point where it's very difficult um, to ever, ever <laughs> cater for uh, the struggling uh, families and individuals uh, that are facing uh, the Midwest and Gascoigne and the whole of Western Australia. What that does, it moves families away from regional Western Australia, it moves families away because they'll go to, into the city. Um, where there potentially could be uh, a family member or someone that uh, uh, they may know to be able to put them up for a certain time or a uh, greater chance of getting a house. Uh, so, um, uh, Minister, when it comes to um, housing, social housing, and we've gone through the stats and my colleagues will, will continue to go through the stats, uh, of um, uh, around the state of the lack of housing, the housing crisis that's gripping um, so many people, so many communities. Um, uh, the amount of letters that have been uh, written to to the former minister for housing, um, and um, and I've got one here from um, um, uh, the uh, former Minister of Housing, Honourable Peter Tinley. This is in uh, January 2021, uh, where it's talk, this, this constituent of mine is talking about Exmouth and the, the need for housing in Exmouth. And, um, and uh, he's, uh, this is a response. I appreciate you sharing your observations on the current trends in Exmouth real estate market. 
It's recognised that housing options in regional centres are high demand and the smaller markets like Exmouth may find it difficult to respond to uh, significant upturns in demand and this may, uh, may negatively affect the local economy. But as you will be aware, the Department of Communities and Land Development functions are being transferred to Development WA according to the Department of Communities has forwarded your comments and suggestions to Development WA. That's a great response uh, by the former Minister for Housing uh, who had one of my constituents write to him uh, to express the dire need uh, for land to be released so that people can buy uh, build houses. Ended up not being in the right traction. No, oh, well, clearly, clearly, that's probably the case. Um, but uh, in places like Exmouth, it's actually about land release to be able to get the, housings, the housing built and built by the private sector, uh, not so much by uh, uh, by government. And that's where the government has dragged their, their, their knuckles on the ground, their feet on the ground, uh, when it comes to land release. Uh, by development WA on land that has been um, uh, in the in the process, uh, but delayed or hasn't been acted on for the past five years in a town like Exmouth, uh, where the the uh, department the government hasn't put a priority on uh, uh, land release. Land is there, land is available, but uh, haven't been able to settle on native title issues and obviously development WA, a key performance indicator is how much they're going to make off the development. So they'll wait until that price gets to a point, gets to a point and then they'll develop uh, the land because in their legislation they have to turn a profit. Um, that's not what's needed in regional uh, well, WA. New, new Minister for Lands as well as Housing. Oh, I'll be interested to see what the Minister for Lands says about uh, particularly the housing. Uh, uh, situation and the land that needs to be released uh, by Development WA in a town like Exmouth, who is really suffering at the moment uh, when they've got a general population of 2,500 people uh, but a visitation rate of 20,000 people uh, in the height of uh, tourism. That puts pressure on small businesses and the alike. Um, and that just leads me into some of the government commitments uh, that were made uh, prior to the election when it comes to workers' accommodation. Workers' accommodation uh, uh, members, and, uh, and I don't know, Member for House, uh, Minister for Housing, if workers' accommodation falls under your remit, but uh, we've got the, the, the Minister for Lands there. I don't know if it falls under your remit, but it's a housing, it's part of the housing crisis. So at the moment, everywhere in Western Australia is, is struggling to get employees. If you can get an employee, there's nowhere to house that employee, particularly in regional WA. And, uh, and at the um, just before the 2017, uh, 2021 state election, uh, you've got here quotes from uh, the Premier uh, talking about um, workers' accommodation, land release for Calberry workers' accommodation. If uh, if re-elected, we will accelerate the process of facilitate and facilitate the construction of new workers' accommodation facility. Um, Mr. McGowan said the COVID-19 had significantly impacted the availability of workers' accommodation in Calberry, with the shortage continuing uh, to impact tourism, hospitality, and small business. The, the initiative came after Northamptonshire President Craig Simpkin said that Calberry employees were screaming out for the Shire to find workers' accommodation, uh, to provide workers' accommodation. And it goes on. A commitment. This was a commitment on the 11th of March 2021. 2021, when the Premier waltzed in uh, in his. Uh, no, I think it may have been. No, it was. Yeah, waltzed in and, um, and announced. Uh, that they will fast-track workers' accommodation. Now, if there was ever a need um, for workers' accommodation, it is now. And that is not only a need for those business operators to have housing for their workers, but a need for Calberry residents to be able to have workers' accommodation for all the tradies, the builders, 
to be able to repair their homes, their businesses, uh, from uh, uh, Cyclone Sarosa that hit uh, um, a few months after uh, what occurred um, uh, after the election. So, so members, when you talk about uh, commitments, if a re-elected, if we're re-elected, we'll accelerate the process to facilitate and construct construction of new works to accommodation. That is in Kalbarri. And uh, what's the date today, members? The uh, 11th? 11th, of August. 11th of August, and we still haven't seen any movement when it comes to workers' accommodation uh, for Kalbarri. Critical now for the rebuild of Kalbarri. Critical for the workers uh, to be able to be housed, to be able to supply that tourism product, that tourism product that West Australians want to be able to uh, uh, receive when they go and visit places like Calvary. That is going to a cafe, being able to get a coffee, get out something to eat, go to a hotel room and check in because the bed sheets have been able to be clean uh, or, or been able to clean a room because there's workers. And the list goes on, members, the list goes on. It is a major issue. Um, but we follow up with the other hot spot in my electorate being Exmouth, um, where uh, state election, this is the Pilbara News, state election, WA Labor reveals plan to fast track solution to stem Exmouth staff housing shortage. Amazing. What date was this? 5th of March, a week before, <laughs> a week before the same announcement uh, in Kalbarri. Um, uh, initiatives to stem the dire shortage of workers' accommodation in Exmouth will be fast-tracked under a re-elected Labor government. The launch of expressions of interest for local companies to build much-needed workers, uh, needed workers, uh, several potential sites have already been identified, and a future Labor lands minister, lands minister, that's you, uh, member for Arbidale. Yep, yep, it's got here. The Premier's actually dobbed you in. He knew that you were going to take on the role. Uh, and a future Lands Minister, being new member for Armadale, uh, would grant tenure approval for the appropriate development. And, Minister, perhaps you can enlighten the House, enlighten the residents and uh, businesses what of Exmouth what, what, actions, what actions you've taken uh, to um, fast track, fast track what the Premier has said, fast track. Um, to stem the dire sh shortage of work and accommodation in Exmouth. So it'll be interesting to see if you're going to get up in this debate, uh, uh, Minister for Lands, and enlighten uh, the businesses of Exmouth um, uh, what, uh, um, what actions you've taken, um, given that, that the Premier has uh, made sure that you are the, the minister responsible for delivering much needed workers' accommodation. Given the fact that the uh, Exmouth Chamber of Commerce um, has um, conducted their own survey and found over 200 employees uh, were needed and that 200, over 200 beds were needed uh, to be able to accommodate the workers' um, accommodation crisis that you have in Exmouth, the groundwork has been done. Uh, when the government comes in and the, the government um, and the Premier says that they will fast-track these initiatives under a re-elected Labor government. Well, we've got a re-elected Labor government, um, but we're not seeing too much of that fast-tracking to alleviate the pressures uh, that business is under. And members, I know that uh, quite a few of you have been travelling uh, up north um, who often see that businesses are closed. Uh, simply because um, those owners need some respite. They're working basically 24-7, but they need to have a day off uh, simply because they can't find uh, any employees. And if they can, there is no accommodation uh, to put those employees in. And that's happening from Exmouth uh, to Coral Bay uh, to Sharp Bay and to Kalbarri. Uh, but if you go inland, uh, and, and particularly Broome as well, and it's good to see the member for Broome, and I'm sure that the Chamber of Commerce, has, uh, Kimberley, um, has approached you uh, uh, over the fact that there needs to be, uh, who I've met with, there needs to be workers' accommodation built, um, which, uh, which uh, is, uh, is, is what's needed 
uh, to to be able to because uh, member for Kimberley, as you'll be aware, you often hear uh, that brooms full. But a lot of those hotels are only about 80% capacity because they're using the other 20% for staff, or they're using, uh, or they can't fulfil the other 20% because they've got no one to clean the rooms uh, and provide those services. So I'm sure you've got that same uh, feedback. Feedback being the local member uh, uh, for Kimberley, is Broome, um, your tourism hotspots are under a huge amount of pressure huge amount of pressure. So when we hear that tourism, oh, it's booming, Broome's full, Exmouth's full, Calberry's full, Shark Bay's full, Coral Bay's full. Um, the reality is it's full to the ability of being able to be as open as one can be. That is because there is a shortage of workers and if you've got the workers, there is, a, uh, there is no workers accommodation uh, for um, for uh, uh, these businesses to be able to maximise their profits from this wonderful opportunity where no one in West Australia can go overseas. Uh, when the borders are open, we've got people coming o over here from the east, east Coast. That's a great position, something that we've always wanted our tourism spots to be able to, uh, um, uh, to really boom. Uh, because of uh, uh, the amount of tourists going around. But we, those businesses, those towns, can't uh, maximise uh, their uh, capture of the market because oh, simply they don't have uh, the amount of uh, workers or workers' accommodation uh, to, uh, to be able to fulfil and keep their businesses open, uh, which then causes obviously stresses and strains uh, on our mental health issues, burnout, fatigue uh, that businesses face because simply there is no workers' accommodation for the employees if they're able to get those employees. Uh, so, members, um, uh, I hope, one, the Minister for Lands can address some of those issues. Uh, hopefully he'll stand up and talk about the workers' accommodation shortage uh, that is really gripping uh, our northern towns. Uh, we're seeing rents go sky high. Uh, the property market still remains <laughs> relatively calm in terms of sales because of the problems when it comes to uh, banks lending in regional areas. Banks find it extremely hard to lend in regional areas, hence why we don't have too many new houses being built, simply because of the demand of banks wanting a large deposit. Uh, um, to be able to start uh, that process of uh, uh, building uh, uh, building a house. So, Minister for Housing, Minister for Lands, uh, I hope you can look at Development WA, the land that the state has, and ways in which we can make that land affordable uh, so that people can build on that land, so they can build their home, so we can deal with some of uh, the, the, the uh, crisis when it comes to people wanting to live uh, in, in communities, uh, but also um, allowing for um, uh, you know grow homes to be built, uh, which is a major problem in nearly every in every regional town. Not having the adequate uh, amount of uh, FTEs for government departments simply because there's no housing. Of oh, that deals with Calberry. Yes. And what has he said? Has he said that he's changed, he's changed in his mind on on what he requires from uh, Development WA? So my understanding that the the need in Calberry. I'll give you an example, Minister. No, but uh, my question was to you. Could you ask me if I could explain? We have been trying to work with them, but the shy president keeps changing his mind what he wants. So, so Minister, and I know this is not you. I know this is not you because I. What's that? Yeah. yeah, that may be the case. That may be the case, leader opposition. But the question, but the question that can I answer the question? Asked is what development WA is doing? Can we I? tried to work with you, and he keeps changing his mind. Okay, minister. So don't shake your head, minister, because I, I uh, don't you know, shake your head when you don't know what he's telling minister, us. Minister, minister, you have a chance to get up. But if I can just respond to what you've just said, um, and the only way I can respond is the pressure that the Shire of Northampton. 
CEOs. No, no, and councillors and the whole community. And I cannot, I cannot CEOs. downplay, uh, 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 play this. I'm not playing this uh, in any other way. Um, Madam Acting Speaker, Madam Acting Speaker, the Minister oh, has Minister, a chance to get up and speak. Excuse me. Minister for Lands. Thank you. Minister. Thank you. Minister. Not only is the member continually interjecting, but the members continue to interject. The, your member for Armadale, not, not only is he continually interjecting, He's continuing to interject whilst you're um, speaking. You should have Members for North West Central, uh, please, you. if um, you do not want interjections, please do not no, engage I in actually, conversation. I, I, I do respect the uh, Minister for Lands and what he has to say, but I just want to explain to this House, uh, and the Minister for Emergency Services would fully understand this as well, the pressures that the Shire of Northampton have been under is immense. Is absolutely immense, and the CEO, uh, who has been criticised and unfairly, and I think that's just somewhat of luck of understanding of the magnitude of uh, the cyclone and the effect it's had right across the Shire of Northampton and the Midwest, as well as the Shire President uh, and councillors uh, who are bearing uh, uh, the, the burden of their community, who is under a huge amount of pressure. And like I said today, for example, Cal Barry, um, for most of the day, yes, they had no power. And that just adds to the fact that they don't have a roof uh, on, uh, on their house. It's just still a tarp. Um, that they've got no one to complain to. And so who do they complain to? Uh, the Shire President, the Shire councillors, the staff. And so in times of, of distress, the times of, hang on a sec, because it's important uh, that we all understand that the pressures that they're under, uh, when it comes to trying to work, to work through what's actually needed when you've got um, your community constantly at you, um, this is where government needs to provide that support through uh, people working, uh, helping out the Shire, people on the ground, to fully ascertain what's actually needed when it comes to workers' accommodation. Because, Minister, I'll give you an example. One assessor, one assessor um, needs 200 employees, tradies, to do that company's work. That's one. So, so workers' accommodation, and like I said, you've got... We got. Hang on a second. I'll let you. I'll let you respond. But um, you've got a commitment made by the premier uh, prior to the election about workers' accommodation and the need for small businesses to have workers and the accommodation to be able to house them. That's one commitment which hasn't uh, been forthcoming. And then the other issue that's now transpired is the need to house. Uh, workers, tradies, builders, to be able to rebuild uh, places like Calberry, Northampton, when there's a lack and no accommodation, basically, <laughs> and businesses trying to survive, uh, trying to get tourists still to come back in, it is a absolute perfect storm of everything going wrong at the moment, uh, and and I I think we can all uh, take on board that the pressures of the CEO, president and councillors that are under uh, does sometimes uh, um, be it's seen as being um, bullish uh, or being angry, and we must respect the position that they're in. Not a criticism of the Shire CEO, but just stating a fact that there has been a change of mind over a period of time what, in its mouth and Calberry actually, what they want. And of course the cyclone then changed the position again. So Developer WA has been trying to work with both shires to accommodate what they want, but their position has changed, partly as a result of the cyclone, but not only as a cyclone. And it's not just a development WA issue, it's also a planning issue as well. So it's also the department, so not just development WA, both are involved, trying to assist. It's very trying circumstances, but there has been change of positions. That's not a criticism, it's just stating a fact. Um, thank you, uh, Minister for Lands. And I look forward 
to a resolution to uh, what is now a dire situation. And, and we're not talking even about Cal Barry. Um, Cal Barry, like I said, Exmouth goes from 2,500 people to 20,000. Uh, Cal Barry um, goes from a couple of hundred uh, to um, five or 6,000 people. Um, and, and, and it goes on right across uh, uh, this, um, this great state of ours who's experiencing a wonderful opportunity uh, to grow our businesses, to grow our tourism product, to grow our regional communities, but are hamstrung because of uh, the lack of land that's uh, been um, uh, allowed to be uh, developed and built on. And those various issues are uh, because of native title holding up uh, land to be extinguished so it can be developed. Uh, services such as uh, sewerage, water, power, um, and uh, we, we talk about sewerage ponds, for example, which is an inhibitor. Even if you want to build houses, say, in Exmouth, uh, you're going to have to upgrade the sewerage treatment facility there to be able to cater for any houses. Uh, and, and the list goes on, the same in, in, in Coral Bay. Uh, you've got massive... It, it, it's expensive, Minister. Um, and, and the point, I suppose, is you've got all these massive pressures uh, that uh, visitors, uh, like everyone uh, in this chamber, I'm sure would go and visit um, uh, most regional communities, communities for a holiday, especially along the coast, uh, know how wonderful it is. But the pressure that our community, uh, communities are under uh, is huge when it, become, when it comes to housing. And the lack of investment over the last five years has culminated to this massive problem that uh, is going to take years to fix. Um, but we're not seeing even the plan going forward to build um, social housing, to take off the boards of the houses that are boarded up and, and renovate them or fix them up uh, so we can get people living in there. Um, we're not seeing that plan when it comes to workers' accommodation. We're not seeing that plan that you have to upgrade the sewage treatment plant or, or uh, places that can be developed or land to, uh, to be uh, developed can't because there is no sewerage uh, connection uh, uh, to it. So the services are, are lacking. But there is no plan by government, and I'll go back to there is no regional development plan uh, when it comes to our regional communities uh, which will allow those houses to be built. And when it comes to the whole of Western Australia at the moment, the rental market doesn't exist. So where are people living? Where are people living? What is the plan of the government? What's the plan to uh, incorporate the private sector to be part of that uh, uh, problem solving? Where is the government uh, sitting down? Are they sitting down with Shelter WA and other community organisations? Uh, perhaps the minister could have gone to the, the housing summit, summit uh, where those ideas uh, were thrown on the table. Um, how, what plan does the government have to be able to curb this housing crisis that is crippling regional communities, crippling uh, those who are the most vulnerable and crippling uh, those businesses who can't get any uh, accommodation for their workers and crippling the growth of our towns and this state because there is no housing being forthcoming uh, by the state government. That's the problem. That's what we need, to, uh, we need to hear from the government. What's the plan moving forward? The opposition will support a plan moving forward. In the absence of a plan, well, we'll come up with a plan. We'll take it to the next election. Because when it comes to housing in this state, how there is a housing crisis that is gripping gripping um, every part of our community. Your government departments, ministers that you're responsible for, are all suffering because there is no grow housing. Our communities are suffering, which leads to issues, um, whether it be crime, antisocial behaviour, overcrowding occurring. This is what we're facing, members, and this is what we need the government to fix. And it's not just announcing uh, millions and millions of dollars. We need to actually see a time frame, a time frame, a plan moving forward that doesn't just include the amount of houses, because the next problem is 
you don't have the utilities to be able to connect to those houses. Uh, and that's why you need a regional development plan, you need a plan for housing in this state, and ultimately what plugged the holes of government in the past was royalties for regions who provided all those services so we can grow our regional communities. That's what we need to bring back members, and that's what will have a huge uh, difference so we can grow our regional towns, fix this housing crisis, because clearly, Clearly, as I said in a speech last week, um, what we see is a stage. We see the Premier on the stage. He's doing the bow with all the lights on him. We see, we see the uh, Minister for Health jump on the stage to get his accolades and suddenly trips over the curtain. We've got the Minister for Housing and comes the other way to get his accolades, trips over the curtain. And what we see behind the curtain is that house, health crisis, that housing crisis and a crisis in general uh, that this state is facing because of the smokes and mirrors and the failure and the failure to reinvest over the last five years into our state so we don't have these crisis crisis after crisis that it will be your downfall as a government it will be your downfall as a government because people can't find a house um, and uh, when the health system is is where it's at uh, I'd watch out members I'd be I'd be working, uh, working as much as possible to come up with a plan to fix these massive issues gripping our state, uh, because we've got a massive health crisis that is that is that is stopping our growth, our potential as a state moving forward. And uh, I hope the Minister for Housing, I, I have faith in you, Minister for Housing. I have faith in you, Minister for Lands to work together, to work together to be able to create the plan that we need so that people people have a, a roof over their head. Thank you, Speaker. Leader of the Liberal Party. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I too rise to support the motion today. Uh, and I do so because of the massive and, and can I say unnecessary housing crisis we have here in Western Australia. Now we've got a $5 billion budget surplus uh, here and we've had a budget surplus year on year because of the GST fix for this state organised by the Honourable Matthias Cormann, um, former oh, Minister oh, for... <laughs> the federal Liberal government, who fixed the GST inequity for this state, delivering billions, <laughs> delivering billions of dollars to this state government above their forecast budget, and on top of Minister that, a massive, please. can you please stop from interject? A massive windfall a massive windfall from, uh, from royalties right through the term of this government. So there is no excuse for where we are, and, and no excuse in particular, because this government, this minister sitting opposite here, Minister for Police, the new Minister for Housing, the new Minister for Lands, they've sat in this, they've sat in this, this parliament, they've sat in this parliament, new Minister for Emergency Services, uh, sat in this parliament, and heard from this side the crisis that this state faces. I came into this parliament in 2018. I, I, came, I came into this parliament in 2018. I came into this parliament in 2018. And when I came into this parliament, Tony Christovich, uh, the former member for Corrine, um, passionately, oh, for goodness sake, please, Acting Speaker. Ministers, it's great you're all here, but can we please just let the Leader of the Liberal Party speak? Thank you. Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I would appreciate uh, at least a few less needless interjections. Um, Tony Christovich, who's the former member for Corrine, in this chamber, and when I, from the first day I came into this chamber, the first day I came into this chamber, he raised the issue of homelessness, and he raised it right in the Premier's electorate. And that is in the Premier's electorate, in front of the P Premier, and I know because I used to be the, the head of the uh, Quinana Industries Council, and my office was based down that way. I used to drive past there and see that. Oh, for Matt, acting speaker, please, can I have some clear Let me air? get in the chair first. <laughs> Thank you very much. Continue. 
Thank you very much, Acting Speaker. I will be grateful for your support. Tony Christovich, the former member for Korean, in this very place, raised the problem in the Premier's own electorate in Rockingham. We had people, desperate people, sleeping rough in the Premier's electorate on the road that he drives past to get to Parliament from his house. And, and the Premier was alerted to that. He was alerted to the crisis. He was alerted to the fact that, in fact, people had died in that camp, um, sleeping rough in that camp, because they had nowhere else to go. Do you know how long it took the Premier? Now, I'm not talking about the Premier of the state going and visiting some far-flung place. I'm talking about the Premier in his own electorate. It took the Premier two years two years to actually go and visit that camp. You know, members, for all your foibles around this chamber and for all the things that we may disagree with, I'm pretty sure that all of you as local members in that situation would have gone and visited those people in that community like I visit people who are homeless in my community uh, and discuss the issues with them. And I know you do that. It took this Premier, this arrogant Premier, two years to go and visit people who were homeless in his own electorate. And then it took some considerable time after that for the matter to actually be dealt with only because the member of Corrine was dogged in highlighting the issue of homelessness. And he didn't just highlight the issue of homelessness uh, down in Rockingham. He highlighted the issue of homelessness right across metropolitan Perth and right across this state. So, you know, I have some sympathy for the new Minister for Housing. I know that the new Minister for Housing uh, is passionate about this issue and wants to do something about it. But we're not talking about a new government. We're not talking about a government that's just come in, they're trying to deal with issues from the past. We're talking about a government that is heading in, uh, it's four and a half years in, and, and now we're hearing about plans or plans to plan. Now we're hearing about plans and things that might be done. This crisis sits at your feet. This Labor government, who has simply been completely inadequate with dealing with this issue over the last four and a half years. And as I say, I know this uh, current minister is, uh, is passionate about this topic. I've in invited and I've had private discussions with the minister you know, about this issue in my electorate, and I won't go into that uh, detail. In the same way, I don't play politics on serious issues like this. In the same way, where my sports... In the same way that with, my, uh, with sports clubs in my electorate, I invite the sporting minister down in private meetings to have a discussion. And I was, must say I was a bit disturbed that the minister would then say uh, that he tries to use that for some political point score in here. I didn't try and use that for my political advantage inviting him down. I invite him down privately to discuss those matters in my electorate and introduce him to the people in those sporting clubs that needed some help and assistance um, in exactly the same way that I respect the current, uh, the current housing minister. So I know he's trying to do something. The problem with this government is you've got a government that's paralysed um, by an emperor who makes all of the decisions. Now, we get the reports that the thing about, the thing about humans is, the thing about humans is they, people discuss, people discuss, and they talk about things. And we hear what happens in Cabinet. And I'll tell you what you do in Cabinet, keep your mouth shut, keep your head down, otherwise you'll get it kicked off. That's, that's what we hear. That's what we hear. Well, we'll find out. We'll find out, you know. And if you're a chosen, if you're in the chosen group, if you're in the chosen group, you're fine. Now, I think you're Don't put your head up, otherwise. Well, let me tell you. I think I think this premier, um, this premier, whatever his characterisation of the former premier was, whatever his characterisation of the oh, honestly, whatever his characterisation of the former premier was, um, he clearly uh, was enamoured with the model. Can I say, as he stated it, clearly was enamoured with the model. And, you know, it is in my own electorate, in my own electorate, uh, and glad to hear from you, member from Coburn, not surprised. In my own electorate, in my own electorate of Cottesloe, in my own electorate of Cottesloe, one in 30 residents, one in 30 residents in my electorate in Cottesloe lives in social housing. Now, um, that compares, member for Coburn, with you. That compares, um, uh, member for Coburn, there's 3.2% of the people that live in my electorate live in social housing. Coburn, the great moral crusader, member for Coburn, only 2.4%. 
Only 2.4%. Yes, and we know you've got a chip on your shoulder because you went to a public school and you had to put up with private school kids at uni and we've heard it all. Well, member, member, let's, uh, let's go on. Let's go on. 2.4% social housing in the city of Coburn. 2.4% social housing in the city of Coburn. 2.4% social housing in the, in the city of Coburn, 3.2% in, in my electorate. And I passionately care about those people. I passionately care about those people. I go down to the loners' lunch, I talk with them, I discuss the issues and I try and help those people with their, um, with their particular problems. When they come to my office, I try and... When they come to my office, City of Rockingham... City of Rockingham only has 3.1% social housing. I will say Armadale um, definitely has has a, a, a bigger issue in that, 4.2%, so 1% more than Cottesloe. But it is an issue that affects all of us, and we see that right across the state. But what do we see the response to this government after four years? This government, after four years, uh, has reduced social housing by... Uh, 1,372, and and that's not our that's not a number we made up. That's in answers to questions asked by the honourable Steve Martin um, uh, on the 17th of June 2001. So on the 30th of June 2017, 44,087 public houses. Now down to 42,715. So this is the party, the bleeding heart socialists, who care about those people doing it tough, who care about those people doing it tough. You know, you know what, Member for Wanneroo, if you think you won... I want to order, uh, Madam Acting Speaker, I am really dealing with this problem on my left here. Would you mind telling the Member for, I think it's Wanneroo, uh, to respect the uh, Member on his feet? <laughs> Uh, member for Wanneroo, if you think you won the election on your response to social housing, then you're delusional. Uh, and I might say uh, a good chance it's one of the things you'll lose the next election on the way you're going. All of your arrogance, all of your hub hubris, in four years, this government went backwards. This government houses few, fewer people in social housing after four and a half years than the previous government uh, did. So that's something you should be ashamed about, members, all of you, because this is your government. Now, despite sitting on your massive surplus, um, despite having all of that, and that's through this term, you have simply not stepped up and done your job. What you've done is forced people onto the streets by selling those public houses and not replacing them. Now, we know on this side that you need to turn over public housing stock. We know that. That's part of the business, and that was happening under the previous government. But you don't put that money into consolidated revenue. You put that money into building more houses. So what have we got a situation now? Because the federal and state governments have pump-primed the, pump the construction industry so much, now it's going to be almost impossible for this government to catch up, simply because we do not have the workers uh, to do the work. All available workforce is tied up um, in residential projects. In fact, I'm told the pipeline is probably two to three years long. It's going to be an enormous challenge because this government didn't do anything, because this government didn't do anything in the last four years to properly deal with this issue. And in fact, they sold uh, houses. And as I say, I feel um, I feel sorry for the, uh, the challenge that has been presented to the new minister because the new minister um, has been handed a suicide pass. And I know he's passionate. I know he's, he's, a, he's a, I know he's a clever, I know he's, well, I won't go down that path, Minister, but can I say um, he has been given an enormously difficult uh, task by a government that did nothing in the last um, four years. And compare that, compare that to the 6,000 public houses built by the Liberal National Government. 6,000 additional houses built under the Liberal National Government. You've run it down. Um, if we look at the, and, and look at the issues, um, there's a report ending homelessness um, uh, in Western Australia, the 2021 report, um, published on the 3rd of August um, 2021, uh, the Centre for Social Justice and the University of Western Australia. And, um, and let's have a look at that. So if we go back to July 17, uh, 2017, number of clients accessing specialist homeless services in Western Australia who were on homeless or on entry support, 2,251 uh, in 2017, now 3,099. 
3,099 members. So 750, a massive increase uh, in those people seeking low support. That dimensions and, and continues to mention not just what we see on the streets, um, but in real numbers. And we know, members, that it's the most vulnerable people in society who are the victims of this. We know that in, in and this is based on this report, 29%, almost 30% of homeless people uh, are people, uh, are Aboriginal people uh, in this state. And so there's a, a group that already suffers enormous disadvantage um, in a number of aspects. And here we see almost one in three homeless people being Aboriginal um, people. Um, and, and a whole range of challenges, and look, I won't go through all of it because of uh, time, um, but look, 25% of those people only had an educational attainment to year nine or lower. So people with real challenges um, in a whole range of areas, um, uh, but uh, 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 particular challenges um, with particular issues. Um, two thirds of male, one third of female. Um, now here's the real thing, we hear about the emergency crisis, the presentation to EDs. This is your own doing. Exactly as the member for North West Central outlined very clearly earlier on, exactly one of the root causes of the stress on our hospital system at the moment. Um, and, and that is that nearly half of the people who are living uh, uh, are homeless, nearly 48.7% or 48.7% had gone to the emergency department due to not feeling emotionally well or because of their of because of their nerves. More than half reported a diagnosis of depression, 58.7%, uh, anxiety, 52.3%. Almost a third of the people reported a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder, 26.2% uh, had been diagnosed with psychosis. Um, we go over the page. Emergency department, accidents emergency centres were visited an average of 3.5 times per person in the six month prior to the survey. So what we see is these people who are living rough exactly as the member for North West Central did. There's no chicken and egg here. When people are forced out onto the streets, they suffer anxiety, they suffer depression, their medical conditions are not treated properly. And because of that, they end up in ED departments. And what we've seen, and this is not my statistics, members, this is from a respected uh, research group based at the University of Western Australia, what they're saying is a substantially larger number of people who are out there on the streets seeking help in the term of this government. So those people, and they're the people that are turning up. Um, on average, um, uh, uh, if you compare the number of hospitalisations, a dramatic increase in hospitalisations um, for people who are living rough um, on the streets. So when we talk about the hospital crisis, what we see is that is intimately, intrinsically linked uh, to this government's failure um, to deal with homelessness. Um, if we go on to, you know, and, and look, Geraldton has been a focus. I've spent four days in Geraldton uh, just a couple of weeks ago um, uh, talking to people in the community. Um, we had our, um, what we call our, our winter love in there um, and uh, went out and spent a lot of time talking to people in the, the community in Geraldton. And look, Geraldton overall, Geraldton overall is, is doing well. The economy in Geraldton is doing well. Um, and certainly better than when I was uh, last there about 12 months ago um, and spent some time there. Um, certainly the shops, are, you know, there's more shops that are open and, and people are generally buoyant. But, but there's the other side to it. And as was pointed out by the, by the member uh, for North West Central, you know, uh, uh, there's almost a thousand people in that area on the streets. But, it, you know, statistics and statistics, and we talk about the houses, I actually went out um, and, and had a look at that issue. I went out into the into the suburbs and had a look and and uh, looked at the issues um, that were going on um, out there. Now I heard what the minister said today about those houses, but I'll tell you what's happening in Geraldton, members. What's happening in Geraldton? The Red Cross in Geraldton is giving out tents. They're giving out tents so that homeless people have somewhere to live. That's what they're doing in that great city of Geraldton, in an economy that's otherwise um, doing well. They're, they're handing out tents. Um, I, went to the, uh, I went to the old Batavia Motor Inn in Geraldton, um, and uh, it was a sort of a property deal gone wrong. 
What did I see in, in, in the Batavia motor, motor Inn? It's something like something out of a dystopian movie, you know, of, of some futuristic nightmare. Here we are in this prosperous community. May I have an extension, please, Acting Speaker? Extension granted. Thank you very much. In this prosperous community, we have desperate people who are, and, and I, 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 I did um, see some of the people in that area and a couple of my colleagues went and spoke to them. I did not want to go there as a big group because I think sometimes people in that situation feel humiliated um, and so I didn't want to do that but I did have their conversation really back and I spoke to um, people in that community that regularly interact with those people in the Batavia Motor Inn. Now those people, those poor people, they've gone up, they've put boards up, they're trying to make themselves secure, they have to carry um, bottles of water up flights of stairs, um, they do that so that they can actually use the toilets and, and, and flush them and so on. Those people, those people would happily live in those boarded up houses if um, those houses were available. They would happily live there. Now I accept what the Minister says, there may be some circumstances where that's not possible. I went and saw the houses that are only five years old. They were on the external appearances, beautiful uh, uh, houses, something I can tell you, uh, well, all of the houses I saw were dramatically better than the house I lived in when I was a child, I can tell you that. Um, but I tell you what, Member, I learn and I look. Uh, so those ones that you refer to had serious vandalism, and as a result, some of these were not appropriate for public housing tenants. Sure. They will be refurbished, but that's the point I make, is, is that on the simple assessment, you may simply say, oh, we can't, you know, you should just do that instantly. But there are sometimes reasons so, and very and, 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 and that's the thing, Minister. Look, I, I accept that point, Minister, and, and I accept that this is not a, not a trivial issue. So I accept the point you're making, but we're four and a half years in. They, they didn't board those houses up yesterday, those houses have been progressively, and I spoke to the people in that community, progressively being boarded up over years. So the government has had time to do something about that. And, and look, I hear the argument. I hear the argument about the wraparound um, services requirement. But again, I mean, this is no mystery. You know, we know generically, as, as a generalisation, probably about half the people who are homeless um, uh, or in fact half the people living in, living in social housing um, have mental health and or um, drug issues. And, and it's not their fault. There are it's just unfortunate people in the community and it's, it's, it's you know, the worst for them, obviously, that they have um, those afflictions. And, and that's why it's a holistic thing. And that's why four and a half years in, you've got those wraparound services. Um, you know, we've got a um, uh, we, we've got a minister that is uh, is responsible uh, for that area. We've got a minister for community services. Now, in conjunction with the minister for housing, that's the job of the minister for community services. What do we hear from the minister of community services in this place? We hear the minister for community services talking about a plan. What's going to happen in six months' time, some months' time, a year's time, two years' time? That minister's been there for four and a half years. And, and I've heard this from this minister the whole time she's been there. Now, I know the Minister for Community Services is a compassionate person. I know that. I don't doubt her level of compassion. I don't doubt the level of compassion of most of the people in this room. But having compassion and being to say in a, in a great thing, you know, great voice how much you care makes no difference. When you're the government, you do something about it. You actually go in and do something about it. Now, this government hasn't done enough about it in the last four and a half years. The reason there's a large population in that Batavia um, motor inn, and I, I can tell you what, they, when I looked in that dwelling, actually, they'd done a pretty good job of setting up as best they could a secure housing apartment. Now, I know there are periodic issues, but I was talking to, you know, as it transpires, um, the mayor there is a neighbour. Now, the mayor interacts with those people. Typically, they do not have um, horrendous problems. They have problems sometime with people that come and visit and so on. But that's why you have those wraparound services um, in those plates. So, you know, it was, it was just um, fascinating to go there. But members, you know, I've got all over this state um, since I've um, taken on this leadership role. My job for an opposition, we do what we can in Parliament, but our job is to get out, visit, learn, listen to people and help where we possibly can um, and mostly make sure... <laughs>
mostly make sure mostly make sure that we hold this government to account. I mean, I've been, I've been to Cunanara, Broome, Derby, Fitzroy Crossing, Halls Creek, through the Pilbara, Ningaloo, the Murchison, Carnarvon, Kalgoorlie, Geraldton, Bunbury, Albany, Esperance, Mount Barker, Mount Barker near the famous and wonderful town of Cranbrook uh, in the southwest of Western Australia. And I'll tell you what was, what was a simple fact in every single one of those communities, in every single one, was the issue of homelessness. homelessness. I was in Esperance. Um, now, Esperance is a wealthy town. And any of you that have, uh, you, you'd know Esperance, it's a wealthy, it's a beautiful town. It's benefited from government expenditure on amenities uh, and, and facilities. In Esperance tonight, there'll be a dozen people sleeping rough, at least, in Esperance. And th these are people that are sleeping around the town. They cannot get housing. They cannot get housing. And again, I spoke to the Shire and I spoke to community groups there. These are not people who can't be housed. These are not people who can't, um, can't um, you know, handle the housing properly. These are people who can't get houses. And, and you know, that's, I mean, again, in a, in a beautiful, wealthy community, um, we can't have that. And, and, and I do see in the government's notice, and I see, um, you know, the Minister uh, for uh, uh, Community uh, Development, uh, Community Services, I should say, I see the Minister's announced now a $6 million program to work with, sh with shires. Now, that's fine, $6 million. It's 0.001% of the $5 billion surplus, so you know, hardly reaching too deeply into the pocket on that one. Um, but to work with the shires, since when has be, uh, providing housing uh, been a mainstream function of the shires? But the shires are desperate. I see that in Halls Creek, see it in Cunanara, um, Broome, Fitzroy Crossing. You know, in Fitzroy Crossing, the, the local um, um, uh, uh, prescribed body corporates have got together and, and they're actually building their own housing because they're so desperate for housing in that community because the government can't help. When I was, um, when I was in uh, Geraldton, um, and, and there's a, just an incredible. I think, I think there's basically, a, uh, if a house comes on the market, it, it disappears in a day uh, in, in uh, Geraldton. Um, um, I drove around there and I took a good drive around the community. Lots of development WA blocks, lots of them. Beautiful big development WA signs on them. Do you know what they all are, members? They're bush. They're all bush and they've been bush for the term of this government. So big on signs, but not developing the land that requires uh, uh, the, the, uh, the land required for housing uh, in that town. Um, you know, members, the, the, the tragedy of this debate is that every member on this side could, could speak for an hour on this and, and only just be scratching the surface of the topic. You know, I hear all about the plans for the future, but as a government, you have to accept that for four and a half years you have been completely inadequate uh, in dealing with this issue. And, and despite the well-meaning ministers um, in their roles, uh, we have seen nothing uh, to indicate that this government is treating this problem with the seriousness that it deserves. We know that there needs to be at least 3,500 new social houses just to cope uh, with the backlog and get this into a, uh, the back into a position that the government came into at the start, um, given the growth in requirement. So that's the challenge before this government. And as I say, despite the well-meaning nature of individuals, I, see no, I have no optimism whatsoever that this government will be able to deliver this. And this government should be ashamed of its poor performance in this area. Madam Acting Speaker. And before all. Thank you, Madam Acting Speaker. And can I um, just certainly back up, back up both the member for North West Central and the uh, member for Cottesloe and support the member for North West Central's motion that this House condemns the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before and triggering significant economic and social consequences. And I think, uh, I think the member for Cottesloe summed it up very well. Every, every member in this House could quite easily stand up here and talk for an hour without even blinking because all of us as regional members and metropolitan members have got issues. We're getting contacted, uh, if not on a daily basis, at least every couple of days. 
And I think the thing that sums it up for me is the, um, the statement made by the Minister for Housing today in question time when he says, we've lost over 300 houses due to our decision, but it was the right decision, member for North West Central. So I, um, I have to question that. I have to question that when the, when the Minister for Housing proudly says that we've lost over 300 houses due to our decision, but it was the right decision. So um, question marks there. And I think, as the member for Cottesloe said, four and a half years, um, this government, we saw in the last term of government, uh, they took great pride in blaming the previous government, the previous financial situation, spent about three and a half years blaming everyone else and wouldn't take any responsibility. Well, now you are in the second term of government. Uh, you've been in there for four and a half years. You're predicted to have a $5 billion surplus and you've got a health, uh, health department in crisis and now you've got a housing department in crisis as well. And it's time these ministers took responsibility. And the first thing I want to concentrate on is the, uh, the uh, government regional officer housing situation in the regional areas especially. Um, it's such an important part of our, um, of our housing stock in this state. And uh, the Honourable Colin de Grusser asked a, um, a question in uh, in the uh, Upper House recently on the um, 10th of August asking what was the total um, number of grow stock as at June 21, just to try and get a handle on what's happening. And the total number of housing stock is 5,040 properties, but we've got 217 additional requests for grow housing from our client agencies. And a couple of the highlights there are 88 with the Department of Education still on the waiting list and 59 for the WA Police Force. And I think, uh, Madam Acting Speaker, this is where we see examples where our, um, our communities, our regional communities especially, uh, at the public service, we're in, we're in real crisis there because we have, our, um, we have our schools, we have the situation, we've, we've got a um, principal that's left, we need a replacement principal, we advertise, um, but lo and behold, we actually haven't got a house for that principal to come to. So they're getting put up in places. Uh, I look at a place like Nibing in my electorate of Row, where uh, over the past they've struggled to actually get those principals uh, there or, ha or teachers and so they're having to be put up in um, other people's houses or the, down at the hotel down the road. And it's not just for a week or two, it's months on end. So this is a critical uh, shortage that we're seeing out there. And it's something that's really, really uh, starting to create problems for not only the Department of Education, but for our police force as well. And we've had examples here today, a uh, member for uh, Cottesloe just mentioned, places like Fitzroy Crossing, uh, places like Broome, where we're actually starting to have some real crime issues due to the housing situation. So it's a twofold. We've got the crime issues because we've got homeless people out on the streets creating the crime. And then at the same time, we've got uh, the likes of our WA police force who can't actually find places for their officers to live in. So that's a twofold situation um, it's one that I'm, I'm really concerned about and I think um, the other part of it is the maintenance situation and we've, we've seen recently, the member for North West Central has mentioned it many times, the, uh, the pin down situation, the, uh, the, the contract for maintenance. I know um, that's now been reassigned. That's now been reassigned, which I'm pleased to hear. I'm pleased to hear about what I've got to say is that I believe the Minister for Housing needs to have a look at the whole structure of his maintenance program right around the state. Because we've got places like the Great Southern, we've got places like the Great renewed, Southern. Renewed by your government. We have got places like the Great Southern where we've actually got, uh, we've actually got Madam Acting Speaker, 
Madam Acting Speaker, we know, the, we know the Minister for Commerce moved her legislation through the House um, just as the, uh, the Pindan situation was, was happening with no protection, no protection for those uh, subcontractors. And now we're seeing the results and we've seen plenty of people left out of pocket. But that's not what I want to focus on. What I want to talk about is these contracts where we've got places like uh, Katanning, Niobing, Kojanup, Wajan, they're being uh, maintained by a company in Bunbury. And it was only yesterday I had a constituent of mine who's a small business owner, electrician um, in one of my local towns, and he rang me up because he's actually distraught with the amount of compliance, with the amount of government red tape that he has to go through every week trying to um, sort out those issues, which for him, he just wants to get out there, fix houses, do his job. Um, but he's becoming so frustrated, he actually rang me up yesterday and he's quite distraught. And part of this is the scenario where big companies place in places three and four hours away from where they've got the contract and they just try and subcontract it off to someone and try and uh, pick, up, pick up a bit of a profit on the way through. So the Minister for Housing needs to look at restructuring these maintenance contracts, restructuring it so that the local Homes West people, the local people looking at these grow houses and the like, can actually get local people to do the job quickly and efficiently. And uh, I had a classic over the uh, winter break. A constituent of mine rang me up. His daughter um, was there on holidays. She's um, up in that uh, Mullawa Morrowa region. What happens? Um, her house got broken into uh, while she was on holidays seven hours away. Um, hadn't been dealt properly with in the first place by the department. And then they are trying to tell her that she needs to come back up there, drive up seven hours to come and secure her house if you can believe it. So he rang me up because his daughter was um, distraught, firstly that she'd been broken into, but secondly that the department was trying to demand that she come up and secure her place, which hadn't been secured properly by them in the first place. So um, they're the issues. Uh, we've got crime issues in the uh, North West. We've got our young teachers many of them who are keen, they love the regions, they love coming out to the regions and they think that they're making a difference, and they are on many occasions. And what's happening is they're, they're becoming disillusioned because they're actually under threat. They are under threat from people breaking into their houses and um, they get to a point where they love their school and they love their community, but they don't want to stay there any longer because they're frightened. So we're going to have a point now, and we're at a point, I think, out in the lands where we haven't got, uh, we're really struggling for teachers at all. Um, and we've now got the flying squadron coming in from the uh, Department of Education and the like, uh, because we've got a situation now with this housing scenario where people are too frightened to even stay in their own house. So, um, Minister, Grow housing in the, in the Great Southern fell from 274 houses in 2015-16 to 226 in 2020, and in the South West it went from 243 houses to 188 in 2020. So that, they're, the, they're the sort of figures. And in regional WA between 2015 and 2020, we've lost 635 properties which have been sold out of the GROW program. So I, I, don't know, I don't know how you can explain that, how you can stand up there. I know you were talking about social housing and the like, but I don't know how you can explain that away, that when we've, we've got shortage of um, people coming out into the regions, police officers, teachers, how you can stand up there and say, it's not a problem, We've sold 635 properties, um, but things are going well. So, um, that was.
2015, 2016 well, under your government. You're in so government now. You started you're in the government aggressive now. sales program. It you're was in your government now, and I'm, that's a fact. I'm talking about the fact that you've been in government for four and a half years. It's been well, re well recorded um, by the Honourable Steve Martin in the other place um, that there is over 1,300 houses gone, 1,300 houses gone, and we've we've got real issues with our with our not only our policemen and our teachers, but um, you know our doctors, our health staff. Um, the risk of moving to a rural town is too high. Um, unless housing is affordable and secure. And as the, uh, as the um, member for Cottesloe pointed out, um, in Esperance, on Monday, there were four properties available for rent at an average of $300 per week. So we've got, we've got up to um, a dozen or 15 people at any time, on any night, uh, homeless in, uh, in Esperance, which is, I think that is something unheard of. And, uh, when I look at some of our other towns in Narragin um, today, there's only one house uh, on, on the real estate website for rent. In Catanning, there's five houses. Two of them are a three by one for $650 a week. So uh, you're not going to find anyone there. And in Lake Grace, there are none. There's one in Cogenup, one in Wagen, one in Cranbrook, two in Ravensthorpe. None in Pingrup, Ongrup, Williams, Dumbyung, Hopetown, Noangrup or Darkin. So in the, in the electorate of Rowe, which spans 106,000 square kilometres, there are 10 houses for rent. So uh, this is a real issue. And uh, I'm looking forward. We've, we've heard about it. The government solutions, the WA recovery plan. So the, the Great Southern Recovery Plan promised in 2020 $80 million for targeted maintenance programs for regional, social, remote and government worker housing properties, including 200 homes in the Great Southern Region, and $141.7 million to refurbish social housing across WA's ageing housing <laughs> stock, including 30 homes in the Great Southern Region. So um, I'm looking forward to it, uh, Minister, because it's great to make these announcements. Uh, we hear it all the time, but we're not seeing it on the ground. And that, that's, that's what I'm concerned about. And I'm really concerned when I've got people in Esperance ringing me up talking about how many people are homeless every night. Now, if I can, I'd like to, um, I'd like to just also refer my favourite subject, of course, Minister, as you know, the um, Katanning Regional Emergency Accommodation Centre. I, I will continue to persevere um, to get yourself and the Minister for Communities to come and have a look at that situation because that is a, a great model of funding um, what you could do to fund emergency accommodation. It's a great model um, and it's a great model for uh, those families especially those women facing domestic violence. So I certainly look forward to uh, hosting you the next time you are in the Katanning region. I nearly, um, I nearly, nearly uh, got you there the other week when you were at Tambla, but not to be. So I look forward to, at some stage in the not too distant future, um, you visiting, visiting us. The other thing I want to talk about uh, briefly today is the the mental health strain that homelessness is actually putting on the uh, on the whole health system, and I think uh, we've just seen it recently in the last couple of days. And I was pleased today to hear the Minister for Health um, recognising the mental health situation, um, and I look forward to actually seeing that package come to fruition in the the state budget. But there's some really interesting figures um, that our Clearly our mental health beds are in a dire shortage in WA and sadly people experiencing homelessness are among some of the very long stayers in mental health wards. And um, in 2019, uh, from a Mental Health Commission inpatient survey, uh, what it pointed out, which I found was quite surprising to me, that of the 656 <laughs> mental health inpatients occupying a bed at the time of the survey, 
178 or 27.1 per cent were deemed unable to be discharged because of a lack of suitable community-based accommodation or mental health support services. And um, recently, across the, um, the Perth, uh, Royal Perth Bentley Group, which um, has a, a history of the mental health hospital admissions, um, of 417 individuals, they accumulated 23,647 psychiatric bed days in a two-year period. So the cost of this to the health system is 35.8 million in, in psych bed days, and that's equivalent to $86,000 per person. So I, I think that's um, obviously a very, uh, very concerning figures, and I think what it demonstrates is that, uh, as it said, 27.1% of those uh, homeless had, had mental health issues. And I think um, the cumulative, um, an, an example was a cumulative healthcare cost for three individuals over a 33-month um, period um, were extreme, and they really placed um, the health system under extreme pressure. And what, what we need to do, we've actually got to treat homelessness as a combined health and social issue. So I think it would be uh, great to see if the... Uh, can I have a short extension, please, extension Madam granted. Speaker? It would be great to see if the, uh, the health minister could um, combine, if the health and housing ministers could combine to actually work out a strategy um, to deal with both uh, mental health and homelessness, because um, they are linked. And we've seen um, some, of, some of the stats which uh, the member for Cottesloe spoke about, where we've got 9,000 people in WA experiencing homeless every, homelessness every day, 1,041 homeless in Perth and Fremantle um, in May 2021. And, of course, uh, examples uh, coming out thick and fast recently where Food Bank have seen an increase in their usual customers. Um, we've had the Anglicare um, scenario where they've seen a demand for emergency relief and food assistance triple in 2021. And of course the recent example where the Salvos are actually having to pay car registration um, for people. Um, to actually sleep in their car. That, that's a short-term solution, but it's, I think our community is in a sad state of affairs when the Salvation Army has to actually pay car registration to keep people um, out on the, the street in their car. And I, I think there's been, there's been many newspaper articles recently um, indicating some of the issues and I know that we've had, uh, I know that we've had the, the COVID scenario and what's happened. It's almost as if there has been a, um, a scenario where people, uh, and we've seen it from both landlords and tenants. Uh, we've had tenants that don't want to pay their rent, and then we've had landlords that have said, well, if they're not going to pay that, I would rather leave my house vacant. And I'm sure this is this has added to it. And it's a situation <laughs> where. It's not really anyone's fault as far as that goes. Uh, that, that's just a scenario that, that has played out. But I'm really concerned. And I think um, as an opposition, we know, we know these are extraordinary times. And I know the culmination of many factors has caused an avalanche of uh, issues. But on this occasion, we're, we're just focusing on, on housing. We've identified this as uh, probably the second most major issue that the government's got on its hands after health. But what's been missing from this Labor government is any discernible strategy to soften the blow within our, within our communities. Um, these individuals are in real crisis, Madam Acting Speaker. Um, this can't be solved by the blame game, as I've said. Um, you're in government now. You've been here for four and a half years. You've had that time to build the strategy. Um, you can own the solution to these serious problems, 
But what we've had so far is a minister... We've had a lot of yelling, we've had a lot of screaming. Uh, we saw it in question time today. I look forward to this minister providing a solution. Minister for Housing. Thank you. Uh, given that we've listened to the opposition for nearly two hours, respectfully, uh, I would like to uh, map out... Uh, map out... Uh, our government's agenda, but also raise uh, plenty of the issues that the opposition has decided uh, for a prong for attack. And I think the first issue, which is really important, is their definition of a crisis. Because what is very clear is, is that their defi definition of a crisis is built on the 17,000 waiting list. You would have noticed in question time today they actually said it repeatedly as one of the basis for their crisis. What is actually extraordinary about that is that when you actually do look at the statistics and the evidence, the largest housing crisis is actually of their own making back in 2010. And let's be very clear on that, that the waiting list at the height was 24,136. So that can't be denied. It is on uh, the public record at the height. So they've said we're at a crisis at 17,000. I didn't interject with you, member. So, well, I showed you all respect and I listened attentively. That is the case. So if 17,000 is problematic, than what was 24,000. Apparently that was a walk in the park. Uh, and we have to understand that uh, that was quite an extraordinary time. And actually you have to also look at the wait times because under our government, the wait times have actually significantly reduced. Again, the peak was under the previous government when wait times increased to a nearly a year longer than they are now. So peaking at 158 weeks uh, in 2014-2015. So in fact, wait times under the previous Liberal National Coalition government were worst almost every year under the, previous get, under the previous government than they are now. And also bailiff evictions were higher under the Liberals and Nationals in 2015-2016. I also note that they like to crow about the significant investment. But again, as I said on the public record, the most significant funding commitment to Western Australia was part of the Kevin Rudd government. And that did fuel massive social housing expansion across Western Australia. I also note uh, that remote communities have also suffered. We've had to face a cost pressure there because the Commonwealth yanked out $146 million annually from the system. Now, we invest nearly $200 million a year in remote housing. So we've had 147 taken out of the system every year, thanks to the federal government. So these are actually statistics that cannot be ignored. This is actually the reality of the record of the previous uh, government. And we've also now inherited ageing stock. The average uh, stock is around 30 years. We have a proportion that are 40 years. And that has left us with significant challenges that we have to deal with as a state. We also heard from the member for North West claims of bullying or threats. And I want to be very clear on the public record. I have an excellent relationship with all my stakeholders. And not once have I or aware of any other minister making a threat or bullying any advocacy organisation in the social sector field and those that I engage with. I will have disagreements, but it will be respectful and I have done that. I understand that social housing agencies have to put their best foot forward. I get that. 
but I have to focus on the pragmatic and practical actual deliveries. And I did raise the proposal by Shelter WA that looked at suggesting 157 one-bedroom units in Carnarvon. And I did say that was inappropriate and it was not warranted. Uh, and that it is very easy to simply go along and say we should pluck out any of these types of land, but actually the de delivery is, is far more nuanced than either some advocacy groups wish to recognise or the opposition. In regards to grow housing, I do note that it was the previous government under the Liberal National Coalition that began the aggressive sales program because of the debt collected with the grow program of 180 million. Uh, we have paused those sales and I note that there has been an increase in the number of grow housing, whether it is leased or, or purchased or other means, of around 2.6 per cent or 129 uh, grow houses. And as the Minister, I've actually for the first time brought together a forecasting group to predict and look at future trends, look at eligibility requirements and see if we can get better outcomes from the grow house system. Now the member mentioned about there being demand for an extra 200 placements. That does not necessarily mean demand right now. That could mean demand in the future. We ask agencies, what do you need? But of course, uh, we go out, we use a multitude of means, including spot purchasing or, or leasing, to meet that future demand. Um, Geraldton has been raised uh, repeatedly. And again, I think this really does demonstrate the complexity of, of the issues at hand. And I have said it before, and I say it sincerely, but it is not simply a matter of plonking people in a refurbished house. There has to be good wraparound services, like the Thrive Program, which is a $58 million program, uh, and not like the opposition suggests with the First Nations Homelessness Project, that's a $50,000 request. It's a million dollar program that was cut funding by the federal government but we have our own program of $58 million that makes a substantial investment in wraparound services. But be very clear on Geraldton that there were properties available that people did not want to move into. So what that shows is a bigger symptomatic problem that we face, and that is particular precincts, particular streets, particular hubs, which are not attractive for people to live, or a perception. And that is something that is a significant struggle. And as I said, there is real complexity about this, about do we make a decision that ultimately there should be demolition or private sales, recognising the impact on social housing stock, or do we make a decision to refurbish, work to make the suburbs more attractive and for more people wanting to live there? Now, I think that's an honesty to the community, to the public, about the problems and challenges that we face in social housing delivery. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Uh, and as I mentioned with Brownlee Towers, again, uh, I'm not celebrating the fact, as, as the member for Rose suggested, that there was a closure of 300, but ultimately it became a decision that was the best outcome for the local community in that area, given the social behavioural problems. So it is not a simplistic policy that the opposition consistently tries to paint. And I, and I think that is the dishonesty that we've seen in this debate, and I say this sincerely and respectfully, that it is simply boarded up houses, refurbish them and get them back on and all the problems are fixed. Well, it's not. What I'm demonstrating is, is that it is quite nuanced, that from street to street, it is actually quite complex. Today, I met the regional managers and directors from all regions across Western Australia. And every time, and I've been criticised because I was out in Kalgoorlie meeting the regional managers' teams there, but at every regional trip, when I meet local governments, I make a real effort to go out 
and engage with regional frontline staff to talk about what's what working, not working. And they actually do go out and show me some of the boarded houses. And I'll give you an example in Kalgoorlie. There was a group set of group units and dwellings. And because of antisocial behaviour, they actually made the decision to close some of those units because actually it was the best social behavioural outcome that they could generate. So that again shows the complexity that when you see boarded houses, there are conscious decisions can be made by regional staff that it is actually in the best interest of those units. And this is the other complexity, again, which the opposition fails to recognise. It is not just plonking people into public housing, but it's also getting the right mix. That in Kalgoorlie, you can't put families from different regions in the same social housing complex because it might generate significant social issues. Now, I'm acknowledging those issues. We're trying to say this is a more complex matter. Have an honest conversation with the community. But I will not gloss over it like we do have by the opposition. There is no recognition of this. It's just very simple black and white politics and policy by the National Party and the Liberal Party when we're actually trying to seriously grapple with the complexities of public housing delivery. And that we've given that commitment that we are trying to move away from enclaves or high density public towers and that we are moving to more integrated approaches across density and suburbs. And even that has difficulty because developers will potentially flag with me that they worry if there is joint developments about the level of public housing in those developments. Uh, and that's a, that's a serious concern too, that in fact people or developers say, you know, if you put too much in, then we won't be able to flog the, the other product. Now, I think that's sad. I'm deeply passionate about public housing. Public housing is the most transformational experience for people, to provide them a roof over their head, to give that security, to give them an opportunity to look at their lives, to focus, to, to be able to perhaps go into training and education because they don't have to worry about a roof on their head. So I am a passionate advocate, and this is a priority, of public housing, but in our first term, we did have to make some difficult decisions. I also want to address the fact uh, the member for North West asserted that in the gas going there had been no construction. And actually, I'm advised that in the five years in the gas going, we completed 38 houses, including 18 social houses in the gas going region and 20 key worker. And additionally, we've purchased another seven houses in this area. So I did want to cor correct some, some of the statements. I did want to correct some of the statements that had been made on the public record by the opposition. I also want to talk about the, the broader, the broader uh, picture. And that is, we are in extraordinary times. That is the one thing that I can agree with the member for Rowe. And I think he did acknowledge that. That we have seen COVID hit. And of course, we first of all brought in the moratorium. And that moratorium we were actually criticised for, if you remember. But I think it was the right policy decision. We were criticised by landlords. And this is the other complexity of housing policy, is, is that that moratorium provided certainty for, for renters. But, of course, some landlords said, look, we're mums and dad investors, we're facing negative equity, that's putting off increases. So once the moratorium lifted, it was always natural that we would see a correction, a correction in prices. But what we're also seeing is an extraordinary increase in housing supply. And I note none of the opposition acknowledged this. There was no referral to the stats relating to housing supply. And this is a picture that is very critical, that we have had 27,000 building approvals in the last financial year. 
So we're told there's no plan, there's been no plan at all, except there was an economic stimulus plan, there was a deliberate plan to boost the construction industry because of the fears of a, of a, of a post-recovery in a pandemic environment, and that actually had significant impact. Uh, and in the regions too, which is ignored again by the, by the opposition, they don't refer to the statistics at all, but extraordinary figures in the opposition about the increases. You know, around 4,000 new home building approvals in the regions, uh, around 118% increase. You know, Albany, 137% increase. And the list goes on and on and on. We've seen extraordinary growth in building approvals uh, in the regions. On top of that, We've had our Key Start loan, and Key Start is a proud Labor program that is about giving first time owners a, a chance. And we've seen 4,000 approvals, which is a significant growth, uh, which we haven't seen for a long time. So 27,000 building approvals, uh, 4,000 Key Start loans. These are extraordinary figures. And as we saw in the West Australian this week, many of those are first home buyers. So for the first time in their lives, West Australians are grasping at the opportunity, thanks to the state bonus grant, also the federal government grant, and are seizing it. And I'll read from the West. The year of the first home buyer, first home owner frenzy, a 71 houses selling in each in WA each day. The past 12 months have shaped up as the year of the first home buyer, with remarkable figures re revealing more than 100 people joined the property ladder in WA every single day. Now that is something that is fantastic, that does show an incredible growth of affordable homes uh, and, that, and that that is going to provide relief. And that relief as I've already stated, is not being projected by this state government. That has been by the very credible Bank West Curtin Economic Centre. They came out with a report that clearly stipulated that because of this huge building growth approval, this huge building growth approval, there will be around or estimated 10,000 homes coming back onto the rental market. And that's because, for the obvious reason, that people will leave their homes, will leave their homes and go into new homes. And we're starting to see that come through. And that is good news uh, for Western Australia. Now, we are very cognizant of the fact of the other challenges because of the COVID pandemic uh, and a booming economy and being a safe place to live. Uh, and that is, with the borders, is obviously that we are facing skill shortages. Uh, and the Premier has had a, a skills summit and a number of new measures, some are very small but are really tailored, down to even like the fact of looking at driver's licences for uh, apprentices who may have fallen out of the system. These, some of these are really good ideas that actually will help get people back into uh, into the labour market to assist with delivery of both public homes uh, and both the private market. Now, we've also, as part of that, we ran last year under the Minister for Training, uh, also uh, quick short-term courses in relation to Brick Lane, because that was a, obviously a clear need. Uh, and we will continue to look at what other measures into the future that we can do to deal with that skill shortage. But that is a reality. And I have to say this, I would rather face this scenario than what was potentially predicted uh, when COVID first hit. And there were some quite dire projections about the state of the economy. And in fact, we are in different circumstances. We have the strongest economy in Australia. We are a safe haven. People want to come back here. And that's related even with the migration figures, uh, where we saw that the ABS 
released their data that showed 1,639 more people moved to WA than left for interstate destinations in three months to March, the most single quarter since 2013, whereas we actually saw others having an exodus. So we are in these extraordinary circumstances and I would rather still be trying to meet the challenges we face than the alternative, which could have been an economic recession, which is what some in, uh, economists had predicted. Now, as a state government, we brought in the building bonus grant. We also brought in the $116 million regional land booster program, which is about providing discounted land in the regions. And there are currently 7,000, uh, 7, I shouldn't say 7,000, 700 lots uh, available, I'm advised, in the market. We also have the three ministers, the Minister for Lands, the Minister uh, for Planning and myself, that are working together as part of a subcommittee, uh, the Residential land and Lands Supply Committee, that is looking uh, at how we can further tackle those issues that have been described in the regions and that I'm acutely aware of, and whether it is potentially using future land uh, or other measures. And I am meeting, for example, we are meeting in the future with the alliance of major regional uh, councils. Now, we are also making a significant investment, nearly $1 billion in public housing, social housing, affordable homes uh, and the homelessness initiatives. That includes $319 million for the SHERP, which is part of the COVID recovery program. Now, like everyone, we are meeting challenges uh, of securing contractors uh, because it is a heated construction market. And I've been on the public record uh, for that. But there is a, a very strong and genuine funding commitment there. The homelessness field, we have seen significant and real investments, nearly 100 million a year in homelessness services. We've had significant new investments. We are building two common ground facilities which provide wraparound services. We opened last week the 100-bed Aboriginal controlled homeless transition facility in the city. We are uh, opening a medical respite centre for rough sleepers coming out of the public, uh, coming out of hospitals who may be experiencing homelessness. Now, these are all real and tangible and meaningful and will change people's lives. And the member for Cottesloe said, oh, it's just a plan and a plan and a plan. Well, that's not the case at all. There is real money, and it's all part of the housing first approach. That's an approach which the previous government didn't do. The previous government did have an ad hoc approach. And our approach is the housing first is simple. At its heart, is about saying that we need to help people get off the streets, they may face serious mental health, drugs and alcohol addictions, but we get them into supported accommodation with intensive wraparound services. And what's critical, why that's different from the old model, is because previous we used to have high barriers, so people couldn't even get off the street. Or once they got off the street into the accommodation, they fell out of the system. Uh, and so this is the Common Ground Facilities and the Housing First uh, program is actually about providing intensive wraparound services, including on site, to make sure people don't fall out of those houses. And this model has been done around the world. And it has been successful. And for example, in Melbourne, which were far ahead of us, uh, have demonstrated that people have sustained and been sustained. They've had quite some extraordinary figures. Now, the previous government could have adopted the housing first approach. They didn't. They just did bits here and there. I notice they keep quoting figures which actually relate back to their time in the last ABS statistics. The 9,000, uh, the 1,600 were actually from the 2016 uh, figures. But I'm actually really proud of the government that we've taken an evidence-based approach uh, and that now we're applying that as part of the housing first approach in all those significant investments, and not just in the city, but also in Geraldton 
and Bunbury. On top of that, we've made new commitments for Indigenous supported accommodation. Uh, that includes Geraldton and the city. Now, what's significant about this? It is obviously uh, in the city areas, uh, people can be coming in for cultural reasons, they could be coming for health services, but, uh, and sometimes those people may uh, be sleeping with relatives or, or perhaps uh, out and about. And what we want to do is provide culturally appropriate accommodation that again provides a support service. Uh, that's Aboriginal supported accommodation and we're going to be doing one in Geraldton uh, and one in the city. Uh, and uh, I believe the tender is out uh, for Geraldton. So there is, you can see significant rolling investment in the homelessness field uh, and in also uh, public and social housing. But to come back to the complexities, and I just, about the delivery, this one is in my own electorate and it does demonstrate again, I just, I come back to this, the nuances, was that I was door knocking uh, in a public housing complex in Perth. And there's about 14 in there. And I was getting a number of complaints from some of the public housing tenants. And sadly, those complaints was about a tenant who was under the Housing First program. So it shows you again the complexity of the fact that we got someone off the street, provided support, they were put into a public housing system, and yet other tenants were demanding that uh, tenant be evicted from public housing. Now, as a government, and this is also, we don't want to see evictions. We don't want to see evictions. We want to do every supportive measure that we can have in place to help people stay within the public system. And contrary to some of the reports by advocacy groups, the evictions prior to COVID and post COVID are relatively the same. And that's why we have the $58 million Thrive Program, uh, which is about providing that support for uh, tenants, that support for tenants so that they can stay uh, in the system. Now, the other challenges that we have faced, and the, I think the member for Roe mentioned it, was about maintenance. Uh, now, I am going to be looking to the future about how we can get better bang for buck in terms of maintenance. Of course, I want us to always be able to do better. But we did face a major challenge in the Midwest in coming as a new minister to deal with uh, the collapse of, of Pindan. And that was a serious issue for me because had we decided, and I say this respectfully, but had we decided to terminate that contract, what would have happened overnight was priority one and priority two, two jobs would have stopped on those social housing maintenance. It would have stopped. And then we would have had people at risk in that public housing. Yeah, so housing were directly employing uh, those subcontractors to do the work. I'm advised it was through uh, the through the Pindan when the contract negotiations continued. So the point I'm making, Member, and I say this sincerely, if we had terminated it, you would not have seen the outcome that you would have seen today. And it is fair to say, uh, and I appreciate you had your politics to make, but by holding steadfast, by working through with EY, that we delivered the best outcome for Midwest because we were able to maintain services to those properties for critical jobs. We were talking at you know critical risk jobs to tenants, uh, but also that we were able to keep 90 people in jobs that perhaps otherwise wouldn't have been 
maintained had we just terminated because there would have been no potential sale to program to see the continuation of that staff. And I do want to say this, Member for North West, I have had positive approaches, and I'm going to ring, read one out for the public record right now. Good morning, John. I wanted to personally thank you for your unwavering support recently for Pindan Asset Management continuation of the Housing Authority Head Maintenance Contract under licence agreement with Program. I know this was a very difficult situation for you and your integral support has now secured almost 100 PAM jobs. I can assure you all the personnel of PAM are extremely grateful. I look forward to meeting uh, you soon and thanking you in person. Now, I didn't ask for that. That was just sent to me. And that does demonstrate that I understand the politics where we want theatrics, we want to get headlines in the paper, but that prudent approach that I took, the measured approach, actually I do think provided the best outcome. It provided the best outcome for regional jobs. It provided the best outcome for services for maintenance of, of public housing properties. And I think that is the general assessment by the community. Yes. I am serious. I am serious on this. Dan situation was, and it's now come to light that there's, there's more evidence that perhaps it was known before that they were in trouble. And the real issue around the Pindan situation was that it was a government contract and the government, which you're a part of, um, said that they will uh, legislate to protect subcontractors. Sub That's the issue uh, that has, has come about this, is where the legislation doesn't protect those who have lost money. I think that's that's the issue and that's the point that I was coming from, is that you promised legislation, it wasn't delivered, and we had that situation with Pindan I, and now we've got another company in the same boat. But North West Central, it is on the public record repeatedly, and it's fair to say, because you yelled it across the chamber, terminate, terminate, terminate. And if I'd taken that approach, there is general agreement in the community, in your own community, that it would have resulted in the loss of 90 jobs. Now, is anyone saying that I made the wrong course of action in sticking forth, being measured, not reacting to the politics, seeing that through with the negotiations, uh, obviously not personally, but the department to persist, that I think we got the best outcome? I absolutely understand the plight of contractors. Yeah, but under your member for North West, under your scenario, there would have been no outcome because they would have lost their jobs. There would have been no sale of program and no benefit for creditors. Your outcome painted the worst scenario for people. No, your outcome painted the worst scenario. If I'd listened to your advice and your politicking, it would have generated the worst scenario. I don't understand how you can still argue against the saving and retention of 90 jobs, including in retentions. In retention. He continues to persist. Minister there is a clear line. Minister there is a clear line. Minister for Housing, would you prefer not to have the interjection? I'm, yeah, I'm fine without interjections. OK. <laughs> Go on, Minister. Um, so it is very clear, it is very clear that we made the right decision on this, uh, that it was a prudent approach, and I stand by that decision, and it is clear that the workers affected, directly affected, agree that it was the best outcome and that we projected jobs in the regions. <laughs> and, you know, I am... Uh, very cognisant that that was the right uh, direction. In terms of future uh, policy, of course, uh, I'm working through the budget process, but I have been looking at particular issues and trends. Obviously, the opposition raises vacant houses. Again, I have been looking at the churn rate 
for vacant houses. But I want to be very clear. The opposition is misleading again because there is always going to be a percentage of houses in the public system that are vacant. And this makes sense. Someone says, I want to leave the public housing system. Then that property becomes vacant. There has to be refurbishment works undertaken. So this is actually entirely normal. Now, as the minister, I'm working through ways to accelerate that, so the churn rate. But what the other factor that the opposition just ignores is, is that we also need to do significant investment in refurbishment. That this idea that uh, if you go to some of the vacant properties, and you know, I put these policy, I put this out in the public arena, but there has to be significant investment. Uh, which does vary, but there is significant investment uh, across the board in terms of maintenance and refurbishment of properties as part of that churn. So we are working through about how we can, how we can better uh, get through that churn rate. But to suggest that there is ever going to be no vacancies in the public housing system is just simply nonsense. It's just, it is actually dishonest and fails to recognise that churn, um, that churn rate. I am also looking, as I've said on the public record, in terms of modular homes. I understand that we have a very strong construction market and accordingly I am looking at, and the agency is looking at, modular and how we can use that to get accelerating house, public housing delivery or grow housing. Uh, we, and particularly looking at regional areas, because it's an obvious fit, and that it's a way potentially of growing the sector, growing the industry, creating jobs in those areas, but also adding to the overall public uh, and social housing stock. So overall, I want to say this. We do have a very strong investment program, nearly $1 billion. Our building bonus grant has delivered for West Australians. It's been extraordinary, 27,000 building approvals. That will create private rental relief across, across Western Australia. We've seen extraordinary building approvals in the regions. All those homes will provide relief uh, to the regions. We've seen 4,000 key start again huge numbers of first home buyers for the first time uh, entering the market. We have the billion dollar, nearly billion dollar uh, program. We're investing a hundred million in homelessness initiatives. We've got new initiatives that we opened last week and the two common ground facilities as part of the housing first approach. So what we're seeing is a very significant investment but also being upfront with the community about the complexities of public housing delivery, how we want to move to a more integrated approach across suburbs and towns, because that will deliver better social outcomes, that we have had to make some tough decisions in relating to high density, um, high density social areas, but we are strongly committed to public housing in Western Australia, but we want to do it a better way that delivers better outcomes for all West Australians, and that is our strong commitment. Leader of the Opposition. King Speaker. Um, thank you, Minister, um, for your response to this motion. Um, and I actually think from an opposition perspective, uh, the motion that's been brought to the House by the member for North West Central um, in relation to the matters that have been canvassed by members that have already spoken and what will just follow up on, on your contribution is very timely, is very timely. And I think the, the Minister for Health has been given a reprieve this Wednesday night um, because we've seen a significant amount of funds announced. Um, we're, let, we're yet to see the detail um, in relation to timing and, and how that will actually be rolled out. But this is a crisis of a similar scale in another portfolio that has come about under the watch of this government. And this government likes to uh, refer to the previous Liberal National Government. 
But this is their, f they've been in power for four and a half years. Four and a half years. And so it is, it is time to own the fact that decisions that were made in the first term of this government are now coming home to roost. They are now coming home to roost. And the people of Western Australia are, are the ones that are suffering for it. So the Minister for uh, Housing, and I've, I've been in that position. I've stood on, on that side of the chamber and I've had to respond to private members' businesses, uh, private members business and, and MPIs and suspension of standing orders uh, in my own portfolio areas. And, um, and you do try to reasonably roll out um, the, the reasons why it is difficult to provide a, a response that the community desires and to, to assist in uh, actually <laughs> providing basic government services. It, it is difficult um, to do this in government. There are many moving parts. And I think all of these members here acknowledge that. None of us came into this house and said, this is a simplistic problem. I know the minister said that, but that's not actually what we came into the house and said. We acknowledge that it's, uh, it requires a whole of government response. It, it requires uh, a complex mix of uh, departments and also the private sector. Um, and, and certainly, whilst everything that the minister said seemed sensible, it's not going to provide any comfort to those uh, many, many people that are already sleeping rough or without a fixed address or find themselves at risk of becoming homeless. And the stress and the pressure that that puts, not only on the individual, their family, but then all of the other government services that come into play and the community organisations. And all I can say is that this has come about because of the lack of investment, the lack of planning, the lack of prioritisation in this, in this sector by this government, by this government, four and a half years in. We cannot keep hearing ministers come to this place and say that this is something that uh, can be sheeted home to the previous government. And it was interesting, um, just from a local perspective, when the Minister for Housing raised the issue around um, the sale of assets in the wheat belt, because one of the reasons that the Minister for Housing has given uh, that they've started selling off houses and they haven't been able to replace them, and so we're in this deficit, um, is because they want to have a different mix of housing uh, in communities across the state. Now, I know, because I was personally involved in some of these issues in the wheat belt, that, for instance, this, the, the community of Gamaling, which is just outside Northam, actually um, back in the time that the minister was referring to, was one of the towns, if not the town, with the highest proportion of public housing in this community. Now, this is not somewhere that has wraparound services. It doesn't have access to public transport. There are no uh, Centrelink offices within Kui. There's no way for you, if you are a family with um, serious needs or complex needs to be addressed uh, for, for you to actually access any of that. And yet they had the highest proportion in terms of their population of public housing. And so, yes, there were moves, particularly from a wheat belt perspective, and I um, I am aware of them because I was working with the then Minister for Housing, uh, the Honourable Colin Holt, and prior to that, uh, the Terry Redmond, uh, to try and address some of those concerns. So this is not a new issue. It's not a new issue, but there was a plan at the time to actually invest, and, and that investment did occur. We invested significantly in public housing, um, into areas in regional centres, and I'm talking from a regional perspective, um, and certainly from my, uh, from my electorate's perspective at this stage, into regional service centres where these services were available. Because I can't tell you the number of times that people turned up into my office, either in Meriden or Northam, and um, had, through sheer desperation, taken a house in either Hyden or Muckenbudden or Gamaling or Wildcatcham. And whilst those communities are amazing places to live and the community will provide you an enormous amount of support, they do not, if they are, if they are complex, families or, or families or individuals with complex needs, they are not going to be able to access the services that they require in some of those smaller communities. But that percentage in Gamaling in particular, and it sticks in my mind because I went to many, many meetings, I, I, I sympathise with what the, what the minister is trying to do. But what we did was actually reinvest. And, and we did have a significant um, housing program right across the continuum 
right across the continuum, not just in public housing, in com community housing, in workers' accommodation, as the member for North West Central raised, um, in grow housing, the, the member for Roe raised uh, issues in terms of grow housing. 217 houses, I think you said. That was in response to a question that was asked in the Legislative Council. And worryingly, the, the, the departments that are in most need of these um, houses are the Department of Police and the Department of Education. Um, another issue that the Minister for Housing raised was um, you know, working with the community to try and address some of these issues. And I know from my own experience in my own electorate, and I know other members have had it too, is that there's an extraordinary amount of pressure from the Department of Housing on our local governments to be the, the provider of this housing. The Department of Housing has ceased um, through the GROW program to build its own houses. It relies on local governments to fill that gap. Now that's okay if you're a... Uh, well, it's, it's probably not okay, that's a, a, a generalisation. If you've got the capacity to fund that, um, like the city of Caratha or maybe some of our bigger regional centres with bigger rate bases, well perhaps that's something that you can fit into your local government budget. But if you are the Shire of Wilcatcham or you are the Shire of Narrabeen or any of those smaller communities and the Department of Housing comes to you and says, uh, we've got a proposition for you, build us a grow house, we'll give you a contract, uh, they're stuck between a rock and a hard place because they know that if they don't agree to it, then the potential for them to secure that next police officer or that next education um, individual, whether it's a, a teacher or the next principal that they need, will be at risk. And I don't think that's right. I don't think it's right that our communities are actually now um, being looked at as providing a solution to a problem that, uh, whether it's compounded over many years, it's come to bear right now, four and a half years into this government's tenure, and we see so many of our communities fronting up and stepping up ratepayers' dollars uh, because they are fearful that they won't be able to attract and retain those workers that they so desperately need um, so that their kids can get a decent education, so their hospital does have a nurse, uh, so that they can house a doctor. And, uh, and again, that's something that this, this government needs to attend to. If the minister is truly... Um, is, is truthful in his words that everything's on the table and that he's looking for innovative solutions. Well, I put it on the table right now that some of those smaller councils don't have the ability to continue to do this. And in fact, when you get to the north of the state, the north of the state, when you add the cost of insurance, the development costs of the land, um, it is simply out of the reach of some of these uh, communities to do that. There is, there is no way that you will ever you will ever get back, even with a contract with the Department of Communities or through Grow, to make your money back. Um, and we have local governments faced with that every every day, every day. And uh, and I, I think if the minister is genuine, um, that he will look at that issue as well and and stop using our local governments as uh, an external bank uh, for the government to build houses and actually get on with the job of building them and expanding our housing options in in regional Western Australia in particular for those grow houses. Because 217, whether it might be a wish list or not, I can promise you that there are houses right throughout regional Western Australia that are in desperate need of refurbishment. And uh, uh, having spoken recently to a number of police officers in uh, my own electorate, um, none, of them, none of them will complain publicly, but they all know where the good houses are in the state. And they will all, it's the first question you ask, when you're uh, being recruited or, or asked to move to another place uh, in regional Western Australia is what's the housing like? Am I bringing my family into something that was built in 1972 and hasn't seen an upgrade since then? Or is it something that's been built maybe in 2010 and it's looking pretty good? Because in some of these communities, um, that, is, that is one of the major attraction pieces uh, for retaining a workforce, absolutely. And, uh, and you only need to talk to those staff to understand just how important it is. And if we want to talk about records in government, when we came to government in 2008, one of our first programs of investment back into regional Western Australia after years of neglect after the previous Labor government uh, was to actually do just that, is to go through the grow housing uh, stock and make sure that we either refurbished, rebuilt or added to that housing stock. Now, the difficulty at the time, and I think it still exists, is that the, the Department of Housing manages its own, um, its own uh, housing stock and the funding that we were providing went through um, the Department of Housing and so there was a, a whole raft of health housing that didn't get that investment. But I can tell you there was investment to uh, police and teachers in particular 
and other key service workers right across the state as a result of our focus uh, in government on making sure that uh, workers during in key areas during, during a boom, and that's right, Member for North West Central. 2010, uh, the Minister was talking about 2010. Um, 2010, at the peak of the construction boom, peak of the construction boom where we saw almost the population of Tasmania move to Western Australia, um, we didn't have at that point a booming royalty rate. In fact, it was one of the lowest rates that we'd ever seen in the state. We had the major mining companies in a race to the bottom to get their costs uh, right down. And we had uh, calls on every construction worker that you could get your hand on. So it was a very difficult environment to work within. Uh, there was certainly no solution to the GST on the table at that point in time. So our circumstances at that time were that we invested even within those constrained circumstances, because we knew that we would be constraining future growth of our state if we didn't make that investment. Now, that's one part of the housing continuum, one part of the housing continuum, but it is very, very important. That workers' accommodation part of the, uh, the continuum, again, very important. And another, uh, you know, a, a funding stream that was made available and possible by royalties for regions, because at the time, it was. It, there had been such a neglect of opening up of land to allow for that development that there was no way to kickstart um, or to get that work done in time to accommodate those workers and to retain all the businesses and those service workers that make a community a community uh, in places like Caratha and Port Hedland and Exmouth. And, uh, and so there might be criticism in relation to those workers' accommodation uh, projects run under the previous government, but I tell you what, they're all full. They're all full, and every community we go to says, can we have another one? Can we have another one? Build us some more. Build us some more. Because we need to be able to retain when that pressure comes on and, and our state is uh, subject to those swings from a mining sector perspective. We need to be able to maintain those businesses that are the heart and soul of our communities uh, to make sure that we have the hairdressers and the butchers and the people that work in the coffee shops uh, and also all of our, our key critical workers um, in our, in our uh, government services and in places in the north of the state, that is incredibly difficult. That is incredibly difficult without some sort of intervention from the state government. And that is the role of the state government, without a doubt. Partner with the private sector, use their expertise um, and, and certainly don't shy away from that. Because at this point, if the minister's genuine in his, his statements that everything's on the table and we're looking to try and address these problems, thinking outside the square, well, don't discount things that have been done by previous governments out of sheer bloody-mindedness. Um, don't look back and say, we're not going to do that. Uh, we don't want to go any, anywhere near it because the previous government did that. We'll come up with our own solution. Um, we'll cheer you on because every one of our communities is saying, please, please. We need the assistance. We need the assistance. So that housing continuum, when you talk about workers' accommodation, and, and it's not just restricted to the northwest. So uh, we, we had conversations like this in the Midwest the other day uh, with the member for Moore. Um, significant uh, roadworks with federal and, and state funding going into major projects through that area. There's a number of mining projects in the Midwest uh, that are drawing um, drawing. Uh, workers from all over the place. I know, for example, 2J, Mora, um, and Dan Darrigan, communities in and around that Midwest uh, are at capacity. There's not a rental to be had. Not a rental to be had. And yet you've got businesses like Agrifresh and Mora Citrus um, and the Northern Valley Packers who are, from, from an agricultural perspective, cutting edge in terms of the technology they're employing, the quality of the produce that they're um, make, uh, producing for the domestic and, and export market, and yet they, they, cannot, they can't find places for their workers. They can't find places for their workers. So this, uh, this lack of joined up thinking in terms of uh, land release, in terms of uh, looking at how we can mitigate some of the costs of developing land in regional communities because of the cost of connecting power and water, um, which is a disincentive for local governments to do it. And quite frankly, I don't think it should be left to them, but history says that that's exactly what happens in these smaller communities where the market doesn't work. Um, that's the kind of joined up uh, forward thinking that we want this minister to be to be ad addressing. Um, and of course, then you get to the very vulnerable end, the very vulnerable end of, uh, of the, the, the um, of the of the housing issue, and that's been canvassed very well in this in this place um, on a number of occasions. And I did ask a question of the the minister for communities 
the minister, sorry, the minister for communities today in relation to a housing support question. Uh, housing support service. And I acknowledge that it was, for, and, and the Minister was quite right, Minister for Communities pointed out that this program um, was funded, previously funded by the, um, by the federal government. Four years of Commonwealth funding. Four years of Commonwealth funding for what is essentially a state government program. Um, and, and housing support, you would argue, every day of the week, because the, the, the minister went on and actually explained what was being invested in other programs. Um, so it clearly sits with the state government as a responsibility. But um, this, this program has, uh, has been funded at a million dollars a year since 2017. Since 2017. And unfortunately, um, that funding has, has come to an end. And what, this, what, what the, uh, the proponents of the project have asked is that the Minister for Communities consider $50,000 a year. $50,000 a year in a, in a state with a $5 billion surplus. A state with a $5 billion surplus. Um, the information that we have is that they've helped keep uh, more than 1,500 children off the streets and, keep, and, and kept at-risk, vulnerable Aboriginal families together. Um, it was uh, launched as a volunteer organisation. May I have an extension, please? Um, and their staff includes um, psychosocial counsellors, social workers, health practi practitioners, mentors to help resolve issues um, in dealing with both the Department of Housing and the Department of Communities. So it is regrettable that the federal government has not sought to renew that, but I think there's an opportunity for the state to step in. And for $50,000 a year, $50,000 a year, you would have the endorsement of um, uh, very well-known and respected uh, community members here in WA who have significant expertise in the uh, in children's wellbeing and services. Dr. Fiona Stanley, um, the program manages uh, that the state government funds uh, outcare. Uh, their program Thrive. They say they use they use the program. They use the services that are provided um, by this First Nations homelessness project, and so they would see it as as something that was hugely beneficial for it to be funded, and yet. The minister, um, and, and she agreed that it was a good project, but she said there is no funding for this. There is no funding for this from the state government. Um, Fiona Stanley, as I said, um, was reported at the time that the funding was coming to an end, was reported to have directly intervened and actually written to the Minister for Communities um, to, to ask her to save the program. Um, saying that there's no comparable service, no comparable service, and I quote, it is successful because it assesses each family and wraps around them the support and services they need to survive. Um, her last quote in that article was supporting people to stay in their home and helping them to manage their budgets, health and social issues um, prevents later costly problems, costly for the people concerned and costly for government services. Now, if we've got a housing problem, and we've already got people in homes, and there's a program for $50,000 a year to support people to stay in their homes so the Minister for Housing doesn't have to build additional homes, wouldn't you think that that would be a no-brainer? But instead, the Minister chose to play politics uh, and do the finger-pointing when she had an opportunity to really step up and say, yes, that's something that I'll reconsider. Yeah. $5 billion. Yeah. $5 billion in the state budget. Surplus. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll make sure that we reach out and we'll have that conversation again. Help prevent the evictions that result in homelessness. Help prevent some of that crisis that we are seeing uh, burgeoning onto our streets in every community in Western Australia. And I know it'll be cold comfort for the team at First Nations Homelessness Project, but I've had the exact same conversation with the Minister for Communities about local housing support projects. And this is what I don't understand, because I've raised in this place on a number of occasions, and directly with the Minister, the Avon Community Services Program. Uh, again, a program to support young people in the wheat belt, um, to uh, put a roof over their head and give them some life skills to get them back on track and into sustainable and stable housing. I would have thought that that would be right up the Minister's alley, right up the Minister's alley. But again, uh, on every request, we don't have funding in the budget for that. We don't have funding in the budget for that. And I wonder, I just wonder, <laughs> I wonder why we aren't putting everything on the table when it comes to keeping people in the homes that they've got. Avon Community Services has a home. They have a home to look after these young people that just need a helping hand. Uh, the alternative is, is that they are homeless or street present or they're couch surfing through our communities. And this is only one, one in Northern for the entire of the wheat belt. Uh, and yet we can get no traction. 
and yet we can get no traction. So uh, I think from from our perspective, a, a very disappointing um, a very disappointing uh, response from the minister in relation to that particular issue that was raised today. Uh, and I do urge the minister to reconsider, and I do urge her to reach out and have that conversation again. And surely, surely, in a state with a five billion dollar projected surplus, we can find fifty thousand dollars a year uh, to support to support the work that this community does. And don't take our word for it. There are, there are many eminent people that actually um, that have, have actually supported that. Uh, and I, I'm happy, you know, I've gone on record, it is regrettable that the federal government have um, ceased to fund this. But I look at it as you got four years of Commonwealth funding when really it probably should have been a state government funded program. And, uh, and you can, well, it's a housing support program. So, you know, you fund housing support programs at a state level. There's four years that have been provided by the state at the, the federal government at one million dollars. They're asking for fifty thousand. I don't think it's an unreasonable request. So that housing continuum um, uh, continues uh, continues to to fail the people of, of Western Australia, failed on every front, and we cannot get the minister um, like what, like we couldn't get the minister for health to say the word crisis. Six six little letters will not acknowledge the fact that we are at crisis levels will not acknowledge the fact that, there, that we are at crisis levels in terms of um, the fact that we have a, a lack of public housing across the board as a result of their failure to invest and selling off properties. We don't have options for workers uh, that are desperately needed in our regions, not least of which in, in, the, uh, in, in Kalbarri and Northampton and across that Midwest area. Um, that is something that needs urgent, urgent attention. Um, we don't have solutions for our grow housing, uh, and I don't see a program of refurbishment for some of those very run-down, uh, very run-down government-owned facilities. And I certainly would welcome the minister's um, commentary, either in this place or or offline, as to how we might try and stem those requests to local governments to become the bank for the state government to build houses to attract and retain um, nurses, teachers, police, and the like. Because uh, that is the feedback that I get as I travel across the state, and it's it's simply not good enough. Um, uh, I, oh, the minister for mm, better not do that. He's about to walk out the chamber <laughs> on urgent. No, no, no. It's fine. It's fine. I won't go there. Um, it people's. You know, we've we've seen um, the hugely tragic circumstance of people losing their lives. Uh, we've had a, a on the streets on the streets because they haven't had the support that they need. Um, on the steps of Parliament House last week. Uh, a number of sleeping bags laid out on the steps to demonstrate the number of people that have lost their lives as a result of uh, uh, exposure or um, succumbing to the, the, the myriad of complex issues that they face um, by being street present, homeless, um, unable to access the services that they deserve. And uh, the first thing that the government should do is admit that there's a crisis. They should admit that there's a crisis. And then they should get on with doing what they've managed to do after consistent pressure from uh, the unions, from the workforce, from the media, from the opposition in relation to the health crisis that we are experiencing, again, of this government's own making, and come up with a package that comprehensively deals with all of those issues and brings all of the government agencies together all of the government agencies agency together. And that goes to the issue that the member for North West Central was talking about when you're dealing with people under pressure, uh, like the CEO in the, the Shire of Northampton. Um, and, and understanding that you need to have the government's um, firepower sitting behind you to support you to come up with these solutions and to, to wrap around you. It is too much to expect someone in that position to manage that and deal with multiple agencies, multiple departments. And whilst um, the government may say that there's been a coordinator appointed, I can promise you that as, a, as, as the CEO in a position, um, it is unrelenting in situations like that. And so we just need to be a little bit careful because those issues will change. Those issues will change and new ones will emerge. New ones will emerge. But if we can't get appropriate housing, if we can't get appropriate support services, and we can't actually work with the people who are elected and um, very well supported in their community, then we are going to fail those communities. We are going to fail those communities. And, uh, and that is our great fear.
that is our great fear. So, Minister, um, I, I thoroughly support the motion that's been brought to the House uh, today by the member for North West Central. Um, I note on the notice paper that um, the title was um, public housing, but the motion actually um, condemned the Labor government for its failure to prioritise housing in the last five years of government, creating a housing crisis the state has never seen before, triggering significant economic and social consequences. I think all members have uh, touched on areas in their own electorates, but across that housing continuum that we talk about. And, uh, and we, really, we really urge this government to make sure that in this upcoming budget, there is an appropriate response so that we aren't having this conversation uh, in another six months' time, 12 months' time. Um, there needs to be a plan. We need to understand what that plan is. The private sector should be engaged. Um, we should be including them in the conversations about how we might best solve some of these wicked problems. And, uh, and certainly I'd have thought that the minister would be in attendance at the, uh, the forum that was held the other day. Um, it was disappointing. I don't think there was. Um, uh, I don't think there was an answer to the question as to whether or not any of your ministerial colleagues or other colleagues were in attendance at that meeting. Um, I understand that there was a, a departmental, uh, a, a department representative there. But these were some of the peak bodies in the sector, um, and I would have thought that, given the severity of the situation that we face here in Western Australia, that we would have had someone from the government sitting and paying respect to those that are on the front line. Uh, dealing with these, dealing with these issues. Uh, minister, Minister, do you agree with that assessment? I, do you want me to answer that question? Yeah, do you think we've yeah been I bullying? absolutely do. Oh, and do you know what? Do you know, because I get that feedback from community that groups. Is so, so constructive criticism. That so is constructive. That is don't like the answer, do you? Members, would you members, like me to? Would you like me to continue let, the answer? Let the leader. You asked me the question, Minister. You asked me the question. I hear feedback from people that would. The minister asked me a direct question. You've just walked into the chamber and have absolutely no idea what we're talking about, Minister for Police. As per usual, as per usual, you've got no idea. You just chime in with some inane comment. Minister, you asked me a genuine question, and I'm telling you that there are people within who would consider themselves friends of the Labor Party, that when they provide constructive criticism to a number of ministers, and there are some that are not in the chamber at the moment, that they, if they don't and aren't seen to be agreeing with the agenda and the priorities of this government, they are then blocked out of the conversation and are in fact told that things will get very, very difficult for them. So whether that's you or whether that's someone else sitting around your cabinet table, I tell you what, I've heard it more than once. I've heard it more than once. And you don't want to get like that because arrogant governments lose government. Arrogant love, they lose government. They lose government. So just tread very carefully because that is the word on the street. That is the word on the street. Word on the street is that your government, if you don't agree with them, you will not be welcome in those ministers' ministers' offices. You will not be welcome in those ministers' offices. Well, you asked the question. Uh, you asked the question. I gave. I'm hardly going to list the people. The people that have said they're too afraid. I'm hardly going to list. What? So you can go and victimise them further? I don't think so, Minister. I don't think so. And actually, I wasn't directing the question at you. I wasn't directing the comments at you, Minister, but your indignation makes me think that perhaps there is something to hide. Anyway, you invited you invited the assessment, and yes, I absolutely endorse I absolutely endorse the comments from the Minister for North West Central. You shouldn't have asked the question if you didn't like the answer, Minister. This, in, this entire sector, this entire sector. Is in crisis, Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Member. It is in Member. crisis, and it's come about under your watch. Under your watch, four and a half years. Member. Four and a half years, and we find Minister. ourselves. Minister, 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 that's enough. Four and a half years, and we find ourselves in a dire situation dire situation, not only in health, but in housing and accommodation right Thank across you. this state. Oh, first time in five years. Member for, what, member for what? First time in five years. Thank you. Madam Acting Speaker, um, Thank you, I wish I had more than five minutes. And since the member for for North West Central has tried up, I've got a lot to say. Thank you, North West Central. I've got a lot to say, but I think I'll do him first, if that's all right. Yep. 
I'll do you first before I need to correct. I need to corre I need to correct the record before when I interjected and suggested that you actually lost the booth of Exmouth. I was incorrect. You actually won that booth. Well done, member. But I just want to also add for the House that you lost the, the booth of Kalbarri, the booth of Mikathara, the booth of Onslow, the booth of Panawanica, the booth of Parabadu and the booth of Tom Price. In fact, the Labor camp... In fact, yeah, it was one of Scott Morrison's miracles. Go ahead. The National Party did. I think the members misleading uh, uh, the people in this chamber. Thank you, members. Um, That's not a point of the order. Member Continue North on, West Member Central, Central, and everybody well knows that he lost that election on a primary count. Um, have to have a seat for your member for one roof for a second. Uh, sorry, yeah, no. um, clearly is not speaking to the motion that's uh, in, before the house. <laughs> there is no. Can point you ask her to? Thank you, member. Get back to the actual motion. There is no point Relates. of order. Stan, go again. Member Thank you. Me. I'm sorry. I had to do you first since you interject straight away. But uh, I've only got five minutes left, and I wanted to just uh, uh, highlight a couple of um, arguments that seem to keep coming up in the opposition whenever they jump up, whether we're talking about health, whether we're talking about housing. Um, next, I suppose, crime will come up as a theme. Um, on the one hand, there are great pains to remind us all that the only reason that many of us are here is because of COVID. The election was all about COVID. We never won because of any of our policies or any of the work we did in the last four years. You only got here because of COVID. That that is all we ever hear. Yet, they don't apply that logic to talking about important issues about health or housing and giving acknowledgement that over 18 months we're in the middle of a pandemic and that somehow you might need to give acknowledgement that those things factor in to the issues around housing or health. You can't have it both ways, members. You, you can't have it both ways and say, we're only here because of COVID, but when we try to acknowledge that COVID is impacting severely on our health system and also the way uh, housing, uh, the housing sector is being impacted, you, you don't actually acknowledge that. Um, there is a skill shortage that is directly because of the COVID pandemic. There is an increased migration to Western Australia that is exactly because of COVID. Now, those two factors do impact on the housing issues that the government is facing. You can't have it both ways, um, members. Now, politics is all about the art of taking credit for other people's work. And I think the member for Cottesloe yesterday, his, his efforts were breathtaking. His suggestion that because of his opposition, his pressure on the health minister, that somehow $1.9 billion was, was, was brought into the health system because of his strong advocacy as an opposition spokesperson. So I reckon, members, they've actually got a cunning plan. I think they're now targeting housing this week because at some time in the future, when they know when they know that the work that our, our housing minister is doing will pay dividends, they're going to somehow try and take credit for it as well. Um, I noticed the opposition leader before uh, was suggesting that uh, she, uh, we shouldn't mention the previous government's performance. But, members, we do have to do that because... No, not because they're arrogant, but because the punters out there need to make choices between a government and an opposition. So they see you actually as an alternative. So they actually have to compare you. No, no, they don't, but they do have to make a clear choice. And they made that decision. And can I just say, every portfolio that I look at, whenever I'm preparing for, for, for any of the um, you know, issues that the opposition raised, let, let's have a look at housing and how you did when you were previously in government. I'm only going to talk about the people that were in charge. For about 12 months, you had Troy Buswell. Then you went to Bill Marmion for about less than a year. Then you went back to Troy Buswell. This is as a housing minister. Then you went to Terry Redmond for less than a year. 
Then you went back to Bill Marmion. Then you went to Colin Holt. And then we went to Brendan Grills. So none of your ministers in the previous government, when we're talking about the housing portfolios, served more than one year, seven months. That's how much of a priority it was for you. That's how much of a priority it was for you. Now, now, but you tried to, you tried to, you tried, you tried a little bit harder post 2017 in opposition, where we started with the shadow housing minister Peter Collier for a little while, then you swung to Sean Lestrange as the housing minister, then you came up with the idea that the member for Corrine should be the special shadow for homelessness and housing, and. And then we had that wonderful you. policy of yours of Thank $268 you. million dollars Thank for you, 2,600 homes. In accordance with Standing Order 61, this business is interrupted and adjourned until another day. <laughs> 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 um, member. <laughs> member for the House. Thank you. Uh, the question is that the House be adjourned. All those in favour say aye. aye. All those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. <laughs>